Introduction of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Introduction. In 1846, the Percy Society issued to its members a volume entitled Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England, edited by Mr. James Henry Dixon. The sources drawn upon by Mr. Dixon are intimated in the following extract from his preface. He who, in traveling through the rural districts of England, has made the roadside inn his resting place, who has visited the lowly dwellings of the villagers and yeomanry, and been present at their feasts and festivals, must have observed that there are certain old poems, ballads, and songs, which are favorites with the masses, and have been said and sung from generation to generation. This traditional, and for the most part unprinted, literature, cherished in remote villages, resisting everywhere the invasion of modern namby-pamby verse and jaunty melody, and possessing, in a historical point of view, a special value as a faithful record of the feeling, usages, and modes of life of the rural population, had been almost wholly passed over amongst the antiquarian revivals, which constitute one of the distinguishing features of the present age. While attention was successfully drawn to other forms of our early poetry, this peasant minstrelsy was scarcely touched, and might be considered unexplored ground. There was great difficulty in collecting materials which lay scattered so widely, and which could be procured in their genuine simplicity only from the people amongst whom they originated and with whom they are as familiar as household words. It was even still more difficult to find an editor who combined genial literary taste with the local knowledge of character, customs, and dialect, indispensable to the collation of such relics. And thus, although their national interest was universally recognized, they were silently permitted to fall into comparative oblivion. To supply this manifest desideratum, Mr. Dixon compiled his volume for the Percy Society, and its pages, embracing only a selection from the rich stores he had gathered, abundantly exemplified that gentleman's remarkable qualifications for the labor he had undertaken. After stating in his preface that contributions from various quarters had accumulated so largely on his hands as to compel him to omit many pieces he was desirous of preserving, he thus describes generally the contents of the work. In what we have retained will be found every variety, from grave to gay, from lively to severe, from the moral poem and the religious dialogue, the scrolls that teach us to live and to die, to the legendary, the historical, or the domestic ballad, from the strains that enliven the harvest home and festival, to the love ditties which the country lass warbles, or the comic song with which the rustic sets the village hostel in a roar. In our collection are several pieces exceedingly scarce, and hitherto to be met with only in broadsides and chapbooks of the utmost rarity, in addition to which we have given several others never before in print, and obtained by the editor and his friends, either from the oral recitation of the peasantry, or from manuscripts in the possession of private individuals. The novelty of the matter, and the copious resources disclosed by the editor, acquired for the volume a popularity extending far beyond the limited circle to which it was addressed, and although the edition was necessarily restricted to the members of the Percy Society, the book was quoted not only by English writers, but by some of the most distinguished archaeologists on the continent. It had always been my intention to form a collection of local songs, illustrative of popular festivals, customs, manners, and dialects. As the merit of having anticipated and in a great measure accomplished this project belongs exclusively to Mr. Dixon, so to that gentleman I have now the pleasure of tendering my acknowledgments for the means of enriching the annotated edition of the English poets, with a volume which, in some respects, is the most curious and interesting of the series. Subsequently to the publication of his collection by the Percy Society, Mr. Dixon had amassed additional materials of great value, and conscious that the work admitted of considerable improvement, both in the way of omission and augmentation, he resolved upon the preparation of a new edition. His reasons for rejecting certain portions of the former volume are stated in the following extract, from a communication with which he has obliged me, and which may be considered as his own introduction to the ensuing pages. The editor had passed his earliest years in a romantic mountain district in the north of England, 
where old customs and manners and old songs and ballads still linger. Under the influence of these associations, he imbibed a passionate love for peasant rhymes, having little notion at that time that the simple minstrelsy which afforded him so much delight could yield hardly less pleasure to those who cultivated more artificial modes of poetry, and who knew little of the life of the peasantry. His collection was not issued without diffidence, but the result dissipated all apprehension as to the estimate in which these essentially popular productions are held. The reception of the book, indeed, far exceeded its merits, for he is bound in candor to say that it was neither so complete nor so judiciously selected as it might have been. Like almost all books issued by societies, it was got up in haste and hurried through the press. It contained some things which were out of place in such a work, but which were inserted upon solicitations that could not have been very easily refused, and even where the matter was unexceptionable, it sometimes happened that it was printed from comparatively modern broadsides, for want of time to consult earlier editions. In the interval which has since elapsed, all these defects and shortcomings have been remedied. Several pieces which had no legitimate claims to the places they occupied have been removed. Others have been collated with more ancient copies than the editor had had access to previously, and the whole work has been considerably enlarged. In its present form, it is strictly what its title page implies, a collection of poems, ballads, and songs preserved by tradition and an actual circulation amongst the peasantry. Bex, Canton de Vaude, Switzerland. The present volume differs in many important particulars from the former, of the deficiencies of which Mr. Dixon makes so frank an avowal. It has not only undergone a careful revision, but has received additions to an extent which renders it almost a new work. Many of these accessions are taken from extremely rare originals, and others are here printed for the first time, including amongst the latter the ballad of Earl Brand, a traditional lyric of great antiquity, long familiar to the Dales of the north of England, and the death of Queen Jane, a relic of more than ordinary interest. Nearly forty songs, noted down from recitation, or gathered from sources not generally accessible, have been added to the former collection, illustrative, for the most part, of historical events, country pastimes, and local customs. Not the least suggestive feature in this department are the political songs it contains, which have long outlived the occasions that gave them birth, and which still retain their popularity although their allusions are no longer understood. Amongst this class of songs may be specially indicated Jack and Tom, Joan's Ale Was New, George Riddler's Oven, and The Carrion Crow. The songs of a strictly rural character, having reference to the occupations and intercourse of the people, possess an interest which cannot be adequately measured by their poetical pretensions. The very defects of art with which they are chargeable constitute their highest claim to consideration as authentic specimens of country lore. The songs in praise of the dairy or the plough, or in celebration of the harvest home or the churn supper, or descriptive of the pleasures of the milkmaid, or the courtship in the farmhouse, or those that give us glimpses of the ways of life of the wagoner, the poacher, the horse dealer, and the boon companion of the roadside hostelry, are no less curious for their idiomatic and primitive forms of expression than for their pictures of rustic modes and manners. Of special interest, too, are the songs which relate to festival and customs, such as the sword dancer's song and interlude, the swearing-in song or rhyme at Highgate, the Cornish Midsummer Bonfire song, and the Fairlop Fair song. In the arrangement of so multifarious an anthology, gathered from nearly all parts of the kingdom, the observance of chronological order, for obvious reasons, has not been attempted. But pieces which possess any kind of affinity to each other have been kept together as nearly as other considerations would permit. The value of this volume consists in the genuineness of its contents and the healthiness of its tone. While fashionable life was masquerading in imaginary Arcadias and deluging theatres and concert rooms with shams, the English peasant remained true to the realities of his own experience and produced and sang songs which faithfully reflected the actual life around him. Whatever these songs describe is true to that life. There are no fictitious raptures in them. Love here never dresses its emotions in artificial images, nor disguises itself in the mask of a strephon or a Daphne. 
It is in this particular aspect that the poetry of the country possesses a permanent and moral interest. R. B. End of Introduction Section 1 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. The Plain Dealing Man. The oldest copy of The Plain Dealing Man with which we have been able to meet is in black letter, printed by T. Vere at the sign of the Angels Without Newgate. Vere was living in 1609. A crotchet comes into my mind concerning a proverb of old, plain dealing's a jewel most rare and more precious than silver or gold. And therefore with patience give ear, and listen to what here is penned. These verses were written on purpose, the honest man's cause to defend. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain dealing man. Yet some are so impudent grown, they'll domineer vapor and swagger, and say that the plain dealing man was born to die a beggar. But men that are honestly given do such evil actions detest, and every one that is well-minded will say that plain dealing is best. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain dealing man. For my part I am a poor man, and sometimes scarce muster a shilling, yet to live upright in the world heaven knows I am wondrous willing. Although that my clothes be threadbare, and my calling be simple and poor, yet will I endeavour myself to keep off the wolf from the door. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. And now, to be brief in discourse, in plain terms I'll tell you my mind. My qualities you all shall know, and to what my humor's inclined. I hate all dissembling base knaves, and pick thanks whoever they be, and for painted face drabs and such like, they shall never get penny of me. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, "'Tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. "'Nor can I abide any tongues that will prattle and prate against reason "'about that which doth not concern them, which thing is no better than treason. "'Wherefore I'd wish all that do hear me not to meddle with matters of state, "'lest they be in question called for it, and repent them when it is too late. "'For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, "'tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man.' Oh, fie upon spiteful neighbors, whose malicious humors are bent, and do practice and strive every day to wrong the poor innocent. By means of such persons as they, there hath many a good mother's son been utterly brought to decay, their wives and their children undone. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. Oh, fie upon forsworn knaves, that do no conscience make to swear and forswear themselves at every third word they do speak. So they may get profit and gain, they care not what lies they do tell. Such cursed dissemblers as they are worse than the devils of hell. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. Oh, fie upon greedy bribe-takers, tis pity they ever draw breath, for they, like to base caterpillars, devour up the fruits of the earth. They're apt to take money with both hands, on one side and also the other, and care not what men they undo, though it be their own father or brother. Therefore I will make it appear, and show very good reasons I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. Oh, fie upon cheaters and thieves, that liveth by fraud and deceit! The gallows do for such blades groan, and the hangmen do for their clothes weight. Though poverty be a disgrace, and want is a pitiful grief, tis better to go like a beggar than to ride in a cart like a thief. For this I will make it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. And now let all honest men judge, if such men as I have here named, for their wicked and impudent dealings deserveth not much to be blamed. And now here, before I conclude, one item to the world I will give, which may direct some the right way, and teach them the better to live. For now I have made it appear, and many men witness it can, tis the excellence thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. 1. In the first place I'd wish you beware what company you come in, for those that are wicked themselves may quickly tempt others to sin. 2. If youths be inducid with wealth, and have plenty of silver and gold, I'd wish them keep something in store to comfort them when they are old. 3. I have known many young prodigals, which have wasted their money so fast, that they have been driven in want, and were forced to beg at the last. 
4. I'd wish all men bear good conscience, and in all their actions be just, for he's a false varlet indeed that will not be true to his trust. And now, to conclude my new song, and draw to a perfect conclusion, I have told you what is in my mind, and what is my firm resolution. For this I have made it appear, and prove by experience I can, tis the excellenst thing in the world to be a plain-dealing man. End of The Plain-Dealing Man Section 2 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Vanities of Life. The following verses were copied by John Clare, the Northamptonshire peasant, from a manuscript on the fly leaves of an old book in the possession of a poor man, entitled The World's Best Wealth, a collection of choice counsels in verse and prose, printed for A. Bettersworth at the Red Lion in Paternoster Row, 1720. They were written in a crabbed, quaint hand and difficult to decipher. Clare remitted the poem, along with the original manuscript, to Montgomery, the author of The World Before the Flood, etc., etc., by whom it was published in the Sheffield Iris. Montgomery's criticism is as follows. Long as the poem appears to the eye, it will abundantly repay the trouble of perusal, being full of condensed and admirable thought, as well as diversified with exuberant imagery and embellished with peculiar felicity of language. The moral points in the closing couplets of the stanzas are often powerfully enforced. Most readers will agree in the justice of these remarks. The poem was, probably, as Clare supposes, written about the commencement of the 18th century, and the unknown author appears to have been deeply imbued with the spirit of the popular devotional writers of the preceding century, as Herbert, Quarles, etc., but seems to have modeled his smoother and more elegant versification after that of the poetic school of his own times. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon. What are life's joys and gains? What pleasures crowd its ways? that man should take such pains to seek them all his days. Sift this untoward strife on which thy mind is bent. See if this chaff of life is worth the trouble spent. Is pride thy heart's desire? Is power thy climbing aim? Is love thy folly's fire? Is wealth thy restless game? Pride, power, love, wealth and all time's touchstone shall destroy and like base coin prove all vain substitutes for joy dost think that pride exalts thyself in others eyes and hides thy folly's faults which reason will despise dost strut and turn and stride like walking weather cocks the shadow by thy side becomes thy ape and mocks Dost think that power's disguise can make thee mighty seem? It may in folly's eyes, but not in worth's esteem. When all that thou canst ask, and all that she can give, is but a paltry mask, which tyrants wear and live. Go, let thy fancies range, and ramble where they may. View power in every change, and what is the display? the country magistrate, the lowest shade in power, to rulers of the state, the meteors of an hour. View all and mark the end of every proud extreme, where flattery turns a friend and counterfeits esteem, where worth is aped in show that doth her name purloin, like toys of golden glow that's sold for copper coin. Ambition's haughty nod 
with fancies may deceive nay tell thee thou art a god and wilt thou such believe go bid the seas be dry go hold earth like a ball or throw her fancies by for god can do it all dost thou possess the dower of laws to spare or kill call it not heavenly power when but a tyrant's will know what a god will do and know thyself a fool nor tyrant like pursue where he alone should rule dost think when wealth is won thy heart has its desire hold ice up to the sun and wax before the fire nor triumph o'er the rain which they so soon resign in this world weigh the gain insurance safe as thine dost think life's peace secure in houses and in land go read the fairy lure to twist a cord of sand lodge stones upon the sky hold water in a sieve nor give such tales the lie and still thine own believe whoso with riches deals and thinks peace bought and sold will find them slippery eels that slide the firmest hold though sweet as sleep with health thy lulling luck may be pride may o'erstride thy wealth and check prosperity dost think that beauty's power life's sweetest pleasure gives go pluck the summer flower and see how long it lives behold the rays glide on along the summer plain ere thou canst say they're gone and measure beauty's reign look on the brightest eye nor teach it to be proud but view the clearest sky and thou shalt find a cloud nor call each face ye meet an angel's cause it's fair but look beneath your feet and think of what ye are who thinks that love doth live and beauty's tempting show shall find his hopes ungive and melt in reason's thaw who thinks that pleasure lies in every fairy bower shall oft to his surprise find poison in the flower dost lawless pleasures grasp judge not thou dealst in joy its flowers but hide the asp thy revels to destroy who trust a harlot's smile and by her wiles is led plays with a sword the while hung dropping o'er his head dost doubt my warning song then doubt the sun gives light doubt truth to teach thee wrong and wrong alone is right and live as lives the knave intrigues deceiving guest be tyrant or be slave as suits thy ends the best or pause amid thy toils for visions won and lost and count the fancied spoils if e'er they quit the cost and if they still possess thy mind is worthy things pick straws with bedlam bess and call them diamond rings thy folly's past advice thy heart's already won thy falls above all price so go and be undone for all who thus prefer the seeming great for small shall make wine vinegar and sweetest honey gall wouldst heed the truths i sing to profit wherewithal clip folly's wanton wing and keep her within call i've little else to give what thou canst easy try the lesson how to live is but to learn to die end of the vanities of life section three of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo the life and age of man from one of thackeray's catalogues preserved in the british museum it appears that the life and age of man was one of the productions printed by him 
at the angel in duck lane london thackeray's imprint is found attached to broadsides published between sixteen seventy two and sixteen eighty eight and he probably commenced printing soon after the accession of charles the second the present reprint the correctness of which is very questionable is taken from a modern broadside the editor not having been fortunate enough to meet with any earlier edition this old poem is said to have been a great favorite with the father of robert burns in prime of years when i was young i took delight in youthful ways not knowing then what did belong unto the pleasures of those days at seven years old i was a child and subject then to be beguiled at two times seven i went to learn what discipline is taught at school when good from ill i could discern i thought myself no more a fool my parents were contriving then how i might live when i were man at three times seven i waxed wild when manhood led me to be bold i thought myself no more a child my own conceit it so me told then did i venture far and near to buy delight at price full dear at four times seven i take a wife and leave off all my wanton ways thinking thereby perhaps to thrive and save myself from sad disgrace so farewell my companions all for other business doth me call at five times seven i must hard strive what i could gain by mighty skill but still against the stream i drive and bowl up stones against the hill the more i labored might and main the more i strove against the stream at six times seven all covetous began to harbor in my breast my mind still then contriving was how i might gain this worldly wealth to purchase lands and live on them so make my children mighty men at seven times seven all worldly thought began to harbor in my brain then did i drink a heavy draught of water of experience plain there none so ready was as i to purchase bargains sell or buy at eight times seven i waxed old and took myself unto my rest neighbors then sought my counsel bold and i was held in great request but age did so abate my strength that i was forced to yield at length at nine times seven take my leave of former vain delights must i it then full sorely did me grieve i fetched many a heavy sigh to rise up early and sit up late my former life i loathe and hate at ten times seven my glasses run and i poor silly man must die i look it up and saw the sun had overcome the crystal sky so now i must this world forsake another man my place must take now you may see as in a glass the whole estate of mortal men how they from seven to seven do pass until they are threescore and ten and when their glass is fully run they must leave off as they begun end of the life and age of man Section 4 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. The Young Man's Wish. From an old copy without printer's name, probably one from the Aldermary Churchyard Press. Poems and triplets were very popular during the reign of Charles I, and are frequently to be met with during the Interregnum and the reign of Charles II. If I could but attain my wish, I'd have each day one wholesome dish of plain meat or fowl or fish, a glass of port with good old beer, in winter time a fire burnt clear, tobacco, pipes, an easy chair. In some clean town a snug retreat, a little garden for my gate, with thousand pounds a year estate. 
After my house expense was clear, whatever I could have to spare, the neighboring poor should freely share. To keep content and peace through life, I'd have a prudent, cleanly wife, stranger to noise and eke to strife. Then I, when blessed with such a state, with such a house and such a mate, would envy not the worldly great. Let them for noisy honors try, let them seek worldly praise, while I, unnoticed, would live and die. But since Dame Fortune's not thought fit to place me in affluence, yet I'll be content with what I get. He's happiest far whose humble mind is unto providence resigned, and thinketh fortune always kind. Then I will strive to bound my wish, and take, instead of fowl and fish, whate'er is thrown into my dish. Instead of wealth and fortune great, garden and house and loving mate, I'll rest content in servile state. I'll from each folly strive to fly, each virtue to attain I'll try, and live as I would wish to die. End of The Young Man's Wish Section 5 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Kibbe The Midnight Messenger, or A Sudden Call from an Earthly Glory to the Cold Grave. In a dialogue between death and a rich man, who, in the midst of all of his wealth, received the tidings of his last day to his unspeakable and sorrowful lamentation, to the tune of Aim Not Too High, etc. The following poem, and the two that immediately follow, belong to a class of publications which have always been peculiar favorites with the peasantry, in whose cottages they may be frequently seen, neatly framed and glazed, and suspended from the whitewashed walls. They belong to the school of quarrels, and can be traced to the time when that writer was in the height of his popularity. These religious dialogues are numerous, but the majority of them are very namby-pamby productions, and unworthy of a reprint. The modern editions preserve the old form of the broadside of the 17th century, and are adorned with rude woodcuts, probably copies of ruder originals. The wooden cuts, strange and uncouth. Dire faces, figures dire, sharp-kneed, sharp-elbowed and lean-ankled too, with long and ghostly shanks, forms which once seen can never be forgotten. Wordsworth's Excursion Death Thou wealthy man of large possessions here, amounting to some thousand pounds a year, extorted by oppression from the poor, the time is come that there shall be no more. Thy house therefore in order set with speed, and call to mind how you your life do lead. Let true repentance be thy chiefest care, and for another world now, now prepare. For notwithstanding all your heaps of gold, your lands and lofty buildings manifold, take notice you must die this very day, and therefore kiss your bags and come away. Rich man. He started straight and turned his head aside, where seeing pale-faced death, aloud he cried, Lean famished slave, why do you threaten so? Whence come you, pray, and whither must I go? Death. I come from ranging round the universe, through courts and kingdoms far and near I pass, where rich and poor, distressed, bond and free, fall soon or late a sacrifice to me. From crowned kings to captives bound in chains my power reaches, sir. The longest reigns that ever were I put a period to, and now I'm come and find to conquer you. Rich man, I can't nor won't believe that you, pale death, were sent this day to stop my vital breath. By reason I am perfect health remain, free from diseases, sorrow, grief, and pain. No heavy heart nor fainting fits have I, and do you say that I am drawing nigh the latter minute? Sure it cannot be. Depart, therefore, you are not sent for me. Death. Yes, yes I am, for did you never know the tender grass and pleasant flowers that grow, perhaps one minute are the next cut down? And so is man, though famed with high renown. Have you not heard the doleful passing bell ring out for those that were alive and well, the other day in health and pleasure too, and had as little thoughts of death as you? For let me tell you, when my warrant's sealed, the sweetest beauty that the earth doth yield at my approach shall turn as pale as lead. Tis I that lay them on their dying bed. I kill with dropsy, for physic, stone, and gout, but when my raging fevers fly about, I strike the man, perhaps but overnight, who hardly lives to see the morning light. I am sent each hour, like to a nimble page, to infant, hoary heads, and middle age. Time after time I sweep the world quite through. Then it's in vain to think I'll favor you. Rich man, proud death, you see what awful sway I bear, for when I frown none of my servants dare approach my presence, but in corners hide until I am appeased and pacified. 
Nay, men of greater rank I keep in awe, nor did I ever fear the force of law. But ever did my enemy subdue, and must I after all submit to you? Death. Tis very true, for why thy daring soul, which never could endure the least control, I'll thrust thee from this earthly tenement, and thou shalt to another world be sent. Rich man. What, must I die and leave a vast estate, which with my gold I purchased but of late? Besides what I had many years ago, what, must my wealth and I be parted so? If you your darts and arrows must let fly, go search the jails where mourning debtors lie. Release them from their sorrow, grief, and woe, for I am rich and therefore loath to go. Death. I'll search no jails, but the right mark I'll hit. And though you are unwilling to submit, yet die you must, no other friend can do. Prepare yourself to go, I'm come for you. If you had all the world and ten times more, yet die you must. There's millions gone before. The greatest kings on earth yield and obey, and at my feet their crowns and scepters lay. If crowned heads and right renowned peers die in the prime and blossoms of their years, can you suppose to gain a longer space? No, I will send you to another place. Rich man, oh, stay thy hand and be not so severe. I have a hopeful son and daughter dear. All that I beg is but to let me live, that I may them in lawful marriage give. They being young when I am laid in the grave, I fear they will be wronged of what they have. Although of me you will no pity take, yet spare me for my little infant's sake. Death. If such a faint excuse as this might do, it would be long ere mortals would go through the shades of death, for every man would find something to say that he might stay behind. Yet of ten thousand arguments they'd use, the destiny of dying to excuse, they'll find it is in vain with me to strive. For why, I part the dearest friends alive. Poor parents die, and leave their children small with nothing to support them here withal but the kind hand of gracious providence, who is their father, friend, and sole defense. Though I have held you long in disrepute, yet after all here with a sharp salute, I'll put a period to your days and years, causing your eyes to flow with dying tears. Rich man. Then with a groan he made this sad complaint. My heart is dying, and my spirits faint. To my close chamber let me be conveyed. Farewell, false world, for thou hast me betrayed. Would I had never wronged the fatherless, nor mourning widows when in sad distress. Would I had never been guilty of that sin, would I had never known what gold had been. For by the same my heart was drawn away to search for gold, but now this very day I find it is but like a slender reed, which fails me most when most I stand in need. For woe is me, the time has come at last, now I am on a bed of sorrow cast, where in lamenting tears I weeping lie, because my sins make me afraid to die. O oh, death, be pleased to spare me yet a while, that I to God myself may reconcile, for true repentance some small time allow, I never feared a future state till now. My bags of gold and land I'd freely give, for to obtain the favor here to live, until I have a sure foundation laid. Let me not die before my peace be made. Death. Thou hast not many minutes here to stay. Lift up your heart to God without delay. Implore his pardon now for what is past. Who knows, but he may save your soul at last. Rich man, I'll water now with tears my dying bed, before the Lord my sad complaint I'll spread, and if he will vouchsafe to pardon me, to die and leave this world, I could be free. False world, false world, farewell, farewell, adieu, I find, I find there is no trust in you, for when upon a dying bed we lie, your gilded baits are naught but misery. My youthful son and loving daughter dear, take warning by your dying father here, let not the world deceive you at this rate, for fear a sad repentance comes too late. Sweet babes, I little thought the other day I should so suddenly be snatched away by death and leave you weeping here behind, but life's a most uncertain thing, I find. When in the grave my head is lain full low, pray let not folly prove your overthrow. Serve ye the Lord, obey his holy will, that he may have a blessing for you still. Having saluted them, he turned aside. These were the very words before he died. A painful life I am ready to leave, wherefore in mercy, Lord, my soul receive. End of the Midnight Messenger Section 6 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jim Gallagher A Dialogue Betwixt an excise man and death. Transcribed from a copy in the British Museum, printed in London by J. Clark, 1659.
The idea of death being employed to execute a writ recalls an epithet which we remember to have seen in a village churchyard at the foot of Wrekin in Shropshire, commencing thus. The king of heaven a warrant got, and sealed it without delay, and he did give the same to death for him to serve straight away. Upon a time when titan's steeds were driven to drench themselves beneath the western heaven, and sable Morpheus had his curtain spread, and silent night had laid the world to bed. Amongst other night birds which did seek for prey, a blunt excise man, which abhorred the day, was rambling forth to seek himself a booty, amongst merchants' goods which had not paid the duty. But walking all alone, death chanced to meet him, and in this manner did begin to greet him. Death Stand, who comes here? What means this knave to peep? and skulk abroad when honest men should sleep. Speak, what's thy name, and quickly tell me this, whither thou goest, and what thy business is. Excise man. Whate'er my business is, thou foul-mouthed scold, I'd have you know I scorn to be controlled by any man that lives, much less by thou, who blurtest out thou knowest not what nor how. I go about my lawful business, and I'll make you smart for bidding me stand. Death. Imperious coxcomb, is your stomach vexed? Pray slack your rage, and hearken what comes next. I have a writ to take you up, therefore. To chafe your blood, I bid you stand once more. Excise man. A writ to take me up? Excuse me, sir. You do mistake I am an officer in public service for my private wealth. My business is, if any seek by stealth, to undermine the state I do discover their falsehood. Therefore hold your hand, give over. Death. Nay, fair and soft, tis not so quickly done. As you conceive it is, I am not gone. A jot the sooner for your hasty chat nor bragging language, for I tell you flat. Tis more than so, though fortune seem to thwart us. Such easy terms I don't intend shall part us. With this impartial arm I'll make you feel my fingers first, and with this shaft of steel I'll peck thy bones, as though alive wert hated, so dead to dogs thou shalt be segregated. Excise man. I'd laugh at that, I would thou didst but dare, To lay thy fingers on me, I'd not spare, To hack thy carcass till my sword was broken, I'd make thee eat the words which thou hast spoken. All men should warning take by thy transgression, How they molested men of my profession. My service to the state is so well known, That should I but complain, they'd quickly own My public grievances, and give me a right To cut your ears before tomorrow night. Death. Well said indeed, but bootless all, for I am well acquainted with thy villainy. I know thy office, and thy trade is such, thy service little, and thy gains are much. Thy brags are many, but tis vain to swagger, and think to fight me with thy gilded dagger, as I abhor thy person, place, and threat, so now I'll bring thee to the judgment seat. Excise man. The judgment seat, I must confess that word, doth cut my heart like any sharpened sword. What, come to count, methinks that dreadful sound of every word doth make a mortal wound, which sticks not only in my outward skin, but penetrates my very soul within. Twas least of all my thoughts that ever death would once attempt to stop exciseman's breath. But since tis so, that now I do perceive, you are in earnest that I must relieve myself another way. Come, we'll be friends. If I have wronged thee, I'll make thee mends. Let's join together. I'll pass my word this night, shall yield us grub before the morning light. Or otherwise, to mitigate my sorrow, stay here. I'll bring you gold enough to-morrow. 
death. Tomorrow's gold I will not have, and thou shalt have no gold upon tomorrow. Now my final writ shall to the execution have thee. All earthly treasure cannot help or save thee. Excise Man Then woe is me, ah, how I was befooled! I thought that gold, which answereth all things, could have stood my friend at any time to bail me. But grief grows great, and now my trust doth fail me. Oh, that my conscience were but clear within, which now is ragged with my former sin. With horror I behold my secret stealing, my bribes, oppression, and my graceless dealing. My office sins, which I had clean forgotten, will gnaw my soul when all my bones are rotten. I must confess it, every grief doth force me, Dead or alive, both God and man doth curse me. Let all excise men hereby warning take to shun their practice for their conscience' sake. End of A Dialogue Betwixt an Excise Man and Death Recording by Jim Gallagher Section 7 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Kibbe. The Messenger of Mortality, or Life and Death Contrasted in a Dialogue Betwixt Death and a Lady. One of Charles Lamb's most beautiful and plaintive poems was suggested by this old dialogue. The tune is given in Chappelle's Popular Music, page 167. In Carey's Musical Century, 1738, it is called the Old Tune of Death and the Lady. The four concluding lines of the present copy of Death and the Lady are found inscribed on tombstones and village churchyards in every part of England. They are not contained, however, in the broadside with which our reprint has been carefully collated. Death Fair lady, lay your costly robes aside. No longer may you glory in your pride. Take leave of all your carnal vain delight. I'm come to summon you away this night. Lady What bold attempt is this? Pray, let me know from whence you come, and whither I must go. Must I, who am a lady, stoop or bow to such a pale-faced visage? Who art thou? Death. Do you not know me? Well, I tell thee, then, it's I that conquer all the sons of men. No pitch of honor from my dart is free. My name is Death. Have you not heard of me? Lady. Yes, I have heard of thee time after time, but being in the glory of my prime, I did not think you would have called so soon. Why must my morning sun go down at noon? Death. Talk not of noon. You may as well be mute. This is no time at all for to dispute. Your riches, garments, gold, and jewels brave, houses and lands must all new owners have. Though thy vain heart to riches was inclined, yet thou must die and leave them all behind. Lady. My heart is cold. I tremble at the news. There's bags of gold, if thou wilt me excuse and seize on them, and finish thou the strife of those that are weary of their life. Are there not many bound in prison strong, and bitter grief of soul have languished long, who could but find the grave a place of rest from all the grief in which they are oppressed? Besides, there's many with a hoary head, and palsy joints by which their joys are fled. Release thou them whose sorrows are so great, but spare my life to have a longer date. Death. Though some by age be full of grief and pain, yet their appointed time they must remain, I come to none before their warrant's sealed, and when it is, they must submit and yield. I take no bribe, believe me, this is true. Prepare yourself to go, I'm come for you. Lady. Death, be not so severe, let me obtain a little longer time to live and reign. Fain would I stay, if thou my life will spare. I have a daughter, beautiful and fair. I'd live to see her wed whom I adore. Grant me but this, and I will ask no more. Death. This is a slender, frivolous excuse. I have you fast, and will not let you loose. Leave her to providence, for you must go, along with me, whether you will or no. I, death, command the king to leave his crown, and at my feet he lays his scepter down. Then if to kings I don't this favor give, but cut them off, can you expect to live beyond the limits of your time and space? No, I must send you to another place. Lady, you learned doctors now express your skill, and let not death of me obtain his will. Prepare your cordials, let me comfort fine, my gold shall fly like chaff before the wind. Death. Forbear to call, their skill will never do. They are but mortals here as well as you. I give the fatal wound, my dart is sure, 
and far beyond the doctor's skill to cure, how freely can you let your riches fly to purchase life rather than yield to die. But while you flourish here with all your store, you will not give one penny to the poor, you would not spare one penny for his sake. The Lord beheld wherein you did amiss, and calls you hence to give account for this. Lady, oh, heavy news! Must I no longer stay? How shall I stand in the great judgment day? Down from her eyes the crystal tears did flow. She said, None knows what I do undergo. Upon my bed of sorrow here I lie. My carnal life makes me afraid to die. My sins, alas, are many, gross and foul. O oh, righteous Lord, have mercy on my soul. And though I do deserve thy righteous frown, yet pardon, Lord, and pour a blessing down. Then with a dying sigh her heart did break, and did the pleasures of this world forsake. Thus may we see the high and mighty fall, for cruel death shows no respect at all to any one of high or low degree. Great men submit to death as well as we. Though they are gay, their life is but a span, a lump of clay, so vile a creature's man. Then happy those whom Christ has made his care, who die in the Lord and ever blessed are. The grave's the marketplace where all men meet, both rich and poor, as well as small and great. If life were merchandise that gold could buy, the rich would live, the poor alone would die. End of The Messenger of Mortality Section 8 of Ancient Poems, Ballads and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Conway, England England's Alarm Or the pious Christians speedy call to repentance for the many aggravating sins too much practised in our present mournful times as pride drunkenness blasphemous swearing together with the profanation of the sabbath concluding with the sin of wantonness and disobedience that upon our hearty sorrow and forsaking the same the lord may save us for his mercy's sake from the cluster of ornaments alluded to in the ninth verse of the following poem we are inclined to fix the date about 1653. The present reprint is from an old broadside without printer's name or date, in possession of Mr. J. R. Smith. His sober-minded Christians now draw near, labour to learn these pious lessons here, for by the same you will be taught to know what is the cause of all our grief and woe. We have a God who sits enthroned above, he sends us many tokens of his love yet we like disobedient children still deny to yield submission to his will the just command which he upon us lays we must confess we have ten thousand ways transgressed for see how men their sins pursue as if they did not fear what god could do behold the wretched sinner void of shame he values not how he blasphemes the name of that good God who gave him life and breath, and who can strike him with the darts of death. The very little children which we meet amongst the sports and pastimes in the street, we very often hear them curse and swear before they've learned a word of any prayer. Tis much to be lamented, for I fear the same they learn from what they daily hear be careful then and don't instruct them so for fear ye prove their dismal overthrow both young and old that dreadful sin forbear the tongue of man was never made to swear but to adore and praise the blessed name by whom alone our dear salvation came pride is another reigning sin likewise let us behold in what a strange disguise young damsels do appear both rich and poor the like was ne'er in any age before what artificial ornaments they wear black patches paint and locks of powdered hair likewise in lofty hoops they are arrayed as if they would correct what god had made yet let em know for all those youthful charms they must lie down in death's cold frozen arms oh think on this and raise your thoughts above the sin of pride which you so dearly love likewise the wilful sinners that transgress the righteous laws of god by drunkenness 
they do abuse the creatures which were sent purely for man's refreshing nourishment many diseases doth that sin attend but what is worst of all the fatal end let not the pleasures of a quaffing bowl destroy and stupefy thy active soul perhaps the jovial drunkard overnight may seem to reap the pleasures of delight while for his wine he doth in plenty call but oh the sting of conscience after all is like a gnawing worm upon the mind then if you would the peace of conscience find a sober conversation learn with speed for that's the sweetest life that man can lead be careful that thou art not drawn away by foolishness to break the sabbath day be constant at the pious house of prayer that thou mayst learn the christian duties there for tell me wherefore should we carp and care for what we eat and drink and what we wear and the meanwhile our fainting souls exclude from that refreshing sweet celestial food yet so it is we by experience find many young wanton gallants seldom mind the church of god but scornfully deride that sacred word by which they must be tried a tavern or an alehouse they adore but will not come within the church before they're brought to lodge under a silent tomb and then who knows how dismal is their doom though for a while perhaps they flourish here and seem to scorn the very thoughts of fear yet when they're summoned to resign their breath they can't outbrave the bitter stroke of death consider this young gallants whilst you may swift winged time and tide for none will stay and therefore let it be your christian care to serve the lord and for your death prepare there is another crying sin likewise behold young gallants cast their wanton eyes on painted harlots which they often meet at every creek and corner of the street by whom they are like dismal captives led to their distraction grace and fear is fled till at the length they find themselves betrayed and for that sin most sad examples made then then perhaps in bitter tears they'll cry with wringing hands against their company which did betray them to that dismal state consider this before it is too late likewise sons and daughters far and near honour your loving friends and parents dear let not your disobedience grieve them so nor cause their aged eyes with tears to flow what a heart-breaking sorrow it must be to dear indulgent parents when they see their stubborn children wilfully run on against the wholesome laws of god and man oh let these things a deep impression make upon your hearts with speed your sins forsake for true it is the lord will never bless those children that do wilfully transgress now to conclude both young and old i pray reform your sinful lives this very day that god in mercy may his love extend and bring the nation's troubles to an end end of england's alarm section nine of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain smoking spiritualized the following old poem was long ascribed, on apparently sufficient grounds, to the Reverend Ralph Erskine, or, as he designated himself, Ralph Erskine, V.D.M. The peasantry throughout the north of England always call it Erskine's Song, and not only is his name given as the author in numerous chapbooks, but in his volume of Gospel Sonnets, from an early copy of which our version is transcribed. The discovery, however, by Mr. Collier, of the first part in a manuscript from the time of James I, with the initials J.W. affixed to it, has disposed of Erskine's claim to the honour of the entire authorship. G.W. is supposed to be George Withers, but this is purely conjectural, and it is not at all improbable that G.W. really stands for W.G., as it was a common practice amongst anonymous writers to reverse their initials. The history, then, of the poem seems to be this, that the first part, 
as it is now printed, originally constituted the whole production, being complete in itself, that the second part was afterwards added by the Reverend Ralph Erskine, and that both parts came subsequently to be ascribed to him, as his was the only name published in connection with the song. The Reverend Ralph Erskine was born at Moneylaws, Northumberland, on the 15th March, 1685. He was one of the thirty-three children of Ralph Erskine of Shieldfield, a family of repute descended from the ancient house of Mar. He was educated at the college in Edinburgh, obtained his license to preach in June 1709, and was ordained on an unanimous invitation over the church at Dunfermline in August 1711. He was twice married, in 1714 to Margaret Dewar, daughter of the Laird of Lassady, by whom he had five sons and five daughters, all of whom died in the prime of life, and in 1732 to Margaret, daughter of Mr. Simpson of Edinburgh, by whom he had four sons, one of whom, with his wife, survived him. He died in November 1752. Erskine was the author of a great number of sermons, a paraphrase on the canticles, scripture songs, a treatise on mental images, and gospel sonnets. Smoking Spiritualized is, at the present day, a standard publication with modern ballad printers, but their copies are exceedingly corrupt. Many versions and paraphrases of the song exist. Several are referred to in notes and queries, and, amongst them, a broadside of the date of 1670 and another date at 1672, both printed before Erskine was born, presenting different readings of the first part, or original poem. In both of these, the burthen, or refrain, differs from that of our copy by the employment of the expression drink tobacco, instead of smoke tobacco. The former was the ancient term for drawing in the smoke, swallowing it, and emitting it through the nostrils. A correspondent of Notes and Queries says that the natives of India to this day use the phrase hookah pu'e, to drink the hookah. Part 1 This Indian weed, now withered quite, Though green at noon, cut down at night, Shows thy decay. All flesh is hay. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. The pipe, so lily-like and weak, Does thy mortal state bespeak. Thou art e'en sut, gone with a touch. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. And when the smoke ascends on high, Then thou behold'st the vanity of worldly stuff. Gone with a puff, thus think, and smoke tobacco. And when the pipe grows foul within, Think on thy soul defiled with sin, For then the fire it does require. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. And cease the ashes cast away, Then to thyself thou mayest say, That to the dust return thou must. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. Part 2. Was this small plant for thee cut down? So was the plant of great renown which mercy sends for nobler ends. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. Doth juice medicinal proceed from such a naughty foreign weed? Then what's the power of Jesse's flower? Thus think, and smoke tobacco. The promise, like the pipe, inlays, and by the mouth of faith conveys what virtue flows from Sharon's rose. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. In vain the unlighted pipe you blow, Your pains in outward means are so, Till heavenly fire your heart inspire. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. The smoke, like a burning incense, towers, So should a praying heart of yours, With ardent cries, surmount the skies. Thus think, and smoke tobacco. End of Smoking Spiritualized Recording by Stephen Harvey Section 10 of Ancient Poems, Ballads and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. The Masonic Hymn this is a very ancient production, though given from a modern copy, it has always been popular amongst the poor brethren of the mystic tie. The late Henry O'Brien, A.B., quotes the seventh verse in his essay on the Round Towers of Ireland. 
he generally had a common copy of the hymn in his pocket and on meeting with any of his antiquarian friends who were not masons was in the habit of thrusting it into their hands and telling them that if they understood the mystic illusions it contained they would be in possession of a key which would unlock the pyramids of egypt the tune to the hymn is peculiar to it and is of a plaintive and solemn character come all you freemasons that dwell around the globe that wear the badge of innocence i mean the royal robe which noah he did wear when the ark he stood when the world was destroyed by a deluging flood noah he was virtuous in the sight of the lord he loved a freemason that kept the secret word for he built the ark had he planted the first vine now his soul in heaven like an angel doth shine once i was blind and could not see the light then up to jerusalem i took my flight i was led by the evangelist through a wilderness of care you may see by the sign and the badge that i wear on the thirteenth rose the ark let us join hand in hand for the lord spake to moses by water and by land unto the pleasant river where by eden it did rin and eve tempted adam by the serpent of sin when i think of moses it makes me to blush all on mount horeb where i saw the burning bush my shoes i'll throw off and my staff i'll cast away and i'll wander like a pilgrim unto my dying day when i think of aaron it makes me to weep likewise of the virgin mary who lay at our saviour's feet twas in the garden of gethsemane where he had the bloody sweat repent my dearest brethren before it is too late i thought i saw twelve dazzling lights which put me in surprise in gazing all around me i heard a dismal noise the serpent passed by me which fell into the ground with great joy and comfort the secret word i found some say it is lost but surely it is found and so is our saviour it is known to all around and search all the scriptures over and there it will be shown the tree that will bear no fruit must be cut down abraham was a man well beloved by the lord he was true to be found in great jehovah's word he stretched forth his hand and took a knife to slay his son an angel appearing said the lord's will be done o oh, abraham o oh, abraham lay no hand upon the lad he sent him unto thee to make thy heart glad thy seed shall increase like stars in the sky and thy soul into heaven like gabriel shall fly o oh, never o oh, never will i hear an orphan cry nor yet a gentle virgin until the day i die you wandering jews that travel the wide world round may knock at the door where truth is to be found often against the turks and infidels we fight to let the wandering world know we're in the right for in heaven there's a lodge and saint peter keeps the door and none can enter in but those that are pure saint peter he opened and so we entered in into the holy seat secure which is all free from sin saint peter he opened and so we entered there and the glory of the temple no man can compare end of the masonic hymn section eleven of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain god speed the plow and bless the corn mow a dialogue between the husbandman and serving man the tune is i am the duke of norfolk this ancient dialogue though in a somewhat altered form see the ensuing poem has long been used at country merrymakings. It is transcribed from a black letter copy in the third volume of the Roxburgh Collection, apparently one of the imprints of Peter Brooksby, which would make the composition at least as old as the close of the 15th century. There are several dialogues of a similar character. 
argument. The serving man, the plowman, would invite to leave his calling and to take delight. But he to that by no means will agree, lest he thereby should come to beggary. He makes it plain, appear a country life doth far excel, and so they end the strife. My noble friends give ear, if mirth you love to hear. I'll tell you as fast as I can a story very true. Then mark what doth ensue. Concerning of a husbandman. A serving man did meet a husbandman in the street, and thus unto him began. Servingman, I pray you to tell me of what calling you be, or if you be a serving man. Husbandman, quoth he, my brother dear, the coast I mean to clear, and the truth you shall understand. I in no way disdain, but this I tell you plain, I am an honest husbandman. Servingman, if a husbandman you be, then come along with me. I'll help you as soon as I can unto a gallant place, where in a little space you shall be a serving man. Husbandman, sir, for your diligence I give you many thanks. These things I receive at your hand. I pray you to me show, whereby that I may know, what pleasures hath a serving man. Servingman. A serving man hath pleasure which passeth time and measure. When the hawk on his fist doth stand, his hood and his verils brave, and other things we have, which yield joy to a serving man. Husbandman. My pleasure's more than that, to see my oxen fat, and to prosper well under my hand. And therefore I do mean with my horse and with my team, to keep myself a husbandman. Serving man. Oh, tis a gallant thing in the prime time of the spring to hear the huntsman now and then, his bugle for to blow, and the hounds run all a row. This is pleasure for a serving man. To hear the beagle cry, and to see the falcon fly, and the hare trip o'er the plain, and the huntsman and the hound make hill and dale rebound. This is pleasure for a serving man. Husbandman. "'Tis pleasure, too, you know, to see the corn to grow, and to grow so well on the land. The plowing and the sowing, the reaping and the mowing, yield pleasure to the husbandman. Servingman. At our table you may eat all sorts of dainty meat, pig, coney, goose, capon, and swan, and with lords and ladies fine you may drink beer, ale, and wine. This is pleasure for a servingman." Husbandman, while you eat goose and capon, I'll feed on beef and bacon, and piece of hard cheese now and then. We pudding have and souse always ready in the house, which contents the honest husbandman. Servingman, at the court you may have your garments fine and brave, and cloak with gold lace laid upon, a shirt white as milk and wrought with finest silk. That's pleasure for a servingman husbandman. Such proud and costly gear is not for us to wear. Amongst the briars and brambles many a one a good strong russet coat, and at your need a groat will suffice the husbandman. A proverb here I tell, which likes my humor well, and remember it well I can. If a courtier be too bold, he'll want when he is old. Then farewell the serving man. Serving man. It needs must be confessed that your calling is the best. No longer discourse with you I can, but henceforth I will pray by night and by day. Heaven bless the honest husbandman. End of God Speed the Plow and Bless the Corn Mow Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rita Louise Section 12 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Dialogue Between the Husbandman and the Serving Man This traditional version of the preceding ancient dialogue has long been popular at country festivals. At a harvest home feast at Selborne in Hampshire in 1836, we heard it recited by two countrymen, who gave it with considerable humor and dramatic effect. It was delivered in a sort of chant or recitative. 
Davies Gilbert published a very similar copy in his Ancient Christmas Carols. In the modern printed editions, which are almost identical with ours, the term servant man has been substituted for the more ancient designation. Serving man. Well met, my brother friend, all at this highway end, so simple all alone as you can. I pray you tell to me, what may your calling be? Are you not a serving man? Husband man. No, no, my brother dear, what makes you to inquire of any such a thing at my hand? Indeed, I shall not feign, but I will tell you plain, I am a downright husband man. Serving man. If a husband man you be, then go along with me, and quickly you shall see out of hand how in a little space I will help you to a place where you may be a serving man. Husband man. Kind sir, I turn you thanks for your intelligence. These things I receive at your hand. But something pray now show that first I may plainly know the pleasures of a serving man. Serving man. Why, a serving man has pleasure beyond all sort of measure, with his hawk on his fist as he does stand. For the game that he does kill, and the meat that does him fill, are pleasures for the serving man. Husband man. And my pleasure's more than that, to see my oxen fat, and a good stock of hay by them stand. My plowing and my sowing, my reaping and my mowing, are pleasures for the husband man. Serving man, why it is a gallant thing to ride out with a king, with a lord, duke, or any such man, to hear the horns to blow and see the hounds all in a row, that is pleasure for the serving man. Husband man, but my pleasure's more, I know, to see my corn to grow, so thriving all over my land, and therefore I do mean, with my plowing, with my team, to keep myself a husband man. Serving man, why the diet that we eat is the choicest of all meat, such as pig, goose, capon, and swan. Our pastry is so fine, we drink sugar in our wine. That is living for the serving man. Husband man, talk not of goose nor capon, give me good beef or bacon, and good bread and cheese now at hand. With pudding, brawn, and souse, all in a farmer's house, that is living for the husband man. Serving man. Why, the clothing that we wear is delicate and rare. With our coat, lace, buckles, and band, our shirts are white as milk, and our stockings, they are silk. That is clothing for a serving man. Husband man. But I value not a hair your delicate fine wear, such as gold is laced upon. Give me a good gray coat, and in my purse a groat. That is clothing for the husband man. Serving man. Kind sir, it would be bad if none could be had those tables for to wait upon. There is no lord, duke, nor squire, nor member for the shire can do without a serving man. Husband man. But Jack, it would be worse if there was none of us to follow the plowing of the land. There is neither king, lord, nor squire, nor member for the shire can do without the husband man. Serving man. Kind sir, I must confess that I humbly protest. I will give you the uppermost hand. Although your labor is painful and mine, it is so very gainful. I wish I were a husband man. Husband man. So come now, let us all, both great as well as small, pray for the grain of our land. And let us whatsoever do all our best endeavor for to maintain the good husband man. End of A Dialogue Between the Husbandman and the Serving Man Read for LibriVox by Rita Louise Section 13 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Catholic the following ingenious production has been copied literally from a broadside posted against the parlor wall of a country inn in Gloucestershire. The verses are susceptible of two interpretations, being Catholic if read in the columns, but Protestant if read across. I hold as faith 
what Rome's church saith, where the king's head, the flocks misled, where the altar's dressed, the people's blessed. He's but an ass who shuns the mass. What England's church allows, my conscience disavows. That church can have no shame that holds the Pope supreme. Their service scarce divine with table bread and wine. Who the communion flies is Catholic and wise. I hold as faith what England's church allows, what Rome's church saith, my conscience disavows. Where the king's head, that church can have no shame, the flock's misled that holds the Pope supreme. Where the altar's dressed, their service scarce divine, the people's blessed with table, bread, and wine. He's but an ass who the communion flies, who shuns the mass, is Catholic and wise. London, printed for George Eversden at the Sign of the Maidenhead in St. Powell's Churchyard, 1655. Come Privilegio. End of The Catholic. Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Louise. Section 14 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Three Knights. Traditional. The Three Knights was first printed by the late Davies Gilbert, FRS, in the appendix to his work on Christmas carols. Mr. Gilbert thought that some verses were wanting after the eighth stanza, but we entertain a different opinion. A conjectural emendation made in the ninth verse, viz. the substitution of far for four, seems to render the ballad perfect. The ballad is still popular amongst the peasantry in the west of England. The tune is given by Gilbert. The refrain in the second and fourth lines, printed with the first verse, should be repeated in recitation in every verse. There did three knights come from the west with the high and the lily o, and these three knights courted one lady as the rose was so sweetly blown. The first knight came was all in white with the high and the lily o, and asked of her if she'd be his delight as the rose was so sweetly blown. The next knight came was all in green with the high and the lily o and asked of her if she'd be his queen, as the rose was so sweetly blown. The third knight came was all in red, with the high and the lily o, and asked of her if she would wed, as the rose was so sweetly blown. Then have you asked of my father, dear, with the high and the lily o, likewise of her who did me bear, as the rose was so sweetly blown? And have you asked of my brother John with the high and the lily o, and also of my sister Anne, as the rose was so sweetly blown? Yes, I've asked of your father dear with the high and the lily o, likewise of her who did you bear, as the rose was so sweetly blown. And I've asked of your sister Anne with the high and the lily o, but I've not asked of your brother John, as the rose was so sweetly blown. Far on the road as they rode along, with the high and the lily o, there did they meet with her brother John, as the rose was so sweetly blown. She stooped low to kiss him sweet, with the high and the lily o, he to her heart did a dagger meet, as the rose was so sweetly blown. Ride on, ride on, cried the serving man, with the high and the lily o. Methinks your bride, she looks wondrous wan, as the rose was so sweetly blown. I wish I were on yonder stile, with the high and the lily o, for there I would sit and bleed a while, as the rose was so sweetly blown. I wish I were on yonder hill, with the high and the lily o, there I'd alight and make my will, as the rose was so sweetly blown. What would you give to your father, dear? with the high and the lily o, the gallant steed which doth me bear, as the rose was so sweetly blown. What would you give to your mother, dear, with the high and the lily o, 
my wedding shift which I do wear, as the rose was so sweetly blown. But she must wash it very clean with the high and the lily o, for my heart's blood sticks in every seam, as the rose was so sweetly blown. What would you give to your sister Anne with the high and the lily o, my gay gold ring and my feathered fan, as the rose was so sweetly blown? What would you give to your brother John with the high and the lily o, a rope and a gallows to hang him on? as the rose was so sweetly blown. What would you give to your brother John's wife with the high and the lily o, a widow's weeds and a quiet life, as the rose was so sweetly blown? End of The Three Nights Recording for LibriVox.org by Rita Louise Section 15 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blind Beggar of Begnall Green Showing how his daughter was married to a knight, and had three thousand pound to her portion. Percy's copy of The Beggar's Daughter of Bednall Green is known to be very incorrect. Besides many alterations and improvements which it received at the hands of the bishop, it contains no less than eight stanzas written by Robert Dodsley, the author of The Economy of Human Life. So far as poetry is concerned, there cannot be a question that the version in the reliquae is far superior to the original, which is still a popular favorite and a correct copy of which is now given, as it appears in all the common broadside editions that have been printed from 1672 to the present time. Although the original copies have all perished, the ballad has been very satisfactorily proved by Percy to have been written in the reign of Elizabeth. The present reprint is from a modern copy, carefully collated with one in the Bagford collection, entitled, the rarest ballad that ever was seen of the blind beggar's daughter of Bednall Green. The imprint to it is, printed by and for W. Onley, and are to be sold by C. Bates at the sign of the Sun and Bible in Pie Corner. The very antiquated orthography adopted in some editions does not rest on any authority. For two tunes to the blind beggar, see Popular Music. Part 1 this song's of a beggar who long lost his sight, and had a fair daughter, most pleasant and bright, and many a gallant brave suitor had she, and none was so comely as pretty Bessie. And though she was of complexion most fair, and seeing she was but a beggar his heir, of ancient housekeepers despised was she, whose sons came as suitors to pretty Bessie. Wherefore in great sorrow fair Bessie did say, Good father and mother, let me now go away, To seek out my fortune, whatever it be. This suit then was granted to pretty Bessie. This Bessie that was of a beauty most bright, They clad in grey russet, and late in the night, From father and mother alone parted she, Who sighed and sobbed for pretty Bessie. She went till she came to Stratford at Bow, then she know not whither or which way to go. With tears she lamented her sad destiny, so sad and so heavy was pretty Bessie. She kept on her journey until it was day, and went unto Rumford along the highway, and at the king's arms entertained was she, so fair and well favored was pretty Bessie. She had not been there one month at an end, but master and mistress and all was her friend, and every brave gallant that once did her see was straightway in love with pretty Bessie. Great gifts they did send her of silver and gold, and in their songs daily her love they extolled. Her beauty was blazed in every decree, so fair and so comely was pretty Bessie. The young men of Rumford in her had their joy, she showed herself courteous but never too coy, and at their commandment still she would be, so fair and so comely was pretty Bessie. Four suitors at once unto her did go, they craved her favor, but still she said no, I would not have gentlemen marry with me, yet ever they honored pretty Bessie. Now one of them was a gallant young knight, and he came unto her disguised in the night, 
the second a gentleman of high degree who wooed and sued for pretty bessie a merchant of london whose wealth was not small was then the third suitor and proper withal her master's own son the fourth man must be who swore he would die for pretty bessie if that thou wilt marry with me quoth the knight i'll make thee a lady with joy and delight my heart is enthralled in thy fair beauty then grant me thy favour my pretty bessie the gentleman said come marry with me in silks and in velvet my bessie shall be my heart lies distracted oh hear me quoth he and grant me thy love my dear pretty bessie let me be thy husband the merchant did say thou shalt live in london most gallant and gay my ships shall bring home rich jewels for thee and i will forever love pretty bessie then bessie she sighed and thus she did say my father and mother i mean to obey first get their good will and be faithful to me and you shall enjoy your dear pretty bessie to every one of them that answer she made therefore unto her they joyfully said this thing to fulfil we all now agree but where dwells thy father my pretty bessie my father quoth she is soon to be seen the silly blind beggar of bednall green that daily sits begging for charity he is the kind father of pretty bessie his marks and his token are known full well he always is led by a dog and a bell a poor silly old man god knoweth is he yet he's the true father of pretty bessie nay nay quoth the merchant thou art not for me she quoth the inholder my wife shall not be i loathe said the gentleman a beggar's degree therefore now farewell my pretty bessie why then quoth the knight hap better or worse i weigh not true love by the weight of the purse and beauty is beauty in every degree then welcome to me my dear pretty bessie with thee to thy father forthwith i will go nay forbear quoth his kinsman it must not be so a poor beggar's daughter a lady shan't be then take thy adieu of thy pretty bessie as soon then as it was break of the day the knight had from rumford stole bessie away the young men of rumford so sick as may be rode after to fetch again pretty bessie as swift as the wind to ride they were seen until they came near unto bednall green and as the knight lighted most courteously they fought against him for pretty bessie but rescue came presently over the plain or else the knight there for his love had been slain the fray being ended they straightway did see his kinsmen come railing at pretty bessie then bespoke the blind beggar although i be poor rail not against my child at my own door though she be not decked in velvet and pearl yet i will drop angels with thee for my girl and then if my gold should better her birth and equal the gold you lay on the earth then neither rail you nor grudge you to see the blind beggar's daughter a lady to be but first i will hear and have it well known the gold that you drop it shall be all your own with that they replied contented we be then here's quoth the beggar for pretty bessie with that an angel he dropped on the ground and dropped in angels full three thousand pound and oftentimes it proved most plain for the gentleman's one the beggar dropped twain so that the whole place wherein they did sit with gold was covered every whit the gentleman having dropped all his store said beggar your hand hold for i have no more thou hast fulfilled thy promise aright then marry my girl quoth he to the knight and then quoth he i will throw you down an hundred pound more to buy her a gown the gentleman all who his treasure had seen admired the beggar of bednall green and those that had been her suitors before their tender flesh for anger they tore thus was the fair bessie matched to a knight and made a lady in others despite a fairer lady there never was seen than the blind beggar's daughter of bednall green but of her sumptuous marriage and feast and what fine lords and ladies there press the second part shall set forth to your sight with marvellous pleasure and wished-for delight of a blind beggar's daughter so bright that late was betrothed to a young knight all the whole discourse therefore you may see but now comes the wedding of pretty bessie 
Part Two It was in a gallant palace most brave, adorned with all the cost they could have. This wedding it was kept most sumptuously, and all for the love of pretty Bessie and all kind of dainties and delicate sweet was brought to their banquet as it was thought meet. Partridge and plover and venison most free against the brave wedding of pretty Bessie. The wedding through England was spread by report so that a great number thereto did resort of nobles and gentles of every degree and all for the fame of pretty Bessie. To church then away went this gallant young knight, his bride followed after an angel most bright, with troops of ladies the like was ne'er seen, as went with sweet Bessie of Bednall Green. This wedding being solemnized then, with music performed by skilfullest men, the nobles and gentlemen down at the side, each one beholding the beautiful bride. But after the sumptuous dinner was done, to talk and to reason a number begun, and of the blind beggar's daughter most bright, and what with his daughter he gave to the knight. Then spoke the nobles, much marvel have we, this jolly blind beggar we cannot yet see. My lords, quoth the bride, my father so base, is loth with his presence these states to disgrace. The praise of a woman in question to bring before her own face is a flattering thing. But we think thy father's baseness, quoth they, might by thy beauty be clean put away. They no sooner this pleasant word spoke, but in comes the beggar in a silken cloak, a velvet cap and a feather had he, and now a musician forsooth he would be. And being led in from catching of harm, he had a dainty lute under his arm, said please you to hear any music of me a song i will sing you of pretty bessie with that his lute he twanged straightway and thereon began most sweetly to play and after a lesson was played two or three he strained out this song most delicately a beggar's daughter did dwell on a green who for her beauty may well be a queen a blithe bonny lass and dainty was she and many one called her pretty Bessie. Her father he had no goods nor no lands, but begged for a penny all day with his hands, and yet for her marriage gave thousands three, yet still he hath somewhat for pretty Bessie. And here, if any one do her disdain, her father is ready with might and with main to prove she is come of noble degree. Therefore let none flout at my pretty Bessie. With that the lords and the company round, with a hearty laughter, were ready to swound. At last said the lords, full well we may see, the bride and the bridegrooms beholden to thee. With that the fair bride all blushing did rise, with crystal water all in her bright eyes. Pardon, my father, brave nobles, quoth she, that through blind affection thus dotes upon me. If this be thy father, the nobles did say, well may he be proud of this happy day. Yet by his countenance well may we see, his birth with his fortune could never agree. And therefore, blind beggar, we pray thee bewray, and look to us then the truth thou dost say, thy birth and thy parentage, what it may be, e'en for the love thou bearest pretty Bessie. Then give me leave, ye gentles, each one, a song more to sing, and then I'll be gone. And if that I do not win good report, then do not give me one groat for my sport. When first our king his fame did advance, and sought his title in delicate France, in many places great perils passed he, but then was not born my pretty Bessie. And at those wars went over to fight many a brave duke, a lord, and a knight. And with them young Monford of courage so free, But then was not born my pretty Bessie. And there did young Monford with a blow on the face Lose both his eyes in a very short space. His life had been gone away with his sight, Had not a young woman gone forth in the night. Among the said men her fancy did move To search and to seek for her own true love, who seeing young Monford there gasping to die, she saved his life through her charity. And then all our victuals in beggar's attire, at the hands of good people we then did require, 
At last into England, as now it is seen, we came and remained in Bednall Green. And thus we have lived in fortune's despite, though poor yet contented with humble delight. And in my old years, a comfort to me, God sent me a daughter called Pretty Bessie. And thus, ye nobles, my song I do end, hoping by the same no man to offend. Full forty long winters, thus I have been a silly blind beggar of Bednall Green. Now when the company, every one, did hear the strange tale he told in his song, they were amazed, as well they might be, both at the blind beggar and pretty Bessie. With that the fair bride they all did embrace, saying, You are come of an honorable race. Thy father likewise is of high degree, and thou art right worthy a lady to be. Thus was the feast ended with joy and delight. A happy bridegroom was made the young knight, who lived in great joy and felicity with his fair lady, dear pretty Bessie. End of The Blind Beggar of Bednall Green LibriVox recording by Rita Louise, Ann Arbor, Michigan, 2019
the one of us is bold robin hood and the other little john so free now says the pedlar it lays my good will whether my name i choose to tell thee i am gamble gold of the gay green woods and travelled far be on the sea for killing a man in my father's land from my country i was forced to flee if your gamble gold of the gay green woods and travelled far beyond the sea you are my mother's own sister's son what nearer cousins then can we be they sheathed their swords with friendly words so merrily did they agree and they went to a tavern and there they dined and bottles crept most merrily end of the bold peddler and robin hood Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 17 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Outlandish Knight. This is the common English stall copy of a ballad of which there are a variety of versions, for an account of which and of the presumed origin of the story, the reader is referred to the notes on the Water o' Weary's Well in the Scottish traditional versions of ancient ballads, published by the Percy Society. By the term outlandish is signified an inhabitant of that portion of the border which was formerly known by the name of the Debatable Land, a district which, though claimed by both England and Scotland, could not be said to belong to either country. The people on each side of the border applied the term outlandish to the debatable residence. The tune to The Outlandish Night has never been printed. It is peculiar to the ballad and from its popularity is well known. An outlandish knight came from the Northlands, and he came a-wooing to me. He told me he'd take me unto the Northlands, and there he would marry me. Come, fetch me some of your father's gold and some of your mother's fee, and two of the best nags out of the stable where they stand thirty and three. She fetched him some of her father's gold and some of the mother's fee, and two of the best nags out of the stable where they stood thirty and three. She mounted her on her milk-white steed, he on the dapple gray. They rode till they came unto the seaside three hours before it was day. Light off, light off thy milk-white steed, and deliver it unto me. Six pretty maids have I drowned here, and thou the seventh shall be. Pull off, pull off thy silken gown, and deliver it unto me. Methinks it looks too rich and too gay to rot in the salt sea. Pull off, pull off thy silken stays, and deliver them unto me. Methinks they are too fine and gay to rot in the salt sea. Pull off, pull off thy holland smock, and deliver it unto me. Methinks it looks too rich and gay to rot in the salt sea. If I must pull off my holland smock, pray turn thy back unto me. For it is not fitting that such a ruffian a naked woman should see. He turned his back towards her, and viewed the leaves so green. She catched him round the middle so small, and tumbled him into the stream. He'd drop it high, and he'd drop it low, until he came to the side. Catch hold of my hand, my pretty maiden, and I will make you a bride. Lie there, lie there, you false-hearted man, lie there instead of me. Six pretty maids have you drowned here, and the seventh has drowned thee. She mounted on her milk-white steed and led the dapple gray. She rode till she came to her own father's hall three hours before it was day. The parrot, being in the window so high, hearing the lady did say, I'm afraid that some ruffian has led you astray, that you have tarried so long away. Don't prittle, don't prattle, my pretty parrot, nor tell no tales of me. Thy cage shall be made of the glittering gold, although it is made of a tree. The king, being in the chamber so high, and hearing the parrot did say, what ails you, what ails you, my pretty parrot, that you prattle so long before day? It's no laughing matter, the parrot did say, but so loudly I call unto thee. 
for the cats have got into the window so high, and I'm afraid they will have me. Well turned, well turned, my pretty parrot, well turned, well turned for me. Thy cage shall be made of the glittering gold, and the door of the best ivory. End of the Outlandish Night Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Louise Section 18 of Ancient Poems, Ballads and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Lord Delaware, Traditional. This interesting traditional ballad was first published by Mr. Thomas Lyle in his Ancient Ballads and Songs, London, 1827. We have not as yet, says Mr. Lyle, been able to trace out the historical incident upon which this ballad appears to have been founded. Yet those curious in such matters may consult, if they list, proceedings and debates in the House of Commons for 1621 and 1662, where they will find that some stormy debating in these several years has been agitated in Parliament regarding the Corn Laws, which bear pretty close upon the leading features of the ballad. Does not the ballad, however, belong to a much earlier period? The description of the combat, the presence of heralds, the wearing of armour, etc., justify the conjecture. For Delaware, ought we not to read Delaware, and is not Sir Thomas de la Mer the hero? The de la Mer, who in the reign of Edward the Third a d thirteen seventy seven was speaker of the house of commons all historians are agreed in representing him as a person using great freedom of speech and which indeed he carried to such an extent as to endanger his personal liberty as bearing somewhat upon the subject of the ballad it may be observed that de la mer was a great advocate of popular rights and particularly protested against the inhabitants of england being subject to purveyance asserting that if the royal revenue was faithfully administered there would be no necessity for laying burdens on the people in the subsequent reign of richard the second de la mer was a prominent character and though history is silent on the subject it is not improbable that such a man might even in the royal presence had defended the rights of the poor and spoken in extenuation of the agrarian insurrectionary movements which were then so prevalent and so alarming on the hypothesis of de la mer being the hero there are other incidents in the tale which cannot be reconciled with history such as the title given to de la mer who certainly was never ennobled nor can we ascertain that he was ever mixed up in any duel nor does it appear clear who can be meant by the welsh lord the brave duke of devonshire that dukedom not having been created till sixteen ninety four and no nobleman having derived any title whatever from devonshire previously to sixteen eighteen when baron cavendish of hardwick was created the first earl of devonshire we may therefore assume that for devonshire ought to be asserted the name of some other county or place strict historical accuracy is however hardly to be expected in any ballad particularly in one which like the present has evidently been corrupted in floating down the stream of time there is only one quarrel recorded at the supposed period of our tale as having taken place betwixt two noblemen and which resulted in a hostile meeting viz that wherein the belligerent parties were the duke of hereford who might be a ballad monger be deemed a welsh lord and the duke of norfolk this was in the reign of richard the second no fight however took place owing to the interference of the king a minstrel author may have had rather confused historical ideas and so mixed up certain passages in de la mer's history with this squabble and we are strongly inclined to suspect that such is the case and that it will be found the real clue to the story vide hume's history of england 
chapter seventeen a d thirteen ninety eight lyle acknowledges that he has taken some liberties with the all version but does not state what they were beyond that they consisted merely in smoothing down would that he had left it in the rough the last verse has every appearance of being apocryphal it looks like one of those benedictory verses with which minstrels were and still are in the habit of concluding their songs lyle says the tune is pleasing and peculiar to the ballad a homely version presenting only trivial variations on that of mr lyle is still printed and sung in the parliament house great rout has been there betwixt our good king and the lord delaware says lord delaware to his majesty full soon will it please you my liege to grant me a boon what's your boon says the king now let me understand it's give me all the poor men we're starving in this land and without delay i'll hie me to lincolnshire to sow hemp seed and flax seed and hang them all there for with hemp and cord it's better to stop each poor man's breath than with famine you should see your subjects starve to death up starts a dutch lord who to delaware did say thou deserves to be stabbed then he turns himself away thou deserves to be stabbed and the dogs have thine ears for insulting our king in this parliament of peers up sprang a welsh lord the brave duke of devonshire in young delaware's defence i'll fight this dutch lord my sire for he is in the right and i'll make it so appear him i dare to single combat for insulting delaware a stage was soon erected and to combat they went for to kill or to be killed it was either's full intent to the very first flourish when the heralds gave command the sword of brave devonshire went backward on his hand in suspense he paused a while scanned his foe before he strake then against the king's armour his bent sword he brake then he sprang from the stage to a soldier in the ring saying lend your sword that to an end this tragedy we bring though he's fighting me in armour while i am fighting bare even more than this i'd venture for young lord delaware leaping back on the stage sword to buckler now resounds till he left the dutch lord a-bleeding in his wounds the scene crying the king to his guards without delay call devonshire down take the dead man away no says brave devonshire i fought him as a man since he's dead i will keep the trophies i have won for he fought me in your armour while i fought him bare and the same you must win back my liege if ever you then wear god bless the church of england may it prosper on each hand and also every poor man now starving in this land and while i pray success may crown our king upon his throne i wish that every poor man may long enjoy his own end of lord delaware section nineteen of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by elaine conway england lord bateman this is a ludicrously corrupt abridgment of the ballad of lord bycon a copy of which will be found inserted amongst the early ballads an edition page one four four the following grotesque version was published several years ago by tilt london and also according to the title page by mustapha sirid constantinople under the title of the loving ballad of lord bateman it is however the only ancient form in which the ballad has existed in print and is one of the publications mentioned in thackeray's catalogue see ante page twenty the air printed in tilt's edition is the one to which the ballad is sung in the south of england but it is totally different to the northern tune which has never been published lord bateman he was a noble lord a noble lord of high degree he shipped himself on board a ship 
some foreign country he would go see he sailored east and he sailored west until he came to proud turkey where he was taken and put to prison until his life was almost weary and in this prison there grew a tree it grew so stout and grew so strong where he was chained by the middle until his life was almost gone this turk he had one only daughter the fairest creature my eyes did see she stole the keys of her father's prison and swore lord bateman she would set free have you got houses have you got lands or does northumberland belong to thee what would you give to the fair young lady that out of prison would set you free i have got houses i have got lands and half northumberland belongs to me i'll give it all to the fair young lady that out of prison would set me free oh then she took him to her father's hall and gave to him the best of wine and every health she drank unto him i wish lord bateman that you were mine now in seven years i'll make a vow and seven years i'll keep it strong if you're wed with no other woman wed with no other man oh then she took him to her father's harbour and gave to him a ship of fame farewell farewell to you lord bateman i'm afraid i'll ne'er see you again now seven long years are gone and past and fourteen days well known to thee she packed up all her gay clothing and swore lord bateman she would go see but when she came to lord bateman's castle so boldly she rang the bell who's there who's there cried the proud porter who's there unto me come tell oh is this lord bateman's castle or is his lordship here within oh yes oh yes cried the young porter he's just now taken his new bride in oh tell him to send me a slice of bread and a bottle of the best wine and not forgetting the fair young lady who did release him when close confine away away went this proud young porter away away and away went he until he came to lord bateman's chamber down on his bended knees fell he what news what news my proud young porter what news hast thou brought unto me there is the fairest of all young creatures that ever my two eyes did see she has got rings on every finger and round one of them she has got three and as much gay clothing round her middle as would buy all northumberly she bids you send her a slice of bread and a bottle of the best wine and not forgetting the fair young lady who did release you when close confine lord bateman he then in a passion flew and broke his sword in splinters three saying i will give all my father's riches if sophia has crossed the sea then up spoke the young bride's mother who never was heard to speak so free you'll not forget my only daughter if sophia has crossed the sea i own i made a bride of your daughter she's neither the better nor worse for me she came to me with her horse and saddle she may go back in her coach and three lord bateman prepared another marriage and sang with heart so full of glee i'll range no more in foreign countries now since sophia has crossed the sea end of lord bateman section twenty of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chris Pyle The Golden Glove, or The Squire of Tamworth This is a very popular ballad and sung in every part of England. It is traditionally reported to be founded on an incident which occurred in the reign of Elizabeth. It has been published in the broadside form from the commencement of the 18th century, but is no doubt much older. It does not appear to have been previously inserted in any collection. A wealthy young squire of Tamworth, we hear, he courted a nobleman's daughter so fair, and for to marry her it was his intent. All friends and relations gave their consent. The time was appointed for the wedding day, a young farmer chosen to give her away. As soon as the farmer the young lady did spy, he inflamed her heart, oh, my heart, she did cry. 
She turned from the squire, but nothing she said. Instead of being married, she took to her bed. The thought of the farmer soon run in her mind. A way for to have him she quickly did find. Coat, whisket, and breeches she did then put on. And a-hunting she went with her dog and her gun. She hunted all round where the farmer did dwell, because in her heart she did love him full well. She oftentimes fired, but nothing she killed. At length the young farmer came into the field. And a discourse with him it was her intent, with her dog and her gun to meet him she went. I thought you had been at the wedding, she cried, to wait on the squire, and give him his bride. No, sir, said the farmer, if the truth I may tell, I'll not give her away, for I love her too well. Suppose that the lady should grant you her love, you know that the squire your rival will prove. Why then, says the farmer, I'll take sword in hand, by honor I'll gain her when she shall command. It pleased the lady to find him so bold. She gave him a glove that was flowered with gold, and told him she found it when coming along, as she was hunting with her dog and her gun. The lady went home with a heart full of love, and gave out a notice that she'd lost a glove, and said, Who has found it and brings it to me? Whoever he is, he my husband shall be. The farmer was pleased when he heard of the news. With heart full of joy to the lady he goes. Dear honored lady, I've picked up your glove, and hope you'll be pleased to grant me your love. It's already granted I will be your bride. I love the sweet breath of a farmer, she cried. I'll be mistress of my dairy, and milking my cow, while my jolly brisk farmer is whistling at plow. And when she was married, she told of her fun, how she went a-hunting with her dog and her gun. And now I've got him so fast in my snare, I'll enjoy him forever, I vow and declare. End of The Golden Glove, or The Squire of Tamworth Recording by Chris Pyle Section 21 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. King James I and the Tinkler. Traditional. This ballad of King James I and the Tinkler was probably written either in, or shortly after, the reign of the monarch who is the hero. The incident recorded is said to be a fact though the locality is doubtful. By some the scene is laid at Norwood in Surrey, by others in some part of the English border. The ballad is alluded to by Percy, but is not inserted either in the relics or in any other popular collection. It is to be found only in a few broadsides and chapbooks of modern date. The present version is a traditional one, taken down, as here given, from the recital of the late Francis King, it is much superior to the common broadside edition with which it has been collated, and from which the thirteenth and fifteenth verses were obtained. The ballad is very popular on the border, and in the dales of Cumberland, Westmoreland, and Craven. The late Robert Anderson, the Cumbrian bard, represents Davy, in his song of the Clay Dobin, as singing The King and the Tinkler. And now, to be brief, let's pass over the rest, who seldom or never were given to jest, and come to King Jamie, the first of our throne, a pleasanter monarch sure never was known. As he was a-hunting the swift fallow deer, he dropped all his nobles, and when he got clear, in hope some pastime away he did ride, till he came to an alehouse hard by a woodside. And there with a tinkler he happened to meet, and him in kind sort he so freely did greet. Pray thee, good fellow, what hast in thy jug, which under thy arm thou dost lovingly hug. By the mass, quoth the tinkler, it's nappy brown ale, and for to drink to thee, friend, I will not fail. For although thy jacket looks gallant and fine, I think that my tuppence as good is as thine. By my soul, honest fellow, the truth thou hast spoke. And straight he sat down with the tinkler to joke. They drank to the king, and they pledged to each other, who'd seen him had thought they were brother and brother. As they were drinking, the king pleased to say, what news, honest fellow? Come tell me, I pray. There is nothing of news beyond that I hear the king's on the border a-chasing the deer. And truly I wish I so happy may be, whilst he is a-hunting the king I might see. For although I've travelled the land many ways, I never have yet seen a king in my days. The king, with a hearty brisk laughter, replied, I tell thee, good fellow, if thou canst but ride, thou shalt get up behind me, and I will thee bring to the presence of Jamie thy sovereign king." but he'll be surrounded with nobles so gay, 
"'And how shall we tell him from them, sir, I pray? "'Thou wilt easily ken him when once thou art there. "'The king will be covered, his nobles all bare. "'He got up behind him, and likewise his sack, "'his budget of leather and tools at his back. "'They rode till they came to the merry greenwood. "'His nobles came round him, bareheaded they stood. "'The tinkler then seeing so many appear, "'he slyly did whisper the king in his ear, "'saying they're all clothed so gloriously gay.' "'But which amongst them is the king, sir, I pray?' "'The king did with hearty good laughter reply, "'By my soul, my good fellow, it's thou or it's I. "'The rest are bareheaded, uncovered all round.' "'With his bag and his budget he fell to the ground. "'Like one that was frightened quite out of his wits, "'then on his knees he instantly gets, "'beseeching for mercy the king to him said, "'Thou art a good fellow, so be not afraid. "'Come, tell thy name. "'I am John of the Dale.' "'a mender of kettles, a lover of ale. "'Rise up, Sir John, I will honour thee here. "'I make thee a knight of three thousand a year.' "'This was a good thing for the tinkler indeed. "'Then unto the court he was sent for with speed, "'where great store of pleasure and pastime was seen "'in the royal presence of king and of queen. "'Sir John of the Dale, he has land, he has fee. "'At the court of the king, who so happy is he? "'Yet still in his hall hangs the tinkler's old sack.' and the budget of tools which he bore at his back. End of section 21section 22 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. The Keech and the Creel. This old and very humorous ballad has long been a favourite on both sides of the border, but had never appeared in print till about 1845, when a Northumbrian gentleman printed a few copies for private circulation, from one of which the following is taken. In the present impression, some trifling typographical mistakes are corrected, and the phraseology has been rendered uniform throughout. Keech in the Creel means the catch in the basket. A fair young May went up the street, some whitefish for to buy, and a bonny clerk's fall in love with her, and he's followed her by and by, by, and he's followed her by and by. Oh, where live ye, my bonny lass, I pray thee tell to me. For gin the night were ever so murk, I would come and visit thee, thee, I would come and visit thee. Oh, my father, he aye locks the door, my mither keeps the key. And gin ye were ever sick a wily wight, ye cannot win in to me, me, ye cannot win in to me. But the clerk, he had a true brother, and a wily wight was he. And he has made a long letter, was thirty steps and three, three, was thirty steps and three. He has made a cleek butt and a creel, a creel butt and a pin. And he's away to the chimney top, and he's letting the bonny clerk in, in, and he's letting the bonny clerk in. The old wife being not asleep, though late, late was the hour. I'll lay my life, quo the silly old wife, there is a man in our daughter's bower, bower, there is a man in our daughter's bower. The old man he got o'er the bed, to see if the thing was true. But she's ta'en the bonny clerk in her arms and covered him o'er with blue, blue, and covered him o'er with blue. Oh, where are you going now, father? She says, and where are you going so late? You've disturbed me in my evening prayers, and oh, but they were sweet, sweet, and oh, but they were sweet. Oh, ill betide ye, silly old wife, and an ill death may ye day. She has the muckle book in her arms, and she's praying for you and me, me, and she's praying for you and me. The old wife being not asleep. Then something mare was said. I'll lay my life, quo the silly old wife. There's a man by our daughter's bed, bed. There's a man by our daughter's bed. The old wife, she got o'er the bed, to see if the thing was true. But what the rack took the old wife's foot? For into the creel she flew, flew. For into the creel she flew. The man that was at the chimney top, finding the creel was full. He wrapped her up round his left shoulder, and fast to him he drew, drew. And fast to him he drew. Oh help, oh help, oh hinny no help, oh help, oh hinny do. For him that ye aye wished me at, he's carried me off just no, no, he's carried me off just no. Oh, if the foul thief's gotten ye, I wish he may keep his hold. For all the lee long winter night, you'll never lie in your bed, bed, you'll never lie in your bed. He's towed her up, he's towed her down, he's towed her through and through. Oh God, assist, quo the silly old wife, for I'm just departin no, no, for I'm just departin no. He's towed her up, he's towed her down, he's gin her a right down fall. 
till every rib in the old wife's side played knick-knack on the wall, wall, played knick-knack on the wall. Oh, the blue, the bonny, bonny blue, and I wish the blue may do well, and every old wife that's so jealous o' her daughter, may she get a good keech in the creel, creel, may she get a good keech in the creel. End of section 22「Section 23 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Mary Broomfield, or The West Country Wager. This old West Country ballad was one of the broadsides printed at the aldermary press we have not met with any older impression though we have been assured that there are black letter copies in scott's ministry of the scottish border is a ballad called the broomfield hill it is a mere fragment but is evidently taken from the present ballad and can be considered only as one of the many modern antiques to be found in that work. A noble young squire that lived in the West, he courted a young lady gay, and as he was merry he put forth a jest, a wager with her he would lay. A wager with me, the young lady replied, I pray about what must it be. If I like the humor, you shan't be denied. I love to be merry and free. Quoth he, I will lay you a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds a and ten, that a maid, if you go to the merry Broomfield, that a maid you return not again. I'll lay you that wager, the lady, she said, then the money she flung down amain. To the merry Broomfield I'll go a pure maid, the same I'll return home again. He covered her bet in the midst of the hall with a hundred and ten jolly pounds, and then to his servant he straightway did call, for to bring forth his hawk and his hounds a ready obedience the servant did yield and all was made ready or night next morning he went to the merry broomfield to meet with his love and delight now when he came there having waited a while among the green broom down he lies the lady came to him and could not but smile for sleep then had closed his eyes. Upon his right hand a gold ring she secured, drawn from her own fingers so fair, that when he awaked he might be assured his lady and love had been there. She left him a posy of pleasant perfume, then stepped from the place where he lay then hid herself close in the besom of broom to hear what her true love did say he wakened and found the gold ring on his hand then sorrow of heart he was in my love has been here i do well understand and this wager i now shall not win oh where was you my goodly gohawk the witch I have purchased so dear. Why did you not waken me out of my sleep when the lady my love was here? Oh, with my bells did I ring, master, and eke with my feet did I run, and still did I cry, pray awake, master, she's here now and soon will be gone. Oh, where was you, my gallant greyhound, whose collar is flourished with gold why hast thou not wakened me out of my sleep when thou didst my lady behold 
dear master i barked with my mouth when she came and likewise my collar i shook and told you that here was the beautiful dame but no notice of me then you took oh where was thou my serving men whom i have clothed so fine if you had waked me when she was here the wager then had been mine in the night you should have slept master and kept awake in the day had you not been sleeping when hither she came then a maid she had not gone away then home he returned when the wager was lost with sorrow of heart i may say the lady she laughed to find her love crossed this was upon midsummer day o oh, squire i laid in the bushes concealed and heard you when you did complain and thus i have been to mary broomfield and a maid returned back again be cheerful be cheerful and do not repine for now tis as clear as the sun the money the money the money is mine the wager i fairly have won end of the merry broomfield or the west country wager section twenty four of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain sir john barleycorn the west country ballad of sir john barleycorn is very ancient and being the only version that has ever been sung at english merrymakings and country feasts can certainly set up a better claim to antiquity than any of the three ballads on the same subject to be found in evans's old ballads viz john barleycorn the little barleycorn and mass malt our west country version bears the greatest resemblance to the little barleycorn but it is very dissimilar to any of the three burns altered the old ditty but on referring to his version it will be seen that his corrections and additions want the simplicity of the original and certainly cannot be considered improvements the common ballad does not appear to have been inserted in any of our popular collections sir john barleycorn is very appropriately sung to the tune of stingo see popular music page three hundred and five there came three men out of the west their victory to try and they have taken a solemn oath poor barleycorn should die they took a plough and ploughed him in and arrowed clods on his head and then they took a solemn oath poor barleycorn was dead there he lay sleeping in the ground till rain from the sky did fall then barleycorn sprung up his head and so amazed them all there he remained till midsummer and looked both pale and wan then barleycorn he got a beard and so became a man then they sent men with scythes so sharp to cut him off at knee and then poor little barleycorn they served him barbarously then they sent men with pitchforks strong to pierce him to the heart and like a dreadful tragedy they bound him to a cart and then they brought him to a barn a prisoner to endure and so they fetched him out again and laid him on the floor then they set men with holly clubs to beat the flesh from his bones but the miller he served him worse than that for he ground him between two stones oh barley corn is the choicest grain that ever was sown on land it will do more than any grain by the turning of your hand it will make a boy into a man and a man into an ass 
it will change your gold into silver and your silver into brass it will make the huntsman hunt the fox that never wound his horn it will bring the tinker to the stocks that people may him scorn it will put sack into a glass and claret in the can and it will cause a man to drink till he neither can go nor stand end of sir john barleycorn recording by alan mapstone in oxford england Section 25 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Blow the Winds, I Ho. This Northumberan ballad is of great antiquity and bears considerable resemblance to the baffled knight or lady's policy inserted in piercy's relics it is not in any popular collection in the broadside from which it is here printed the title and chorus are given blow the winds i o a form common to many ballads and songs but only to those of great antiquity chapel in his popular music has an example in a song as old as sixteen ninety eight here's a health to jolly bacchus i ho i ho i ho in another well-known old catch the same form appears a pie sat on a pear tree i ho i ho i ho i o or as we find it given in these lyrics i ho was an ancient form of acclamation or triumph on joyful occasions and anniversaries it is common with slight variations to different languages in the gothic for example iola signifies to be merry it has been supposed by some etymologists that the word yule is a corruption of io there was a shepherd's son he kept sheep on yonder hill he laid his pipe and his crook aside and there he slept his fill and blow the winds i ho sing blow the winds i ho clear away the morning dew and blow the winds i ho he looked east and he looked west he took another look and there he spied a lady gay was dipping in a brook she said sir don't touch my mantle come let my clothes alone i will give you as much money as you can carry home i will not touch your mantle i'll let your clothes alone i'll take you out of the water clear my dear to be my own he did not touch her mantle he let her clothes alone but he took her from the clear water and all to be his own he set her on a milk-white steed himself upon another and there they rode along the road like sister and like brother and as they rode along the road he spied some cocks of hay yonder he says is a lovely place for men and maids to play and when they came to her father's gate she pulled at a ring and ready was the proud porter for to let the lady in and when the gates were open this lady jumped in she says you are a fool without and i'm a maid within good morrows to you modest boy i thank you for your care 
if you had been what you should have been i would not have left you there there is a horse in my father's stable he stands beyond the thorn he shakes his head above the trough but dares not pry the corn there is a bird in my father's flock a double comb he wears he flaps his wings and crows full loud but a capon's crest he bears there is a flower in my father's garden they call it merry gold the fool that will not win he may he shall not win he would said the shepherd's son as he doffed his shoon my feet they shall run bare and if ever i meet another maid i read that maid beware end of blow the winds i owe section twenty six of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the beautiful lady of kent or the seamen of dover we have met with two copies of this genuine english ballad the older one is without printer's name but from the appearance of the type and the paper it must have been published about the middle of the last century it is certainly not one of the original impressions for the other copy though of recent date has evidently been taken from some still older and better edition in the modern broadside the ballad is in four parts whereas in our older one there is no such express division but a word at the commencement of each part is printed in capital letters part one a seaman of dover whose excellent parts for wisdom and learning had conquered the hearts of many young damsels of beauty so bright of him this new ditty in brief i shall write and show of his turnings and windings of fate his passions and sorrows so many and great and how he was blessed with true love at last when all the rough storms of his troubles were past now to be brief i shall tell you the truth a beautiful lady whose name it was ruth a squire's young daughter near sandwich in kent proves all his heart's treasure his joy and content unknown to their parents in private they meet where many love lessons they'd often repeat with kisses and many embraces likewise she granted him love and thus gain the prize she said i consent to be thy sweet bride whatever becomes of my fortune she cried the frowns of my father i never will fear but freely will go through the world with my dear a jewel he gave her in token of love and vowed by the sacred powers above to wed the next morning but they were betrayed and all by the means of a treacherous maid she told her parents that they were agreed with that they fell into a passion with speed and said er a seaman their daughter should have they rather would follow her corpse to the grave the lady was straight to her chamber confined here long she continued in sorrow of mind and so did her love for the loss of his dear no sorrow was ever so sharp and severe when long he had mourned for his love and delight close under the window he came in the night 
and sung forth this ditty my dearest farewell behold in this nation no longer i dwell i am going from hence to the kingdom of spain because i am willing that you should obtain your freedom once more for my heart it will break if longer thou liest confined for my sake the words which he uttered they caused her to weep yet nevertheless she was forced to keep deep silence that minute that minute for fear her honored father and mother should hear part two soon after bold henry he entered on board the heavens a prosperous gale did afford and brought him with speed to the kingdom of spain there he was a merchant some time did remain who finding that he was both faithful and just preferred him to places of honor and trust he made him as great as his heart could request yet wanting his ruth he with grief was oppressed so great was his grief it could not be concealed both honor and riches no pleasure could yield in private he often would weep and lament for ruth the fair beautiful lady of kent now while he lamented the loss of his dear a lady of spain did before him appear bedecked with rich jewels both costly and gay who earnestly sought for his favor that day she said gentle swain i am wounded with love and you are the person i honor above the greatest of nobles that ever was born then pity my tears and my sorrowful mourn i pity thy sorrowful tears he replied and wish i were worthy to make thee my bride but lady thy grandeur is greater than mine therefore i am fearful my heart to resign oh never be doubtful of what will ensue no matter of danger will happen to you at my own disposal i am i declare receive me with love or destroy me with care dear madame don't fix your affection on me you are fit for some lord of a noble degree that is able to keep up your honor and fame i am but a poor sailor from england who came a man of mean fortune whose substance is small i have not wherewith to maintain you withal sweet lady according to honor and state now this is the truth which i freely relate the lady she lovingly squeezed his hand and said with a smile ever blessed be the land that bred such a noble brave seaman as thee i value no honors thou art welcome to me my parents are dead i have jewels untold besides in possession a million of gold and thou shalt be lord of whatever i have grant me but thy love which i earnestly crave then turning aside to himself he replied i am courted with riches and beauty beside this love i may have but my ruth is denied wherefore he consented to make her his bride the lady she clothed him costly and great his noble department both proper and straight so charmed the innocent eye of his dove and added a second new flame to her love then married they were without longer delay now here we will leave them both glorious and gay to speak of fair ruth who in sorrow was left at home with her parents of comfort bereft part three 
when under the window with an aching heart he told his fair ruth he soon must depart he told his fair ruth he so soon must depart her parents they heard and well pleased they were but ruth was afflic afflicted with sorrow and care but ruth was afflicted with sorrow and care now after her lover had quitted the shore they kept her confined a full twelve month or more and then they were pleased to set her at large with laying upon her a wonderful charge to fly from a seaman as she would from death she promised she would with a faltering breath Net nevertheless the truth you shall hear she found out a way for to follow her dear then taking her gold and her silver also in seaman's apparel away she did go and found out a master with whom she agreed to carry her over the ocean with speed now when she arrived at the kingdom of spain from city to city she travelled amain inquiring about everywhere for her love who now had been gone seven years and above in cadiz as she walked along in the street her love and his lady she happened to meet but in such a garb as she never had seen she looked like an angel or beautiful queen with sorrowful tears she turned her aside my jewel is gone i shall ne'er be his bride but nevertheless though my hopes are in vain i'll never return to old england again but here in this place i will now be confined it will be a comfort and joy to my mind to see him sometimes though he thinks not of me since he has a lady of noble degree now while in the city fair ruth did reside of a sudden this beautiful lady she died and though he was in the possession of all yet tears from his eyes in abundance did fall as he was expressing his piteous moan fair ruth came unto him and made herself known he started to see her but seemed not coy said he now my sorrows are mingled with joy the time of the morning he kept it in spain and then he came back to old england again with thousands and thousands which he did possess then glorious and gay was sweet ruth in her dress part four when over the seas to fair sandwich he came with ruth and a number of persons of fame then all did appear most splendid and gay as if it had been a great festival day now when that they took up their lodgings behold he stripped off his coat of embroidered gold and presently borrows a mariner's suit that he with her parents might have some dispute before they were sensible he was so great and when he came in and knocked at the gate he soon saw her father and mother likewise expressing their sorrow with tears in their eyes to them with obeisance he modestly said pray where is my jewel that innocent maid whose sweet lovely beauty doth thousands excel i fear by your weeping that all is not well no no she is gone she is utterly lost we have not heard of her twelve months at most which makes us distracted with sorrow and care and drowns us in tears at the point of despair 
I'm grieved to hear these sad tidings, he cried. Alas, honest young man, her father replied, I heartily wish she'd been wedded to you, for then we this sorrow had never gone through. Sweet Henry, he made them this answer again. I'm newly come home from the kingdom of Spain, from whence I have brought me a beautiful bride, and am to be married to-morrow, he cried. And if you will go to my wedding, said he, both you and your lady right welcome shall be. They promised they would, and accordingly came, not thinking to meet with such persons of fame all decked with their jewels of rubies and pearls as equal companions of lords and of earls fair ruth with her love was as gay as the rest so they in their marriage were happily blessed now as they returned from the church to an inn the father and mother of Ruth did begin, their daughter to know, by a mole they behold, although she was clothed in a garment of gold. With transports of joy they flew to the bride, Oh, where hast thou been, sweetest daughter, they cried. Thy tedious absence has grieved us sore, as fearing, alas, we should see thee no more. Dear parents, said she, many hazards I run, to fetch home my love and your dutiful son. Receive him with joy, for tis very well known. He seeks not your wealth, he's enough of his own. Her father replied, and he merrily smiled. He's brought home enough, and he's brought home my child a thousand times welcome you are i declare whose presence disperses both sorrow and care full seven long days in feasting they spent the bells in the steeple they merrily went and many fair pounds were bestowed on the poor the like of this wedding was never before end of the beautiful lady of kent or the seamen of dover section number 27 of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Berkshire Ladies' Garland In Four Parts To the Tune of the Royal Forester When we first met with this very pleasing English ballad, we deemed the story to be wholly fictitious, but strange as the relation may appear, the incidents narrated are true or at least founded on fact. The scene of the ballad is Whitley Park, near Reading, in Berkshire, and not, as some suppose, Calcott House, which was not built till 1759. Whitley is mentioned as the Abbot's Park, being at the entrance of Reading Town, at the dissolution the estate passed to the crown and the mansion seems from time to time to have been used as a royal palace till the reign of elizabeth by whom it was granted along with the estate to sir francis knollys it was afterwards by purchase the property of the kendricks an ancient race descended from the saxton kings William Kendrick of Whitley Armory was created a baronet in 1679 and died in 1685, leaving issue one son, Sir William Kendrick of Whitley Barrister, who married Miss Mary House of Reading 
and died in 1699 without issue male leaving an only daughter it was this rich heiress who possessed store of wealth and beauty bright that is the heroine of the ballad she married benjamin child esq a young and handsome but very poor attorney of reading and the marriage is traditionally reported to have been brought about exactly as related in the ballad we have not been able to ascertain the exact date of the marriage which was celebrated in st mary's church reading the bride wearing a thick veil but the ceremony must have taken place some time about seventeen o five in seventeen fourteen mr child was high sheriff of berkshire as he was an humble and obscure personage previously to his espousing the heiress of whitley and in fact owed all his wealth and influence to his marriage it cannot be supposed that immediately after his union he would be elevated to so important and dignified a post as the high chivalry of the very aristocratical county of berks we may therefore consider nine or ten years to have elapsed betwixt his marriage and his holding the office of high sheriff which he filled when he was about thirty-two years of age the author of the ballad is unknown supposing him to have composed it shortly after the events which he records we cannot be far wrong in fixing its date about seventeen o six the earliest broadside we have seen contains a rudely executed but by no means bad likeness of queen anne but the reigning monarch at that period part one showing cupid's conquest over a coy lady of five thousand a year bachelors of every station mark this strange and true relation which in brief to you i bring never was a stranger thing you shall find it worth the hearing loyal love is most endearing when it takes the deepest root yielding charms and gold to boot some will wed for love of treasure but the sweetest joy and pleasure is in faithful love you'll find grace with a noble mind such a noble disposition had this lady with submission of whom i this sonnet write store of wealth and beauty bright she had left by a good granum full five thousand pounds per annum which she held without control thus she did in riches roll though she had vast store of riches which some persons much bewitches yet she bore a virtuous mind not the least to pride inclined many noble persons courted this young lady tis reported but their labor proved in vain they could not her favor gain though she made a strong resistance yet by cupid's true assistance she was conquered after all how it was declare i shall being at a noble wedding near the famous town of reading a young gentleman she saw who belonged to the law as she viewed his sweet behavior every courteous carriage gave her new addition to her grief forced she was to seek relief privately she then inquired about him so much admired both his name and where he dwelt such was the hot flame she felt then at night this youthful lady called her coach which being ready homeward straight 
she did return but her heart with flames did burn part two showing the lady's letter of a challenge to fight him upon his refusing to wed her in a mask without knowing who she was night and morning for a season in her closet would she reason with herself and often said why has love my heart betrayed i that have so many slighted am at length so well requited for my griefs are not a few now i find what love can do he that has my heart in keeping though i for his sake be weeping little knows what grief i feel but i'll try it out with steel for i will a challenge send him and a point where i'll attend him in a grove without delay by the dawning of the day he shall not the least discover that i am a virgin lover by the challenge which i send but for justice i contend he has caused sad distraction and i come for satisfaction which if he denies to give one of us shall cease to live having thus her mind revealed she her letter closed and sealed which when it came to his hand the young man was at a stand in her letter she conjured him for to meet and well assured him recompense he must afford or dispute it with the sword having read this strange relation he was in a consternation but advising with his friend he persuades him to attend be of courage and make ready faint heart never won fair lady in regard it must be so i along with you must go part three showing how they met by appointment in a grove where she obliged him to fight or wed her early on a summer's morning when bright phobius was adorning every bower with his beams the fair lady came it seems at the bottom of a mountain near a pleasant crystal fountain there she left her gilded coach while the grove she did approach covered with her mask and walking there she met her lover talking with a friend that he had brought so she asked him who he sought i am challenged by a gallant who resolves to try my talent who he is i cannot say but i hope to show him play it is i that did invite you you shall wed me or i'll fight you underneath those spreading trees therefore choose you which you please you shall find i do not vapor i have brought my trusty rapier therefore take your choice said she either fight or marry me said he madam pray what mean you in my life i've never seen you pray unmask your visage show then i'll tell you a or no i will not my face uncover till the marriage ties are over therefore choose you which you will wed me sir or try your skill step within that pleasant bower with your friend one single hour strive your thoughts to reconcile and i'll wander here the while while this beauteous lady waited 
the young bachelors debated what was best for to be done quoth his friend the hazard run if my judgment can be trusted wed her first you can't be worsted if she's rich you'll rise to fame if she's poor why you're the same he consented to be married all three in a coach were carried to a church without delay where he wed the lady gay though sweet pretty cupids hovered round her eyes her face was covered with a mask he took her thus just for better or for worse with a courteous kind behavior she presents his friend a favor and with all dismissed him straight that he might no longer wait part four showing how they rode together in her gilded coach to her noble seat or castle etc as the gilded coach stood ready the young lawyer and his lady rode together till they came to her house of state and fame which appeared like a castle where you might behold a parcel of young cedars tall and straight just before her palace gate hand in hand they walked together to a hall or parlor rather which was beautiful and fair all alone she left him there two long hours there he waited her return at length he fretted and began to grieve at last for he had not broke his fast still he sat like one amazed round a spacious room he gazed which was richly beautified but alas he lost his bride there was peeping laughing sneering all within the lawyer's hearing but his bride he could not see would i were at home thought he while his heart was melancholy said the steward brisk and jolly tell me friend how came you here you some bad design i fear he replied dear loving master you shall meet with no disaster through my means in any case madam brought me to this place then the steward did retire saying that he would inquire whether it was true or no ne'er was lover hampered so now the lady who had filled him with those fears full well beheld him from a window as she dressed pleased at the merry jest when she had herself attired in rich robes to be admired she appeared in his sight like a moving angel bright sir my servants have related how some hours you have waited in my parlor tell me who in my house you ever knew madam if i have offended it is more than i intended a young lady brought me here that is true said she my dear i can be no longer cruel to my joy and only jewel thou art mine and i am thine hand and heart i do resign once i was a wounded lover now these fears are fairly over by receiving what i gave thou art lord of what i have beauty honor love and treasure a rich golden stream of pleasure with his lady he enjoys thanks to cupid's kind decoys now he's clothed in rich attire not inferior to a squire 
beauty honor riches store what can a man desire more end of the berkshire ladies garland section 28 of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the nobleman's generous kindness giving an account of a nobleman who taking notice of a poor man's industrious care and pains for the maintaining of his charge of seven small children met him upon a day and discoursing with him invited him and his wife and his children home to his house and bestowed upon them a farm of thirty acres of land to be continued to him and his heirs for ever to the tune of the two english travellers this still popular ballad is entitled in the modern copies the nobleman and thrasher or the generous gift there is a copy preserved in the roxborough collection with which our version has been collated it is taken from a broadside printed by robert marchbank in the custom house entry newcastle a nobleman lived in a village of late hard by a poor thrasher whose charge it was great for he had seven children and most of them small and naught but his labor to support them with all he never was given to idle and lurk for this nobleman saw him go daily to work with his flail and his bag and his bottle of beer as cheerful as those that have hundreds a year thus careful and constant each morning he went unto his daily labor with joy and content so jocular and jolly he'd whistle and sing as blithe and as brisk as the birds in the spring one morning this nobleman taking a walk he met this poor man and he freely did talk he asked him at first many questions at large and then began talking concerning his charge thou hast many children i very well know thy labor is hard and thy wages are low and yet thou art cheerful i pray tell me true how can you maintain them as well as you do i carefully carry home what i do earn my daily expenses by this i do learn and find it is possible though we be poor to still keep the ravenous wolf from the door i reap and i mow and i harrow and sow sometimes a hedging and ditching i go no work comes amiss for i thrash and i plough thus my bread i do earn by the sweat of my brow my wife she is willing to pull in a yoke we live like two lambs nor each other provoke we both of us strive like the laboring ant and do our endeavors to keep us from want and when i come home from my labor at night to my wife and my children in whom i delight to see them come round me with prattling noise now these are the riches a poor man enjoys though i am as weary as weary may be the youngest i commonly dance on my knee i find that content is a moderate feast i never repine at my lot in the least now the nobleman hearing what he did say was pleased and invited him home the next day his wife and his children he charged him to bring in token of favor he gave him a ring 
he thanked his honor and taking his leave he went to his wife who would hardly believe but this same story himself he might raise yet seeing the ring she was lost in amaze betimes in the morning the good wife she arose and made them all fine in the best of their clothes the good man with his good wife and children small they all went to dine at the nobleman's hall but when they came there as truth does report all things were prepared in a plentiful sort and they at the nobleman's table did dine with all kinds of dainties and plenty of wine the feast being over he soon let them know that he then intended on them to bestow a farmhouse with thirty good acres of land and gave them the writings then with his own hand because thou art careful and good to thy wife i'll make thy days happy the rest of thy life it shall be for ever for thee and thy heirs because i beheld thy industrious cares no tongue then is able in full to express the depth of their joy and true thankfulness with many a curtsy and bow to the ground such noblemen there are but few to be found end of the nobleman's generous kindness section twenty nine of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by josh kibbe the drunkard's legacy in three parts first giving an account of a gentleman a having a wild son and who foreseeing he would come to poverty had a cottage built with one door to it always kept fast and how on his dying bed he charged him not to open it till he was poor and slighted which the young man promised he would perform secondly of the young man's pawning his estate to a vintner who when poor kicked him out of doors when thinking it time to see his legacy he broke open the cottage door where instead of money he found a gibbet and halter which he put round his neck and jumping off the stool the gibbet broke and a thousand pounds came down upon his head which lay hid in the ceiling thirdly of his redeeming his estate and fooling the vintner out of two hundred pounds who for being jeered by his neighbors cut his own throat and lastly of the young man's reformation very proper to be read by all who are given to drunkenness percy in the introductory remarks to the ballad of the heir of lynn says the original of this ballad the heir of lynn is found in the editor's folio manuscript the breaches and defects of which rendered the insertion of supplemental stanzas necessary these it is hoped the reader will pardon as indeed the completion of the story was suggested by a modern ballad on a similar subject the ballad thus alluded to by percy is the drunkard's legacy which it may be remarked although styled by him a modern ballad is only so comparatively speaking for it must have been written long anterior to percy's time and by his own admission must be older than the latter portion of the heir of lynn our copy is taken from an old chapbook without date or printer's name and which is decorated with three rudely executed woodcuts young people all i pray draw near and listen to my ditty here which subject shows that drunkenness brings many mortals to distress as for example now i can tell you of one a gentleman who had a very good estate his earthly travails they were great we understand he had one son who a lewd wicked race did run he daily spent his father's store when moneyless he came for more the father oftentimes with tears would this alarm sound in his ears son thou dost all my comfort blast and thou wilt come to want at last the son did these words little mind to cards and dice he was inclined feeding his drunken appetite in taverns which was his delight the father ere it was too late he had a project in his pate before his aged days were run to make provision for his son near to his house we understand he had a waste plat of land which did but little profit yield on which he did a cottage build the wise man's project was its name there were few windows in the same only one door substantial thing shut by a lock went by a spring soon after he had played this trick it was his lot for to fall sick as on his bed he did lament then for his drunken son he sent 
He shortly came to his bedside, Seeing his son, he thus replied, I have sent for you to make my will, Which you must faithfully fulfill. In such a cottage is one door, Ne'er open it, do thou be sure, Until thou art so poor, That all do then despise you, great and small. For to my grief I do perceive, When I am dead, this life you live, Will soon melt all thou hast away. Do not forget these words, I pray. When thou hast made thy friends thy foes, Pawned all thy lands and sold thy clothes, Break ope the door, and there depend To find something thy griefs to end. This being spoke, the son did say, Your dying words I will obey. Soon after this his father dear did die, And buried was, we hear. Part 2 Now pray observe the second part, And you shall hear his sottish heart. He did the tavern so frequent, Till he three hundred pounds had spent, this being done, we understand, he pawned the deeds of all his land unto a tavern-keeper who, when poor, did him no favor show. For to fulfill his father's will he did command this cottage still. At length great sorrow was his share, quite moneyless with garments bare. Being not able for to work, he in the tavern there did lurk, from box to box among rich men, who oftentimes reviled him then. To see him sneak so up and down, the vintner on him he did frown, and one night kicked him out of door, charging him to come there no more. He in a stall did lie all night, in this most sad and wretched plight, then thought it was high time to see his father's promised legacy. Next morning, then, oppressed with woe, this young man got an iron crow, and, as in tears he did lament, unto this little cottage went. When he the door had opened got, this poor distressed drunken sot, who did for store of money hope, he saw a gibbet and a rope. Under this rope was placed a stool, which made him look just like a fool, crying, Alas, what shall I do? Destruction now appears in view. As my father foresaw this thing, what sottishness to me would bring. As moneyless and free of grace, his legacy I will embrace. So then, oppressed with discontent, upon the stool he sighing went, and then, his precious life to check, did place the rope about his neck, crying, Thou God, who sitst on high, and on my sorrow casts an eye, thou knowest that I have not done well, preserve my precious soul from hell. "'Tis true the slighting of thy grace has brought me to this wretched case, "'and as through folly I'm undone, I will now eclipse my morning sun. "'When he with sighs these words had spoke, "'jumped off and down the gibbet broke, "'and falling as it plain appears, dropped down about this young man's ears. "'In shining gold a thousand pound, which made the blood his ears surround. "'Though in amaze he cried, I'm sure this golden salve the sore will cure. "'Blessed be my father, then,' he cried, who did this part for me so hide, and while I do alive remain, I never will get drunk again. Part 3 Now by the third part you will hear this young man as it doth appear. With care he then secured his chink, and to the vintners went to drink. When the proud vintner did him see, he frowned on him immediately, and said, Be gone, or else with speed I'll kick thee out of doors indeed. Smiling, the young man he did say, Thou cruel knave, tell me, I pray, as I have here consumed my store, how dost thee kick me out of door? To me thou hast been too severe. The deeds of eight score pounds a year, I pawned them for three hundred pounds that I spent here. What makes such frowns? The vintner said unto him, Sirrah, bring me one hundred pounds to-morrow. By nine o'clock take them again, so get you out of doors till then. He answered, If this chink I bring, I fear thou wilt do no such thing. He said, I'll give under my hand a note that I to this will stand. Having the note, away he goes, and straightway went to one of those that made him drink when moneyless, and did the truth to him confess. They both went to this heap of gold, and in a bag he fairly told a thousand pounds, ill yellow boys, and to the tavern went their ways. This bag they on the table set, making the vintner for to fret. He said, Young man, this will not do, for I was but in jest with you. So then bespoke the young man's friend, Vintner, thou mayest sure depend, in law this nota will you cast, and he must have his land at last. This made the vintner to comply. He fetched the deeds immediately. He had one hundred pounds, and then the young man got his deeds again. At length the vintner gan to think how he was fooled out of his chink, said, when tis found how I came off, my neighbors will me game and scoff. So, to prevent their noise and clatter, the vintner, he, to mend the matter, in two days after it doth appear, did cut his throat from ear to ear. Thus he untimely left the world that to this young man proved a churl. Now he who followed drunkenness lives sober and doth lands possess, instead of wasting of his store as formerly, resolves no more to act the same, but does indeed relieve all those that are in need. Let all young men now, for my sake, 
Take care how they such havoc make, For drunkenness you plain may see, Had like as ruin for to be. End of The Drunkard's Legacy Section 30 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bow's Tragedy Being a true relation of the lives and characters of Roger Wrightson and Martha Railton of the town of Bowes in the county of York, who died for love of each other in March 1714 or 1715. Tune of Queen Dido. The Bowes tragedy is the original of Mallet's Edition and Emma. In these verses are preserved the village record of the incident which suggested that poem. When Mallet published his ballad, he subjoined an attestation of the facts which may be found in Evans's Old Ballads, Volume 2, page 237, edition 1784. Mallet alludes to the statement in the parish registry of Bowes that, quote, they both died of love and were buried in the same grave, end quote, etc. The following is an exact copy of the entry as transcribed by Mr. Denham, 17th of April, 1847. The words which we have printed in brackets are found interlined in another and a later hand by some person who had inspected the register. Quote, Roger Wrightson, Jr., and Martha Railton, both of Bowes, buried in one grave. He died in a fever, and upon tolling his passing bell, she cried out, My heart is broke, and in a few hours expired, purely, or supposed, through love, March 15th, 1714 or 1715, aged about 20 years each, end quote. Mr. Denham says, quote, The Bowes tragedy was, I understand, written immediately after the death of the lovers by the then master of Bowes Grammar School. His name I never heard. My father, who died a few years ago, aged nearly 80, knew a younger sister of Martha Railton's who used to sing it to strangers passing through Bowes. She was a poor woman, advanced in years, and had brought her in many a piece of money, end quote. Let Carthage Queen be now no more the subject of our mournful song, nor such old tales which heretofore did so amuse the teeming throng, since the sad story which I'll tell, all other tragedies excel. Remote in Yorkshire, near to Bowes of late, did Roger Wrightson dwell. He courted Martha Railton, whose repute for virtue did excel. Yet, Roger's friends would not agree that he to her should married be. Their love continued one whole year full sore against their parents' will. And when he found them so severe, his loyal heart began to chill. And last Shrove Tuesday took his bed with grief and woe encompassed. Thus, he continued twelve days' space in anguish and in grief of mind and no sweet peace in any case this ardent lover's heart could find, but languished in a train of grief which pierced his heart beyond relief. Now, anxious Martha, sore distressed, a private message did him send, lamenting that she could not rest till she had seen her loving friend. His answer was, Nay, nay, my dear, our folks will be angry, I fear. Full fraught with grief, she took no rest, but spent her time in pain and fear till a few days before his death, she sent an orange to her dear. But cruel mother, in disdain, did send the orange back again. 
three days before her lover died, poor Martha, with a bleeding heart to see her dying lover hide, in hopes to ease him of his smart, where she's conducted to the bed in which this faithful young man laid, where she, with doleful cries, beheld her fainting lover in despair, at which her heart with sorrow filled. Small was the comfort she had there, Though his mother showed her great respect, his sister did her much reject. She stayed two hours with her dear, in hopes for to declare her mind. But Hannah Wrightson stood so near, no time to do it could she find, so that being almost dead with grief, away she went without relief. Tears from her eyes did flow amain, and she full oft would sighing say, My constant love, alas, is slain, and to pale death become a prey. O oh, Hannah, Hannah, thou art base, thy pride will turn to foul disgrace. She spent her time in godly prayers, and quiet rest did from her fly. She to her friends full oft declares that she could not live if he did die. Thus, she continued, till the bell began to sound his fatal knell. And when she heard the dismal sound, her godly book she cast away with bitter cries would pierce the ground. Her fainting heart began to decay. She to her pensive mother said, I cannot live now he is dead. Then, after three short minutes' space, as she, in sorrow groaning lay, a gentleman did her embrace, and mildly unto her did say, Dear melting soul, be not so sad, but let your passion be allayed. Her answer was, My heart has burst, my span of life is near an end, my love from me by death is forced, my grief no soul can comprehend. Then her poor heart it waxed faint when she had ended her complaint. For three hours' space, as in a trance, this broken-hearted creature lay, her mother, wailing her mischance to pacify her, did essay, but all in vain, for strength being past, she seemingly did breathe her last. Her mother, thinking she was dead, began to shriek and cry amain, and heavy lamentations made, which called her spirit back again, to be an object of hard fate, and give to grief a longer date. Distorted with convulsions, she in dreadful manner, gasping lay of twelve long hours no moment free. Her bitter groans did her dismay. Then, her poor heart, being sadly broke, submitted to the fatal stroke. When things were to this issue brought, both in one grave were to be laid, but flinty-hearted Hannah thought by stubborn means for to persuade their friends and neighbors from the same, for which she surely was to blame. And, being asked the reason why, such base objections she did make. She answered thus scornfully in words not fit for Billingsgate. She might have taken fairer on, or else be hanged. Oh, heart of stone, what hell-born fury had possessed thy vile, inhuman spirit thus? What swelling rage was in thy breast that could occasion this disgust, and make thee show such spleen and rage? which life can't cure, nor death assuage. Sure, some of Satan's minor imps ordained were to be thy guide, to act the part of sordid pimps, and fill thy heart with haughty pride. But take this caveat once for all, such devilish pride must have a fall. But when to church the corpse was brought, and both of them met at the gate. What mournful tears by friends were shed 
when that alas, it was too late, when they in silent grave were laid instead of pleasing marriage bed. You parents, all both far and near, by this sad story, warning take, nor to your children be severe when they their choice in love do make. Let not the love of cursed gold true lovers from their love withhold. End of the Bow's Tragedy Section 31 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Crafty Lover or The Lawyer Outwitted. Tune of I Love Thee More and More. This excellent old ballad is transcribed from a copy printed in the Aldermary Churchyard. It still continues to be published in the old broadside form. Of a rich counsellor I write, who had one only daughter, who was of youthful beauty bright, now mark what follows after. Her uncle left her, I declare, a sumptuous large possession. Her father he was to take care of her at his discretion. She had ten thousand pounds a year, and gold and silver ready, and courted was by many a peer, yet none could gain this lady. At length the squire's youngest son in private came a-wooing, and when he had her favor won, he feared his utter ruin. The youthful lady straightway cried, I must confess I love thee, though lords and knights I have denied, yet none I prize above thee. Thou art a jewel in my eye, but here, said she, the care is, I fear you will be doomed to die for stealing of an heiress. The young man, he replied to her like a true politician, Thy father is a counsellor, I'll tell him my condition. Ten guineas they shall be his fee, he'll think it is some stranger. Thus for the gold he'll counsel me, and keep me safe from danger. Unto her father he did go, the very next day after, but did not let the lawyer know the lady was his daughter. Now when the lawyer saw the gold that he should be the gainer, a pleasant trick to him he told, with safety to obtain her. Let her provide a horse, he cried, and take you up behind her, then with you to some parson ride before her parents find her. That she steals you, you may complain, and so avoid their fury. Now this is law, I will maintain, before or judge or jury. Now take my writing and my seal, which I cannot deny thee, and if you any trouble feel, in court I will stand by thee. I give you thanks, the young man cried, by you I am befriended, and to your house I'll bring my bride after the work is ended. Next morning, ere the day did break, this news to her he carried. She did her father's counsel take, and they were fairly married. And now they felt but ill at case, and doubts and fears expressing. They home returned, and on their knees they asked their father's blessing. But when he had beheld them both, he seemed like one distracted, and vowed to be revenged on oath for what they now had acted. With that bespoke his new-made son, there can be no deceiving, that this is law which we have done, here is your hand and sealing. The counsellor did then reply, was ever man so fitted? My hand and seal I can't deny, by you I am outwitted. Ten thousand pounds a year in store she was left by my brother, and when I die there will be more, for child I have no other. She might have had a lord or knight from royal loins descended, but since thou art her heart's delight, I will not be offended. If I the Gordian knot should part, were cruel out of measure. Enjoy thy love with all my heart, in plenty, peace, and pleasure. End of The Crafty Lover Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Louise Section 32 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Death 
of Queen Jane. Traditional. We have seen an old printed copy of this ballad, which was written probably about the date of the event it records, 1537. Our version was taken down from the singing of a young gypsy girl to whom it had descended orally through two generations she could not recollect the whole of it in miss strickland's lives of the queens of england we find the following passage an english ballad is extant which dwelling on the elaborate mourning of queen jane's ladies informs the world in a line of pure bathos in black were her ladies and black were their faces miss strickland does not appear to have seen the ballad to which she refers and as we are not aware of the existence of any other ballad on the subject we presume that her line of pure bathos is merely a corruption of one of the ensuing verses queen jane was in travail for six weeks or more till the woman grew tired and fain would give o'er o woman o woman good wives if ye be go send for king henry and bring him to me king henry was sent for he came with all speed in a gown of green velvet from heel to the head king henry king henry if kind henry you be send for a surgeon and bring him to me the surgeon was sent for he came with all speed in a gown of black velvet from heel to the head he gave her rich coddle but the death sleep slept she then her right side was opened and the babe was set free the babe it was christened and put out and nursed while the royal queen jane she lay cold in the dust so black was the morning and white were the wands yellow yellow the torches they bore in their hands the bells they were muffled and mournful did play while the royal queen jane she lay cold in the clay six knights and six lords bore her corpse through the grounds six dukes followed after in black mourning gowns the flower of old england was laid in cold clay while the royal king henry came weeping away end of the death of queen jane section thirty three of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Wandering Young Gentlewoman, or Catskin. The following version of this ancient English ballad has been collated with three copies. In some editions it is called Catskin's Garland, or the wandering young gentlewoman the story has a close similarity to that of cinderella and is supposed to be of oriental origin several versions of it are current in scandinavia germany italy poland and wales for some account of it see pictorial book of ballads two page one hundred and fifty three edited by mr j s moore part one you fathers and mothers and children also draw near unto me and soon you shall know the sense of my ditty and i dare to say 
the likes not been heard of this many a day the subject which to you i am to relate it is of a young squire of vast estate the first dear infant his wife did him bear it was a young daughter of beauty most rare he said to his wife had this child been a boy twould have pleased me better and increased my joy if the next be the same sort i declare of what i'm possessed it shall have no share in twelve months time after this woman we hear had another daughter of beauty most clear and when that he knew it was but a female into a bitter passion he presently fell saying since this is of the same sort as the first in my habitation she shall not be nursed pray let her be sent into the country for where i am truly this child shall not be with tears his dear wife unto him did say husband be contented i'll send her away then to the country with speed her did send for to be brought up by one was her friend although that her father he hated her so he a good education on her did bestow and with a gold locket and robes of the best this slighted young damsel was commonly dressed and when unto stature this damsel was grown and found from her father she had no love shown she cried before i will lay under his frown i am resolved to travel the country around part two but now mark good people the cream of the jest in what sort of manner this creature was dressed with cat skins she made her a robe i declare the which for her covering she daily did wear her own witch attire and jewels beside then up in a bundle by her they were tied and to seek her fortune she wandered away and when she had travelled a cold winter's day in the evening tide she came to a town where at a night's door she sat herself down for to rest herself who was tired sore this noble knight's lady then came to the door this fair creature seeing in such sort of dress the lady unto her these words did express whence camest thou girl and what wouldest thou have she said a night's rest in your stable i crave the lady said to her i'll grant thy desire come into the kitchen and stand by the fire then she thanked the lady and went in with haste and there she was gazed on from highest to least and being well warmed her hunger was great they gave her a plate of good food for to eat and then to an outhouse this creature was led where with fresh straw she soon made her a bed and when in the morning the daylight she saw her riches and jewels she hid in the straw and being very cold she then did retire into the kitchen and stood by the fire the cook said my lady hath promised that thee shall be as a scullion to wait upon me what sayest thou girl art thou willing to bid with all my heart's truly to him she replied to work at her needle she could very well and for raising of paste few could her excel 
she being so handy the cook's heart did win and then she was called by the name of cat skin part three the lady a son had both calmly and tall who oftentimes used to be at a ball a mile out of town and one evening tied to dance at this ball away he did ride catskin said to his mother pray madam let me go after your son now this ball for to see with that in a passion this lady she grew and struck her with the ladle and broke it in two on being thus served she quick got away and in her rich garments herself did array and then to this ball she with speed did retire where she danced so bravely that all did admire the sport being done the young squire did say young lady where do you live tell me i pray her answer was to him sir that i will tell at the sign of the broken ladle i dwell she being very nimble got home first tis said and in her catskin robes she soon was arrayed and into the kitchen again she did go but where she had been they did none of them know next night this young squire to give him content to dance at this ball again forth he went she said pray let me go this ball for to view then she struck with the skimmer and broke it in two then out of the doors she ran full of heaviness and in her rich garments herself soon did dress and to this ball ran away with all speed where to see her dancing all wondered indeed the ball being ended the young squire said where is it you live she again answered sir because you ask me account i will give at the sign of the broken skimmer i live being dark when she left him she homeward did hie and in her catskin robes she was dressed presently and into the kitchen amongst them she went but where she had been they were all innocent when the squire dame home and found catskin there he was in amaze and began for to swear for two nights at the ball has been a lady the sweetest of beauties that ever i did see she was the best dancer in all the whole place and very much like our catskin in the face had she not been dressed in that costly degree i should have sworn it was catskin's body next night to the ball he did go once more and she asked his mother to go as before who having a basin of water in hand she threw it at catskin as i understand shaking her wet ears out of doors she did run and dressed herself when this thing she had done to the ball once more she then went her ways to see her fine dancing they all gave her praise and having concluded the young squire said he from whence might you come pray lady tell me her answer was sir you shall soon know the same from the sign of the basin of water i came then homeward she hurried as fast as could be 
this young squire then was resolved to see where to she belonged and followed catskin into an old straw house he saw her creep in he said o oh, brave catskin i find it is thee who these three nights together has so charmed me thou'rt the sweetest of creatures my eyes e'er beheld with joy and content my heart is now filled thou art our cook's scullion but as i have life grant me but thy love and i'll make thee my wife and thou shalt have maids for to be at thy call sir that cannot be i've no portion at all thy beauty's a portion my joy and my dear i prize it far better than thousands a year and to have my friends consent i have got a trick i'll go to my bed and feign myself sick there no one shall tend me but thee i profess so one day or another in thy richest dress thou shalt be clad and if my parents come nigh i'll tell them tis for thee that sick i do lie part four thus having consulted this couple parted next day this young squire he took to his bed and when his dear parents this thing both perceived for fear of his death they were right sorely grieved to tend him they sent for a nurse speedily he said none but catskin my nurse now shall be his parents said no son he said but she shall or else i'll have none for to nurse me at all his parents both wondered to hear him say thus that no one but catskin must be his nurse so then his dear parents their son to content up into his chamber poor catskin they sent sweet cordials and other rich things were prepared which between this young couple were equally shared and when all alone they in each other's arms enjoyed one another in love's pleasant charms and at length on a time poor catskin tis said in her rich attire again was arrayed and when that her mother to the chamber drew near then much like a goddess did catskin appear which caused her to stare and thus for to say what young lady is this come tell me i pray he said it is catskin for whom sick i lie and except i do have her with speed i shall die his mother then hastened to call up the knight who ran up to see this amazing great sight he said is this catskin we held in such scorn i ne'er saw a finer dame since i was born the old knight he said to her i prithee tell me from whence thou didst come and of what family then who were her parents she gave them to know and what was the cause of her wandering so the young squire he cried if you will save my life pray grant this young creature she may be my wife his father replied thy life for to save if you have agreed my consent you may have next day with great triumph and joy as we hear there were many coaches came far and near then much like a goddess dressed in rich array 
Catskin was married to the squire that day. For several days this wedding did last, where was many a topping and gallant repast, and for joy the bells rung out all over the town, and bottles of canary rolled merrily round. When Catskin was married, her fame for to raise, who saw her modest carriage they all gave her praise thus her charming beauty the squire did win and who lives so great now as he and cat skin part five now in the fifth part i'll endeavor to show how things with her parents and sister did go her mother and sister of life are bereft and now all alone the old squire is left who hearing his daughter was married so brave he said in my noodle a fancy i have dressed like a poor man now a journey i'll make and see if she on me some pity will take then dressed like a beggar he went to her gate where stood his daughter who looked very great he cried noble lady a poor man i be and am now forced to crave charity with a blush she asked him from whence that he came and with that he told her and likewise his name she cried i'm your daughter whom you slighted so yet nevertheless to your kindness i'll show through mercy the lord hath provided for me pray father come in and sit down then said she then the best provisions the house could afford for to make him welcome was set on the board she said you are welcome feed hearty i pray and if you are willing with me you shall stay so long as you live then he made this reply i only am come now thy love for to try through mercy my dear child i'm rich and not poor i have gold and silver enough now in store and for this love which at thy hands i have found for thy portion i give thee ten thousand pound so in a few days after as i understand this man he went home and sold off all his land and ten thousand pounds to his daughter did give and now altogether in love they do live end of the wandering young gentlewoman or catskin section thirty four of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the brave earl brand and the king of england's daughter traditional this ballad which resembles the danish ballad of Rebolt, was taken down from the recitation of an old fiddler in northumberland in one verse there is a hiatus owing to the failure of the reciter's memory the refrain should be repeated in every verse oh did you ever hear of the brave earl brand he lily ho lily lay his courted the king's daughter o oh, fair england i the brave knights so early she was scarcely fifteen years that tide when say boldly she came to his bedside o oh, earl brand how fain would i see a pack of hounds let loose on the lee o oh, fair lady 
I have no steed but one, But thou shalt ride, and I will run. O Earl Brand, but my father has two, And thou shalt have the best of thou. Now they have ridden o'er moss and moor, And they have met neither rich nor poor, Till at last they met with old Carl Hood, He's a for ill and never for good. Now, Earl Brand, an ye love me, slay this old Carl and gar him thee. O lady fair, but that would be sair to slay an old Carl that wears gray hair. My own fair lady, I'll do not that. I'll pay him his fee. Oh, where have ye ridden this lee lang day, and where have ye stone this fair lady away? I have not ridden this lee lang day, nor yet have I stone this lady away, for she is, I trow, my sick sister, whom I have been bringing for Winchester. If she's been sick and nigh to dead, what makes her wear the ribbon so red? If she's been sick and like to die, What makes her wear the gold say hi? When came the carl to the ladies yet, He rudely, rudely rapped thereat. Now where is the lady of this hall? She's out with her maids a-playing at the ball. Ha, 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 ye are all mistaken. Ye may count your maidens o'er again. I met her far beyond the lee, With the young Earl Brand, his leman to be. Her father of his best men armed fifteen, And there ridden after them bedeen. The lady looked o'er her left shoulder then, says o earl brand we are both of us taken if they come on me one by one you may stand by till the fights be done but if they come on me one and all you may stand by and see me fall they then came upon him one by one till fourteen battles he had won and fourteen men he has them slain, each after each upon the plain. But the fifteenth man behind stole round, and dealt him a deep and a deadly wound. Though he was wounded to the dead, he set his lady on her steed. They rode till they came to the river dune, and there they lighted to wash his wound. O Earl Brand, I see your heart's blood. It's nothing but the glint and my scarlet hood. They rode till they came to his mother's yet, so faint and feebly he rapped thereat. O my son slain, he is falling to swoon, and it's all for the sake of an english loon oh say not so my dearest mother but marry her to my youngest brother to a maiden true he'll give his hand hey lily ho lily lally to the king's daughter o oh, fair england to a prize that was won by a slain brother's brand i the brave knights so early end of poem the brave earl brand and the king of england's daughter section thirty five of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain the jovial hunter of bromsgrove or the Old Man and His Three Sons 
The following ballad has long been popular in Worcestershire and some of the adjoining counties. It was printed for the first time by Mr. Allies of Worcester under the title of The Jovial Hunter of Bromsgrove, but amongst the peasantry of that county and the adjoining county of Warwick, it has always been called The Old Man and His Three Sons, the name given to a fragment of the ballad still used as a nursery song in the north of England, the chorus of which slightly varies from that ballad. See Post, page 250. The title of the old man and his three sons is derived from the usage of calling a ballad after the first line, a practice that has descended to the present day. In Shakespeare's comedy of As You Like It, there appears to be an allusion to this ballad. Le Beau says, There comes an old man and his three sons. To which Celia replies, I could match this beginning with an old tale. Whether the jovial hunter belongs to either Worcestershire or Warwickshire, is rather questionable. The probability is that it is a North Country ballad connected with the family of Bolton, of Bolton, in Wensleydale. A tomb, said to be that of Sir Ryalus Bolton, the jovial hunter, is shown in Bromsgrove Church, Worcestershire, but there is no evidence beyond tradition to connect it with the name or deeds of any Bolton. Indeed, it is well known that the tomb belongs to a family of another name. In the following version are preserved some of the peculiarities of the Worcestershire dialect. Old Sir Robert Bolton had three sons, wind well thy horn, good hunter, and one of them was Sir Ryalus, for he was a jovial hunter. He ranged all round down by the woodside, wind well thy horn, good hunter, till in a treetop a gay lady he spied, for he was a jovial hunter. Oh, what dost thee mean, fair lady, said he, wind well thy horn, good hunter, the wild boar's killed my lord, and has thirty men gored, and thou beest a jovial hunter. O oh, what shall I do, this wild boar for to see? Wind well thy horn, good hunter. O oh, thee blow a blast, and he'll come unto thee, as thou beest a jovial hunter. Then he blowed a blast full north, east, west, and south. Wind well thy horn, good hunter. And the wild boar then heard him full in his den, as he was a jovial hunter. Then he made the best of his speed unto him. Wind well thy horn, good hunter. Swift flew the boar with his tusks smeared with gore to Sir Ryalus, the jovial hunter. Then the wild boar, being so stout and so strong, wind well thy horn, good hunter, thrashed down the trees as he ramped him along to Sir Ryalus, the jovial hunter. Oh, what dost thee want of me, wild boar, said he, wind well thy horn, good hunter. Oh, I think in my heart I can do enough for thee, for I am the jovial hunter. Then they fought four hours in a long summer day, wind well thy horn, good hunter, till the wild boar fain would have got him away from Sir Ryalus, the jovial hunter. Then Sir Ryalus drawed his broad sword with might, wind well thy horn, good hunter, and he fairly cut the boar's head off quite, for he was a jovial hunter. Then out of the wood the wild woman flew, wind well thy horn, good hunter. Oh, my pretty spotted pig thou hast slew, for thou beest a jovial hunter. There are three things I demand them of thee. Wind well thy horn, good hunter. It's thy horn and thy hound and thy gay lady, as thou beest a jovial hunter. If these three things thou dost ask of me, wind well thy horn, good hunter. It's just as my sword and thy neck can agree, for I am a jovial hunter. Then into his long locks the wild woman flew. Wind well thy horn, good hunter, till she thought in her heart to tear him through, though he was a jovial hunter. Then Sir Ryalus drawed his broad sword again. Wind well thy horn, good hunter, and he fairly split her head into twain, for he was a jovial hunter. In Bromsgrove Church the night he doth lie. Wind well thy horn, good hunter, and the wild boar's head is pictured thereby. Sir Ryalus, the jovial hunter. End of The Jovial Hunter of Bromsgrove, or The Old Man and His Three Sons. Recording by Stephen Harvey. Section 36 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lady Alice. This old ballad is regularly published by the stall printers. The termination resembles that of Lord Lovell and other ballads. See Early Ballads, 
annotated edition, page 134. An imperfect traditional copy was printed in notes and queries. Lady Alice was sitting in her bower window at midnight, mending her coif, and there she saw as fine a corpse as she ever saw in her life. What bear ye? What bear ye, ye six men tall? What bear ye on your shoulders? We bear the corpse of Giles Collins, an old and true lover of yours. Oh, lay him down gently, ye six men tall, all on the grass, so green. And tomorrow, when the sun goes down, Lady Alice, a corpse, shall be seen. And bury me in St. Mary's Church, all for my love so true. And make me a garland of marjoram and of lemon thyme and rue. Giles Collins was buried all in the east, Lady Alice all in the west, and the roses that grew on Giles Collins's grave, they reached Lady Alice's breast. The priest of the parish, he chanced to pass, and he severed those roses in twain. Sure, never were seen such true lovers before, nor e'er will there be again. End of Lady Alice Section 37 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Felon Saw of Rockaby and the Friars of Richmond. This very curious ballad, or more properly metrical romance, was originally published by the late Dr. Whitaker in his History of Craven, from an ancient manuscript which was supposed to be unique. Whittaker's version was transferred to Evans' Old Ballads, the editor of which work introduced some judicious conjectural emendations. In reference to this republication, Dr. Whittaker inserted the following note in the second edition of his history. This tale, saith my manuscript, was known of old to a few families only, and by them held so precious that it was never entrusted to the memory of the son till the father was on his deathbed. But times are altered, for since the first edition of this work, a certain bookseller, the late Mr. Evans, has printed it verbatim, with little acknowledgment to the first editor. He might have recollected that the felon Sua had been already reclaimed property vested. However, as he is an ingenious and deserving man, this hint shall suffice. History of Craven, 2nd edition, London, 1812. When Sir Walter Scott published his poem of Rockaby, Dr. Whitaker discovered that the felon Soa was not of such exceeding rarity as he had been led to suppose, for he was then made acquainted with the fact that another manuscript of the unique ballad was preserved in the archives of the Rockaby family. This version was published by Scott, who considered it superior to that printed by Whitaker, and it must undoubtedly be admitted to be more complete, and, in general, more correct. It has also the advantage of being authenticated by the traditions of an ardent family, while of Dr. Whitaker's version we know nothing more than it was printed from a manuscript in his possession. The readings of the Rockaby manuscript, however, are not always to be preferred, and in order to produce as full and accurate a version as the materials would yield, the following text has been founded upon a careful collation of both manuscripts. A few alterations have been adopted, but only when the necessity for them appeared to be self-evident, and the orthography has been rendered tolerably uniform. For there is no good reason why we should have Soa, Sho, and Syke in some places, and the more modern forms of Sow, She, and Such in others. If the manuscripts were correctly transcribed, which we have no ground for doubting, they must both be referred to a much later period than the era when the author flourished. The language of the poem is that of Craven in Yorkshire, and although the composition is acknowledged on all hands to be one of the reign of Henry VII, the provincialisms of that most interesting mountain district have been so little affected by the spread of education that the felon Soa is at the present day perfectly comprehensible to any Craven peasant, and to such a reader neither note nor glossary is necessary. 
Dr. Whitaker's explanations are, therefore, few and brief, for he was thoroughly acquainted with the language and the district. Scott, on the contrary, who knew nothing of the dialect and confounded its pure Saxon with his lowland Scotch, gives numerous notes, which only display his want of the requisite local knowledge and are, consequently, calculated to mislead. The felon saw belongs to the same class of composition as The Hunting of the Hare, reprinted by Weber, and The Tournament of Tottenham, in Percy's Relique. Scott says that the comic romance was a sort of parody upon the usual subjects of minstrel poetry. This idea may be extended, for the old comic romances were in many instances not merely sorts of parodies, but real parodies on compositions which were popular in their day, although they have not descended to us. We certainly remember to have met with an old chivalric romance in which the leading incidents were similar to those of the felon soa. It may be observed also, in reference to this poem, that the design is twofold, the ridicule being equally aimed at the minstrels and the clergy. The author was, in all probability, a follower of Wycliffe. There are many sly satirical allusions to the Romish faith and practices in which no orthodox Catholic would have ventured to indulge. Ralph Rokeby, who gave the sow to the Franciscan friars of Richmond, is believed to have been the Ralph who lived in the reign of Henry VII. Tradition represents the baron as having been a fellow of infinite jest, and the very man to bestow so valuable a gift on the convent. The mistress Rokeby of the ballad was, according to the pedigree of the family, a daughter and heiress of Danby, of Yaforth. Friar Theobald cannot be traced, and therefore we may suppose that the monk had some other name. The minstrel author, albeit a Wycliffeite, not thinking it quite prudent, perhaps, to introduce a priest in propria persona. The story is told with spirit, and the verse is graceful and flowing. Fit the first. Ye men that will of honours win, that late within this land hath been, of on I will you tell, and of a sewer that was sea strang, alas that ever show lived sea lang, for fell folk did show well. Show was mare than other three, the grisliest beast that e'er mote be, her head was great and grey. Show was bred in Rokeby wood, there were few that thither you'd but cam belive away. Her walk was endlang greta side, was no barn that called her bide, that was for heaven or hell. Na, never man that had that might, that ever durst come in her sight, for force it was sea fell. Rafe of Rokeby, with full gold will, the freers of Richmond have give her till, full well to gar them fair. Freer Middletone by name, he was sent to fetch her hame, it rayed him sign full sair. With him took he white men too, Peter of Dale was on of though, t'other was Brian of Bear. That well durst strike with sword and knife, and fight full manly for their life, what time as musters were. These three men wended at their will, this wicked sewer, Gwihil they come till, ligand under a tree. Rugged and rustic was her hair, shall raise up with a felon fair, to fight again the three. Grisly was show for to meet, shall rave the earth up with her feet, the bark come fra the tree. When freer Middletone her saw, wet yo well, he list not laugh, full earnestful looked he. These men of ancestors were so white, they bound them boldly for to fight, and strake at her full sair, until a kiln they guard her flee. Would God send them the victory, they would ask him na mere. The sewer was in the kiln hoyle doon, and they were on the bark caboon, for hurting of their feet. They were sea souted with this sewer, that mang them was a stalworth stewer. The kiln began to reek, durst no man nigh her with his hand, but put a rape down with a wand, and helted her full meat. They hauled her forth again her will, quenil they come until a hill, a little fra the street. And there show made them psyche fray, as, had they lived until Domesday, they could it ne'er forget. Show braided upon every side, and ran on them gaping full wide, for nothing wall show let. Show gaff psyche hard braids at the band that Peter of Dale had in his hand, he might not hold his feet. Show chased them see to and fro, 
the white men never were so bold, their measure was not meet. Sho bound her boldly to abide, to Peter of Dale sho come aside, with money a hideous yell. Sho gaped sea wide, and cried, See he, the freer said, I conjure thee, thou art a fiend of hell. Thou art combed hider for some train, I conjure thee to go again where thou was wont to dwell. He sane at him with cross and creed, took forth the book, began to read, in St. Johann his gospel. The sower show would not Latin hear, but rudely rushed at the freer, that blinked all his blee. And when show would have taken hold, the freer leapt as I a chess would, and bealed him with a tree. She was brim as any bear, for all their meat to labour there, to them it was no boot. On tree and bush that by her stood, she vengeed her as she were wood, and raved them up by root. He said, Alas, that I were freer, I shall be hugged asunder here, hard is my destiny. Wist my brethren in this hour, that I was set in psyche stour, they would pray for me. This wicked beast that wrought the woe, took that rape from the other two, and then they fled all three. They fled away by Watling Street, they had no succour but their feet, it was the mere pity. The field it was both lost and won, the sower went home, and that full soon, to Morton on the green. When Rafe of Rokeby saw the rape, he wist that there had been debate, whereat the sower had been. He bade them stand out of her way, for show had had a sudden fray. I saw never sower see keen, some new thingis shall we hear, of her in middle tone the freer, some battle hath there been. But all that served him for naught, had they not better succour sought. They were served therefore low. Then Mistress Rockaby came anon, and for her brought show meat full soon. The sower came her on too. Show gave her meat upon the flower. Show made a bed beneath a bower, with moss and broom besprent. The sower was gentle as mote be, ne rage ne ire flashed fra her e. Show seemed well content. Fit the second. When Freer Middletone come home, his braiders were full fain ill home, and thanked God for his life. He told them all unto the end, how he had foughten with a fiend, and lived through mickle strife. We gave her battle half a day, and was fain to flee away for saving of our life. And Peter Dale would never blin, but ran as fast as he could rin, till he came till his wife. The warden said, I am full woe that yow should be torment so, but we had with yow been. Had we been there, yow brothers all, we would have guard the warlow fall that wrought yow all this teen. Freer Middleton, he said soon, nay, in faith ye would have ran away when most mister had been. Ye all can spake saft words at home, the fiend will ding yow doon ilk on, and it be all I ween. He looked say greasily all that night. The warden said, Yon man will fight if ye say aught but good. Yon guest hath grieved him, see sore. Hold your tongues and speak no more. He looks as he were of a wood. The warden wagered on the morn, two boldest men that ever were born, I wain, or e'er shall be. Tone was Gilbert Griffin's son. Full mickle worship had he won, both by land and sea. T'other a bastard son of Spain, Mony a Saracen had he slain, His dint had guard them die. They smen the battle undertook, Again the sewer, as saith the book, And sealed security, That they should boldly bide and fight, And scomfit her in main and might, Or therefore should they die. The warden sealed to them again, And said, If ye in field be slain, This condition make I, we shall for yow pray, sing, and read, until Domus Day, with hearty speed, with all our progeny. Then the letters were well made, the bonds were bound, with seals braid, as deeds of arms should be. These men at arms that were se white, and with their armour burnished bright, they went the sewer to see. Show made at them psyche roar, that for her they fear it sore, and all maced bound to flee. Shall come running them again, and saw the bastard son of Spain, 
he braided out his brand, full spiteously at her he strake, yet for the fence that he called make, shall strake it fro his hand, and rave asunder half his shield, and bear him backward in the field, he mout not her gain stand. She would have riven his privich gear, but Gilbert with his sword of war, he strake at her full strang. In her shouther he held the sword, then was Gilbert sore afeard when the blade brack in twang, and one in hand he had her tain, she took him by the shouther bane and held her hold full fast. She strays he stiffly in that stour, she bit through all his rich armour till blood come out at last. Then Gilbert grieved was he sir, that he rave off the hide of hair, the flesh cam fra the bane, and with force he held her there, and won her worthily in war, and banned her him alane, and lift her on a horse see he, into two panniers made of a tree, and to Richmond anon. When they saw the felon come, they sang merrily Te Deum, the freers every one. They thanked God and St. Francis, that they had won the beast of Pris, and ne'er a man was slain. There never did man more manly than Knight Maroon or Sir Guy, nor Louis of Lothrain. If ya will any more of this, i the friary at Richmond, written it is, in parchment good and fine, how freer Middleton see hend at Greta Bridge conjured a fiend in likeness of a swine. It is well known to many a man that Freer Theobald was warden then, and this fell in his time. And Christ them bless both fair and ne'er, all that for solace this doe hair, and him that made the rhyme. Rafe of Rokeby would full God will, the Freers of Richmond gave her till, this soul to mend their fare. Freer Middleton, by name, he would bring the felon hame that rewed him. Full sair. End of the felon sower of Rokeby and the Freers of Richmond. Recording by Stephen Harvey. Section thirty eight of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Arthur O'Bradley's Wedding In the ballad called Robin Hood, his birth, breeding, valor, and marriage occurs the following line, and some singing Arthur a Bradley. Antiquaries are by no means agreed as to what is the song of Arthur a Bradley there alluded to, for it so happens that there are no less than three different songs about the same Arthur a Bradley. Ritson gives one of them in his Robin Hood, commencing thus, See you not pierce the piper. He took it from a black letter copy in a private collection, compared with, and very much corrected by, a copy contained in An Anecdote Against Melancholy, made up in pills compounded of witty ballads, jovial songs, and merry catches, 1661. Ritson quotes another, and apparently much more modern song on the same subject, and to the same tune beginning, all in the merry month of May. It is a miserable composition, as may be seen by referring to a copy preserved in the third volume of the Roxborough Ballads. There is another song, the one given by us, which appears to be as ancient as any of those which Arthur O'Bradley is the hero, and from its subject being a wedding, and also from its being the only Arthur O'Bradley song that we have been enabled to trace in broadside and chapbooks of the last century, we are induced to believe it may be the song mentioned in the old ballad, 
which is supposed to have been written in the reign of charles i an obscure music publisher who about thirty years ago resided in the metropolis brought out an edition of arthur o bradley's wedding with the prefix written by mr taylor this mr taylor was however only a low comedian of the day and the ascribed authorship was a mere trick on the publisher's part to increase the sale of the song we are not able to give any account of the hero but from his being alluded to by so many of our old writers he was perhaps not altogether a fictitious personage ben jonson names him in one of his plays and he is also mentioned in decker's honest war of one of the tunes mentioned in the song the hence melancholy we can give no account the other mad mole may be found in playford's dancing master sixteen ninety eight it is the same tune as the one known by the names of yellow stockings and the virgin queen the latter title seeming to connect it with queen elizabeth as the name of mad mall does with the history of mary who was subject to mental aberration the words of mad mall are not known to exist but probably consisted of some fulsome panegyric on the virgin queen at the expense of her unpopular sister from the mention of hence melancholy and mad mole it is presumed that they were both popular favorites when arthur o'bradley's wedding was written a good deal of vulgar grossness has been at different times introduced into this song which seems in this respect to be as elastic as the french chanson cadet roussel which is always being altered and of which there are no two copies alike the tune of arthur o bradley is given by mr chapel in his popular music come neighbors and listen a while if ever you wish to smile or hear a true story of old attend to what i now unfold tis of a lad whose fame did resound through every village and town around for fun for frolic and for whim none ever was to equal him and his name was arthur o'bradley oh rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley oh now arthur being stout and bold and near upon thirty years old he needs a wooing would go to get him a helpmate you know so gaining young dolly's consent next to be married they went and to make himself noble appear he mounted the old padded mare he chose her because she was blood and the prime of his old daddy's stud she was wind galled spavined and blind and had lost a near leg behind she was cropped and docked and fired and seldom if ever was tired she had such an abundance of bone so he called her his high-bred roan a credit to arthur o'bradley oh rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley oh then he packed up his drudgery hose and put on his holiday clothes his coat was of scarlet so fine full trimmed with buttons behind two sleeves it had it is true one yellow the other was blue 
and the cuffs and the capes were of green and the longest that ever were seen his hat though greasy and tore cocked up with a feather before and under his chin it was tied with a strip from an old cow's hide his breeches three times had been turned and two holes through the left side were burned two boots he had but not kin one leather the other was tin and for stirrups he had two patent rings tied fast to the girth with two strings yet he wanted a good saddle cloth which long had been eat by the moth twas a sad misfortune you say but still he looked gallant and gay and his name it was arthur o'bradley o rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley o oh. thus accoutred away he did ride while dolly she walked by his side till coming up to the church door in the midst of five thousand or more then from the old mare he did alight which put the clerk in a fright and the parson so fumbled and shook that presently down dropped his book then arthur began for to sing and made the whole church to ring crying dolly my dear come hither and let us be tacked together for the honour of arthur o'bradley o rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley o oh. then the vicar discharged his duty without either reward or fee declaring no money he'd have and poor arthur he'd none to give so to make him a little amends he invited him home with his friends to have a sweet kiss at the bride and eat a good dinner beside the dishes though few were good and the sweetest of animal food first a roast guinea pig and a bantam a sheep's head stewed in a lanthorn two calves feet and a bull's trotter the fore and hind leg of an otter with crawfish cockles and crabs lumpfish limpets and dabs red herring and sprats by dozens to feed all their uncles and cousins who seemed well pleased with their treat and heartily they did all eat for the honour of arthur o'bradley o oh, rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley o oh. now the guests being well satisfied the fragments were laid on one side when arthur to make their hearts merry brought ale and parkin and perry when timothy twig stepped in with his pipe and a pipkin of gin a lad that was pleasant and jolly and scorned to meet melancholy he would chant and pipe so well no youth could him excel not pan the god of the swains could ever produce such strains but arthur being first in the throng he swore he would sing the first song and one that was pleasant and jolly and that he should be hence melancholy now give me a dance quoth doll come geoffrey play up mad moll tis time to be merry and frisky but first i must have some more whisky oh you're right says arthur my love my daffy down dilly my love my everything my wife i ne'er was so pleased in my life since my name it was arthur o'bradley oh rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley oh then the piper he screwed up his bags 
and the girls began shaking their rags first up jumped old mother crew two stockings and never a shoe her nose was crooked and long which she could easily reach with her tongue and a hump on her back she did not lack but you should take no notice of that and her mouth stood all awry and she never was heard to lie for she had been dumb from her birth so she nodded consent to the mirth for honour of arthur o'bradley o rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley o oh. then the parson led off at the top some danced while others did hop while some ran foul of the wall and others down backwards did fall there was lead up and down figure in for hands across then back again so in dancing they spent the whole night till bright phoebus appeared in their sight when each had a kiss of the bride and hopped home to his own fireside well pleased was arthur o'bradley o rare arthur o'bradley wonderful arthur o'bradley sweet arthur o'bradley o oh. end of arthur o'bradley's wedding section thirty nine of ancient poems and ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by larry wilson the painful plough this is one of our oldest agricultural ditties and maintains its popularity to the present hour it is called for at merrymaking and feasts in every part of the country the tune is in the minor key and of a pleasing character come all you jolly ploughmen of courage stout and bold that labour all the winter in stormy winds and cold to clothe the fields with plenty your farmyards to renew to crown them with contentment behold the painful plough hold ploughman said the gardener don't count your trade with ours walk through the garden and view the early flowers also the curious border and pleasant walks go view there's none such peace and plenty performed by the plough hold gardener said the ploughman my calling don't despise each man for his living upon his trade relies were it not for the ploughman both rich and poor would rue for we are all dependent upon the painful plough adam in the garden was sent to keep it right but the length of time he stayed there i believe it was one night yet of his own labour i call it not his due soon he lost his garden and went to hold the plough for adam was a ploughman when ploughing first begun the next that did succeed him was cain the eldest son some of the generation this calling now pursue that bread may not be wanting remains the painful plough samson was the strongest man and solomon was wise alexander for to conquer twas all his daily prize king david was valiant and many thousands slew yet none of these brave heroes could live without the plough behold the wealthy merchant that trades in foreign seas and brings home gold and treasure for those who live at ease with fine silks and spices and fruits also too they are brought from the indies by virtue of the plough for they must have bread biscuit rice pudding flour and peas to feed the jolly sailors as they sail o'er the seas and the man that brings them will own to what is true he cannot sail the ocean without the painful plough i hope there's none offended at me for singing this for it is not intended for anything amiss if you consider rightly you'll find what i say is true for all that you can mention depends upon the plough end of the painful plough section forty of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Useful Plough, or The Plough's Praise. The common editions of this popular song inform us that it is taken from an old ballad, alluding probably to the dialogue given at page 44. This song is quoted by Farquhar. A country life is sweet, in moderate cold and heat, to walk in the air, how pleasant and fair, in every field of wheat, the fairest of flowers adorning the bowers, and every meadow's brow. To that I say, no courtier may compare with they who clothe in grey, and follow the youthful plough. They rise with the morning lark, and labor till almost dark. Then folding their sheep, they hasten to sleep, while every pleasant park. Next morning is ringing with birds that are singing on each green tender bough. With what content and merriment their days are spent, whose minds are bent to follow the useful plough the gallant that dresses fine and drinks his bottles of wine were he to be tried his feathers of pride which deck and adorn his back are tailors and mercers and other men dressers for which they do done them now but ralph and will no compters fill for tailor's bill or garment still but follow the useful plough their hundreds without remorse some spend to keep dogs and horse who never would give as long as they live not two pence to help the poor their wives are neglected and harlots respected this grieves the nation now but tis not so with us that go where pleasures flow to reap and mow and follow the useful plough end of the useful plough or the plough's praise section forty one of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain the farmer's son this song familiar to the dwellers of the dales of yorkshire was published in seventeen twenty nine in the vocal miscellany a collection of about four hundred celebrated songs as the miscellany was merely an anthology of songs already well known the date of this song must have been some time anterior to seventeen twenty nine it was republished in the british musical miscellany or the delightful grove seventeen ninety six and in a few other old songbooks. It was evidently founded on an old black-letter dialogue preserved in the Roxborough collection called A Mad Kind of Wooing, or A Dialogue Between Will the Simple and Nan the Subtle, with their loving argument, to the tune of The New Dance at the Red Bull Playhouse, printed by the assignees of Thomas Simcock sweet nelly my heart's delight be loving and do not slight the proffer i make for modesty's sake i honour your beauty bright for love i profess i can do no less thou hast my favour won and since i see your modesty i pray agree and fancy me though i'm but a farmer's son no i am a lady gay tis very well known i may have men of renown in country or town so roger without delay court bridget or sue kate nancy or prue their loves will soon be won but don't you dare to speak me fair as if i were at my last prayer to marry a farmer's son my father has riches store two hundred a year and more besides sheep and cows carts harrows and ploughs his age is above threescore and when he does die then merrily i shall have what he has won both land and kine all shall be thine 
if thou'lt incline and wilt be mine and marry a farmer's son a fig for your cattle and corn your preferred love i scorn tis known very well my name is nell and you're but a bumpkin born well since it is so away i will go and i hope no harm is done farewell adieu i hope to woo as good as you and win her too though i'm but a farmer's son be not in such haste quoth she perhaps we may still agree for man i protest i was but in jest come prithee sit down by me for thou art the man that verily can win me if e'er i'm won both straight and tall genteel withal therefore i shall be at your call to marry a farmer's son dear lady believe me now i solemnly swear and vow no lords in their lives take pleasure in wives like fellows that drive the plough for whatever they gain with labour and pain they don't with to harlots run as courtiers do i never knew a london beau that could outdo a country farmer's son End of A Farmer's Son Section 42 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Farmer's Boy Mr. Denham of Piercebridge, who communicates the following, says, there is no question that the farmer's boy is a very ancient song it is highly popular amongst the north country lads and lasses the date of the composition may probably be referred to the commencement of the last century when there prevailed amongst the ballad mongers a great rage for farmers sons ploughboys milkmaids farmers boys etc etc the song is popular all over the country, and there are numerous printed copies, ancient and modern. The sun had set behind yon hills, across yon dreary moor. Weary and lame, a boy there came, up to a farmer's door. Can you tell me if any there be that will give me employ to plough and sow and reap and mow and be a farmer's boy? My father is dead, and mother is left with five children great and small and what is worse for mother still i'm the oldest of them all though little i'll work as hard as a turk if you'll give me employ to plough and sow and reap and mow and be a farmer's boy and if that you won't me employ one favour i've to ask will you shelter me till break of day from this cold winter's blast at break of day I'll trudge away elsewhere to seek employ, to plough and sow and reap and mow and be a farmer's boy. Come, try the lad, the mistress said, let him no further seek. Oh, do, dear father, the daughter cried, while tears ran down her cheek. He'd work if he could, so tis hard to want food, and wander for employ. Don't turn him away, but let him stay and be a farmer's boy. And when the lad became a man, the good old farmer died, and left the lad the farm he had, and his daughter for his bride. The lad that was the farm now has, oft smiles and thinks with joy, of the lucky day he came that way to be a farmer's boy. End of The Farmer's Boy Section 43 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Richard of Taunton Dean, or Dumble Dum Deary. This song is very popular with the country people in every part of England but more particularly with the inhabitants of the counties of Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. The chorus is peculiar to country songs of the west of England. There are many different versions. The following one, communicated by Mr. Sandys, was taken down from the singing of an old blind fiddler, who, says Mr. Sandys, 
used to accompany it on his instrument in an original and humorous manner a representative of the old minstrels the air is in popular music in halliwell's nursery rhymes of england there is a version of this song called richard of dalton dale last new year's day as i've heard say young richard he mounted his dapple gray and he trotted along to taunton dean to court the parson's daughter jean dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee with buttskin breeches shoes and hose and dicky put on his sunday clothes likewise a hat upon his head all bedaubed with ribbons red dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee young richard he rode without dread or fear till he came to the house where lived his sweet dear when he knocked and shouted and bellowed hello be the folks at home say a or no dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee a trusty servant let him in that he his courtship might begin young richard he walked along the great hall and loudly for a mistress jean did call dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee miss jean she came without delay to hear what dicky had got to say is s'pose you know me mistress jean i'm honest richard of taunton dean dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee i'm an honest fellow although i be poor and i never was in love afore my mother she bid me come here for to woo and i can fancy none but you dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee suppose that i would be your bride pray how would you for me provide for i can neither sew nor spin pray what will your day's work bring in dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee why i can plow and i can sow and sometimes to the market go with gaffer johnson's straw or hay and yearn my ninepence every day dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee ninepence a day will never do for i must have silks and satins too ninepence a day won't buy us meat at zooks said dick i've zack of wheat dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee besides i have a house hard by tis all my own when mommy do die if thee and i were married now odds i'd feed thee as fat as my father's old cow dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee dick's compliments did so delight they made the family laugh outright young richard took huff and no more would say he kicked up old dobbin and trotted away dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum deary dumble dum dee 
End of Richard of Taunton Dean or Dumple Dum Dreary. Section 44 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Wooing Song of a Yeoman of Kent's Song. The following song is the original of a well known and popular Scottish song. I hae laid a herring in salt. Last gin ye lo me, tell me now. I hae brewed a forpit o mout, and I canna come eke a day to woo. There are modern copies of our Kentish wooing song, but the present version is taken from Melismata musical fantasies fitting the court, city, and country. Two, three, four, and five voices. London, printed by William Stansby for Thomas Adams, 1611. The tune will be found in popular music one page ninety the words are in the kentish dialect each have house and land in kent and if you'll love me love me now two pence half penny is my rent each cannot come every day to woo two pence half penny is his rent and he cannot come every day to woo each am my father's eldest son my mother eke doth love me well for each can bravely clout my shoon and each full well can ring a bell for he can bravely clout his shoon and he full well can ring a bell my father he gave me a hoog my mother she gave me a zow each have a good father dwells thereby and he on me bestowed a plough he has a good father dwells thereby and he on him bestowed a plough one time each gave thee a paper of pins another time a tawdry lace and if thou wilt not grant me love in truth it die before thy face and if thou wilt not grant his love in truth he'll die before thy face each have been twice our witson lord each have had ladies many fair and eke thou hast my heart in hold and in my mind seems passing rare and eke thou hast his heart in hold and in his mind seems passing rare eke will put on my best white slop and each will wear my yellow hose and on my head a good gray hat and in each stick a lovely rose and on his head a good gray hat and in he'll stick a lovely rose wherefore cease off make no delay and if you'll love me love me now or else eke seek some utter where for eke cannot come every day to woo or else he'll seek some utter where for he cannot come every day to woo end of wooing song of a yeoman of kent's song section 45 of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Clown's Courtship This song, on the same subject as the preceding, 
is as old as the reign of Henry the Eighth. The first verse says Mr. Chapel being found elaborately set to music in a manuscript of that date. The air is given in popular music one, page eighty seven. Quoth John to Joan, Wilt thou have me? I pray thee now, wilt, and I'll's marry with thee. My cow, my calf, my house, my rents, and all my lands and tenements. O oh, say, my Joan, will not that do? I cannot come every day to woo. I've corn and hay in the barn hard by, and three fat hogs pent up in the sty. I have a mare, and she is coal black. I ride on her tail to save my back. O oh, say, my Joan, will not that do? I cannot come every day to woo. I have a cheese upon the shelf, and I cannot eat it all myself. I have three good marks that lie in a rag, in the nook of the chimney, instead of a bag. O oh, say, my Joan, will not that do? I cannot come every day to woo. To marry I would have thy consent, but faith I never could compliment. I can say not, but hoy, gee ho, words that belong to the cart and the plough. O oh, say, my Joan, will not that do? I cannot come every day to woo. End of The Clown's Courtship Section 46 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Harry's Courtship This old ditty, in its incidents, bears a resemblance to Dumble Dum Deary. See Ante, page 149. It used to be a popular song in the Yorkshire Dales. We have been obliged to supply a hiatus in the second verse, and to make an alteration in the last, where we have converted the red-nosed parson of the original into a squire. Harry courted modest Mary. Mary was always brisk and airy. Harry was country neat as could be, but his words were rough and his duds were muddy. Harry, when he first bespoke her, kept a dandling the kitchen poker. Mary spoke her words like Venus, but said, There's something I fear between us. Have you got cups of china metal? Canister, cream jug, tongs, or kettle. Od zooks, I bowls and siles and dishes. Enow to supply any prudent wishes. I've got none, o oh, your cups of chaney. Canister, cream jug, I've not any. I've a three footed pot and a good brass kettle. Pray, what do you want? with your chainy metal a shippin full of rye for two fodder a house full of goods one mac or another i'll thrash in the lathe what you sit spinning oh molly i think that's a good beginning i'll not sit at my wheel a spinning or rise in the morn to wash your linen I'll lie in bed till the clock strikes eleven. Oh, grant me patience, gracious heaven. Why, then thou must marry some red-nosed squire who'll buy thee a saddle to sit by the fire. For I'll to Marjorie in the valley. She is my girl, so farewell, Mally. End of Harry's Courtship
section 47 of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c harvest home song our copy of this song is taken from one in the roxborough collection where it is called the country farmer's vain glory in a new song of harvest home sung to a new tune much in request licensed according to order the tune is published in popular music a copy of this song with the music may be found in de urfey's pills to purge melancholy it varies from ours but de urfey is so loose and inaccurate in his text that any other version is more likely to be correct the broadside form which the following is copied was printed for p brooksbury j Dencon, deacon j blair and j back our oats they are howed and our barleys reaped our hay is mowed and our hovels heaped harvest home harvest home will merrily roar out our harvest home harvest home harvest home will merrily roar out our harvest home will merrily roar out our harvest home we cheated the parson we'll cheat him again for why should the vicar have one in ten one in ten one in ten for why should the vicar have one in ten for why should the vicar have one in ten for staying while dinner is cold and hot and pudding and dumplings burnt to pot burnt to pot burnt to pot till pudding and dumplings burnt to pot burnt to pot burnt to pot we'll drink off the liquor while we can stand and hey for the honour of old england old england old england and hey for the honour of old england old england old england end of harvest home song section forty eight of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c harvest home from an old copy without printer's name or date come roger and nell come simpkin and bell each lad with his lass hither come with singing and dancing and pleasure advancing to celebrate harvest home tis ceres bids play and keep holiday to celebrate harvest home harvest home harvest home to celebrate harvest home our labor is o'er our barns in full store now swell with rich gifts of the land let each man then take for the prong and the rake his can and his lass in his hand tis ceres bids play and keep holiday to celebrate harvest home harvest home harvest home to celebrate harvest home no courtier can be so happy as we in innocence pastime and mirth while thus we carouse with our sweetheart or spouse and rejoice o'er the fruits of the earth till ceres bids play and keep holiday to celebrate harvest home harvest home harvest home to celebrate harvest home end of harvest home Section 49 of Ancient Poems and Ballads and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson. 
the mow a harvest home song tune where the bee sucks this favorite song copied from a chapbook called the whistling plowman published at the commencement of the present century is written in imitation of ariel's song in the tempest it is probably taken from some defunct ballad opera now our work's done thus we feast after labor comes our rest joy shall reign in every breast and right welcome is each guest after harvest merrily 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 will we sing now after the harvest that heaps up the mow now the ploughman he shall plough and shall whistle as he go whether it be fair or blow for another barley mow or the furrow merrily 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 will we sing now after the harvest the fruit of the plough toil and plenty toil and ease still the husbandman he sees whether when the winter freeze or in the summer's gentle breeze still he labours merrily 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 after the plough he looks to the harvest that gives us the mow end of the mow Section 50 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and the Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Barley Mo Song. This song is sung at country meetings in Devon and Cornwall, particularly on completing the carrying of the barley which the rick or mow of barley is finished on putting up the last sheaf which is called the craw or crow sheaf the man who has it cries out i have it i have it i have it another demands what have ye what have ye what have ye and the answer is a craw a craw a craw upon which there is some cheering etc and a supper afterwards the effect of the barley mow song cannot be given in words it should be heard to be appreciated properly particularly with the west country dialect here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the nipperkin boys here's a health to the barley mow the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the quarter pint boys here's a health to the barley mow the quarter pint nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the half a pint boys here's a health to the barley mow the half a pint quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of a pint my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the quart my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the pottle my boys here's a health to the barley mow the pottle the quart the pint the half pint 
the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the gallon my boys here's a health to the barley mow the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the half anchor boys here's a health to the barley mow the half anchor gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the anchor my boys here's a health to the barley mow the anchor the half anchor the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the half hogshead boys here's a health to the barley mow the half hogstead the anchor the half anchor the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the hogstead my boys here's a health to the barley mow the hogstead the half hogstead the ankler the half ankler the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the pipe my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow the pipe the hogstead the half hogstead the ankler the half ankler the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the well my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow the well the pipe the hogstead the half hogstead the ankler the half ankler the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the river my boys here's a health to the barley mow the river the well the pipe the hogstead the half hogstead the ankler the half ankler the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow we'll drink it out of the ocean my boys here's a health to the barley mow the ocean the river the well the pipe the hogstead the half hogstead the ankler the half ankler the gallon the pottle the quart the pint the half pint the quarter pint the nipperkin and the jolly brown bowl here's a health to the barley mow my brave boys here's a health to the barley mow end of the barley mow song section fifty one of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the barley mow song 
Suffolk Version. The peasantry of Suffolk sing the following version of the Barley Mow song. Here's a health to the Barley Mow. Here's a health to the man who very well can both harrow and plough and sow. When it is well sown, see it is well mown, both raked and graveled clean, and a barn to lay it in. Here's a health to the man who very well can both thrash and fan it clean. End of the Barley Mow Song Suffolk Version Section 52 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Craven Churn Supper Song In some of the more remote dales of Craven, it is customary at the close of the hay harvest for the farmers to give an entertainment to their men. This is called the Churn Supper a name which Eugene Aram traces to the immemorial usage of producing at such suppers a great quantity of cream in a churn, and circulating it in cups to each of the rustic company, to be eaten with bread. At these churn suppers the masters and their families attend the entertainment and share in the general mirth. The men mask themselves and dress in a grotesque manner, and are allowed the privilege of playing harmless practical jokes on their employers, etc. The churn supper song varies in different dales, but the following used to be the most popular version. In the third verse, there seems to be an allusion to the clergyman's taking tithe in kind on which occasions he is generally accompanied by two or three men and the parish clerk. The song has never before been printed. There is a marked resemblance between it and a song of the date of 1650 called A Cup of Old Stingo. See Popular Music of Olden Time, 1308. God rest you, merry gentlemen, be not moved at my strain, for nothing study shall my brain but for to make you laugh, for I came here to this feast for to laugh, carouse, and jest, and welcome shall be every guest to take his cup and quaff. Be frolicsome every one, melancholy none, drink about, see it out, and then we'll all go home, and then we'll all go home. This ale, it is a gallant thing, it cheers the spirits of a king, it makes a dumb man strive to sing, I and a beggar play. A cripple that is lame and halt, and scarce a mile a day can walk, when he feels the juice of malt, will throw his crutch away. Be frolicsome, every one, melancholy none, drink about, see it out, and then we'll all go home, and then we'll all go home. Twill make the parson forget his men, twill make his clerk forget his pen, twill turn a tailor's giddy brain and make him break his wand. The blacksmith loves it as his life, it makes the tinkler bang his wife. I and the butcher seek his knife, when he has it in his hand. Be frolicsome, every one, melancholy none. Drink about, see it out, and then we'll all go home, and then we'll all go home. So now, to conclude, my merry boys all, let's with strong liquor take a fall, although the weakest goes to the wall, the best is but a play. For water it concludes in noise, good ale will cheer our hearts, brave boys, then put it round with a cheerful voice, we meet not every day. Be frolicsome every one, melancholy none, drink about, see it out, and then we'll all go home, and then we'll all go home. End of The Craven Churn Supper Song LibriVox recording by Rita Louise, 2019, Ann Arbor, Michigan Section 53 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain the rural dance about the maypole the most correct copy of this song is that given in the westminster drollery part two page eighty it is there called 
The rural dance about the Maypole, the tune, the first figure dance at Mr. Young's Ball, May 1671. The tune is in popular music. The Maypole, for so the song is called in modern collections, is a very popular ditty at the present time. The common copies vary considerably from the following version, which is much more correct than any hitherto published. Come, lasses and lads, take leave of your dads, and away to the Maypole High, for every he has got him a she in the minstrel standing by, for Willie has gotten his Jill, and Johnny has got his Joan, to jig it, jig it, jig it, jig it, up and down. Strike up, says Watt, agreed, says Kate, and I, prithee fiddler, play. Content, says Hodge, and so says Madge, and this is a holiday. That every man did put his hat off to his lass, and every girl did kerchy, kerchy, kerchy on the grass. Begin, says Hall, ay, ay, says Mall, we'll lead up Packington's pound. No, no, says Doll, and so says Doll, we'll first have Sellinger's round. Then every man began to foot it round about, and every girl did jet it, jet it, jet it in and out. You're out, says Dick. Tis a lie, says Nick. The fiddler played it false. Tis true, says Hugh, and so says Sue, and so says nimble Alice. The fiddler then began to play the tune again, and every girl did trip it, trip it, trip it to the men. Let's kiss, says Jane, content, says Nan, and so says every she. How many, says Bat, why three, says Matt, for that's a maiden's fee. But they, instead of three, did give them half a score, and they in kindness gave em, gave em, gave em as many more. Then after an hour they went to a bower and played for ale and cakes, and kisses too until they were due the lasses kept the stakes. The girls did then begin to quarrel with the men, and bid them take their kisses back and give them their own again. Yet there they sate until it was late and tired the fiddler quite, with singing and playing without any paying from morning unto night. They told the fiddler then they'd pay him for his play, and each a twopence twopence gave him and went away. Good night, says Harry, good night, says Mary, good night, says Dolly to John. Good night, says Sue, good night, says you, good night, says every one. Some walked and some did run, some loitered on the way, and bound themselves with love knots, love knots to meet the next holiday. End of The Rural Dance About the Maypole. LibriVox recording by Rita Louise, 2019, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Section 54 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hitchin May Day Song The following song is sung by the mayors at Hitchin in the county of Hertz. For an account of the manner in which May Day is observed at Hitchin, see Hone's Everyday Book. Remember us poor mayors all, and thus do we begin to lead our lives in righteousness, or else we die in sin. We have been rambling all the night and almost all the day, and now returned back again, we have brought you a branch of May. A branch of May we have brought you, and at your door it stands. It is but a sprout, but it's well budded out by the work of our Lord's hand. The hedges and trees, they are so green, as green as any leek. Our heavenly Father he watered them, with his heavenly dew so sweet. The heavenly gates are open wide, our paths are beaten plain, and if a man be not too far gone, he may return again. The life of man is but a span, it flourishes like a flower. We are here today, and gone tomorrow, and we are dead in an hour. The moon shines bright, and the stars give a light a little before it is day. So God bless you all, both great and small, and send you a joyful May. End of The Hitchin May Day Song Recording by Rita Louise, 2019, Ann Arbor, Michigan
Section 55 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hellstone Furry Day Song At Hellstone in Cornwall, the 8th of May is a day devoted to revelry and gaiety. It is called the Furry Day, supposed to be a corruption of Flora's Day, from the garlands worn and carried in procession during the festival. A writer in the Gentleman's Magazine for June 1790 says, In the morning, very early, some troublesome rogues go round the streets of Hellstone with drums and other noisy instruments, disturbing their sober neighbors and singing parts of a song, the whole of which nobody now recollects and of which I know no more than that there is mention in it of the grey goose quill, and of going to the greenwood to bring home the summer and the mayo. During the festival, the gentry, tradespeople, servants, etc., dance through the streets and thread through certain of the houses to a very old dance tune, given in the appendix to Davies Gilbert's Christmas Carols, and which may also be found in Chapel's popular music and other collections. The Furry Day song possesses no literary merit whatever, but as a part of an old and really interesting festival, it is worthy of preservation. The dance tune has been confounded with that of the song, but Mr. Sandys, to whom we are indebted for this communication, observes that the dance tune is quite different. Robin Hood and Little John, they both are gone to the fair, oh, and we will go to the merry green wood to see what they do there, oh, and for to chase, oh, to chase the buck and doe, with hal and toe, rumble, oh, for we were up as soon as any day, oh, and for to fetch the summer home, the summer and the may, oh, for summer is a come, oh, and winter is a gone, oh. Where are those Spaniards that make so great a boast? Oh, they shall eat the gray goose feather, and we will eat the roast, oh, in every land, oh, the land where'er we go, with ha lan rumble, oh, for we were up as soon as any day, oh, and for to fetch the summer home, the summer and the may, oh, for summer is a come, oh, and winter is a gone, oh. As for St. George, oh, St. George, he was a knight, oh, of all the knights in Christendom, St. George is the right, oh, in every land, oh, the land where'er we go, with ha lan rumble, oh, for we were up as soon as any day, oh, and for to fetch the summer home, the summer and the May, oh, for summer is a come, oh, and winter is a gone, oh. End of the Hellstone Furry Day Song Recording by Rita Louise, 2019, Ann Arbor, Michigan Section 56 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cornish Midsummer Bonfire Song the very ancient custom of lighting fires on Midsummer Eve, being the vigil of St. John the Baptist, is still kept up in several parts of Cornwall. On these occasions, the fishermen and others dance about the fires and sing appropriate songs. The following has been sung for a long series of years at Penzance and the neighborhood, and is taken down from the recitation of the leader of a West Country choir. It is communicated to our pages by Mr. Sandys. The origin of the Midsummer Bonfires is fully explained in Brand's Popular Antiquities. See Sir H. Ellis's edition of that work, Volume 1, pages 166 to 186. The bonny month of June is crowned with the sweet scarlet rose. The groves and meadows all around with lovely pleasure flows. As I walked out to yonder green one evening so fair, all where the fair maids may be seen, playing at the bonfire. Hail, lovely nymphs, be not too coy, but freely yield your charms. 
Let love inspire with mirth and joy in Cupid's lovely arms. Bright Luna spreads its light around, the gallants for to cheer, as they lay sporting on the ground at the fair June bonfire. All on the pleasant dewy mead they shared each other's charms, till Phoebus's beams began to spread, and coming day alarms. Whilst larks and linnets sing so sweet to cheer each lovely swain, let each prove true unto their love, and so farewell the plain. End of Cornish Midsummer Bonfire Song Recording by Rita Louise, 2019, Ann Arbor, Michigan Section 57 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Suffolk Harvest Home Song In no part of England are the harvest homes kept up with greater spirit than in Suffolk. The following old song is a general favorite on such occasions. Here's a health unto our master the founder of the feast i wish with all my heart and soul in heaven he may find rest i hope all things may prosper that ever be takes in hand for we are all his servants and all at his command drink boys drink and see you do not spill for if you do you must drink too it is your master's will now our harvest is ended and supper is past here's our mistress good health in a full flowing glass she is a good woman she prepared us good cheer come all my brave boys and drink off your beer drink my boys drink till you come unto me the longer we sit, my boys, the merrier shall we be. In yon green wood there lies an old fox. Close by his den you may catch him or no. Ten thousand to one you catch him or no. His beard and his brush are all of one color. I'm sorry, kind sir, that your glass is no fuller. Tis down the red lane, tis down the red lane, so merrily hunt the fox down the red lane. End of Suffolk Harvest Home Song Section 58 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Wilson The Haymaker's Song An old and very favorite ditty sung in many parts of England at merry-makings, especially at those which occur during the hay harvest. It is not in any collection. In the merry month of June, in the prime time of the year, down in yonder meadows there runs a river clear, and many a little fish doth in that river play, and many a lad and many a lass go abroad a making hay. In come the jolly mowers, and mow the meadows down, with budget and with bottle, of ale both stout and brown. All laboring men of courage bold come here their strength to try. They sweat and blow, and cut and mow, for the grass cuts very dry. Here's nimble Ben and Tom, with pitchfork and with rake. Here's Molly, Liz, and Susan, come here their hay to make. While sweet jug, 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 the nightingale does sing, from morning unto evensong, as they are haymaking. And when that bright day faded, and the sun was going down, there was a merry piper approached from the town. He pulled out his pipe and tabor, so sweetly he did play, which made all lay down their rakes, and leave off making hay. Then joining in a dance, they jig it o'er the green, though tired with their labor, no one less was seen. But sporting like some fairies, their dance they did pursue, in leading up and casting off till morning was in view. 
and when that bright daylight the morning it was come they lay down and rested till the rising of the sun till the rising of the sun when the merry larks do sing and each lad did rise and take his lass and away to haymaking end of the haymaker's song Section 59 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sword Dancer's Song Sword dancing is not so common in the north of England as it was a few years ago, but a troop of rustic practitioners of the art may still be occasionally met with at Christmas time in some of the most secluded of the Yorkshire Dales. The following is a copy of the introductory song, as it used to be sung by the Wharfdale sword dancers. It has been transcribed from a manuscript in the possession of Mr. Holmes, surgeon, at Grassington, in Craven. At the conclusion of the song, a dance ensues, and sometimes a rustic drama is performed. See post, page 175. Jumping Joan, alluded to in the last verse, is a well-known old country dance tune. The spectators being assembled, the clown enters, and after drawing a circle with his sword, walks round it, and calls in the actors in the following lines, which are sung to the accompaniment of a violin played outside or behind the door. The first that enters on the floor, his name is Captain Brown. I think he is as smart a youth as any in this town. In courting of the ladies gay, he fixes his delight. He will not stay from them all day, and is with them all the night. The next is a tailor by his trade, called Obadiah Trim. You may quickly guess, by his plain dress, and hat of broadest brim, that he is of the quaking sect, who would seem to act by merit of yeas and nays, and hums and haas, and motions of the spirit. The next that enters on the floor, he is a foppish knight. The first to be in modish dress, he studies day and night. Observe his habit round about, even from top to toe, the fashion late from France was brought. He's finer than a bow. Next I present unto your view a very worthy man. He is a vintner by his trade, and Lovale is his name. If gentlemen propose a glass, he seldom says em nay, but does always think it's right to drink, while other people pay. The next that enters on the floor, it is my beauteous dame. Most dearly I do her adore, and Bridget is her name. At needlework she does excel all that e'er learnt to sew, And when I choose she'll ne'er refuse what I command her do. And I myself am come long since, and Thomas is my name, Though some are pleased to call me Tom, I think they're much to blame. Folks should not use their betters thus, but I value it not a groat, Though the tailors too, that botching crew, have patched it on my coat. I pray who's this we've met with here? that tickles his trunk wame. We've picked him up as here we came, and cannot learn his name. But sooner than he's go without, I'll call him my son Tom, and if he'll play, be it night or day, we'll dance you, Jumping Joan. End of The Sword Dancer's Song Recording by Stephen Harvey Section 60 of Ancient Poems Ballads and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sword Dancer's Song and Interlude, as now performed at Christmas in the county of Durham. The late Sir Cuthbert Sharp remarks that it is still the practice during the Christmas holidays for companies of fifteen to perform a sort of play or dance accompanied by song or music. The following version of the song, or interlude, has been transcribed from Sir Cuthbert Sharp's Bishopric Garland, corrected by a collation with a manuscript copy recently remitted to the editor by a countryman of Durham. The Devonshire peasants have a version almost identical with this, but laths are used instead of swords, and a few different characters are introduced to suit the locality. The pageant called the Fool Plough, which consists of a number of sword dancers dragging a plough with music, was anciently observed in the north of England, not only at Christmas time, but also in the beginning of Lent. Wallace thinks that the sword dance is the antic dance 
or Chorus Armatus, of the Romans. Brand supposes that it is a composition made up of the gleaning of several obsolete customs anciently followed in England and other countries. The Germans still practice the sword dance at Christmas and Easter. We once witnessed a sword dance in the Eiffel Mountains, which closely resembled our own, but no interlude or drama was performed. Enter dancers decorated with swords and ribbons, the captain of the band wearing a cocked hat and a peacock's feather in it by way of a cockade, and the clown, or Bessie, who acts as treasurer, being decorated with a hairy cap and a fox's brush dependent. The captain forms with his sword a circle, around which walks the Bessie, opens the proceedings by singing, good gentlemen all to our captain take heed and hear what he's got for to sing he's lived among music these forty long year and drunk of the elegant spring the captain then proceeds as follows his song being accompanied by a violin generally played by the bessie six actors i have brought who ne'er were on stage before but they will do their best and they can do no more the first that i call in he is a squire's son He's like to lose his sweetheart because he is too young. But though he is too young, he has money for to rove, and he will spend it all before he'll lose his love. Chorus. Fa lal de ral, lal de dal, fa lal de ral, ral da. Followed by a symphony on the fiddle, during which the introduced actor walks around the circle. The captain proceeds. The next that I call in, he is a tailor fine. What think you of his work? He made this coat of mine. Here the captain turns round and exhibits his coat, which, of course, is ragged and full of holes. So comes good Master Snip, his best respects to pay. He joins us in our trip to drive dull care away. Chorus. Fal lal di ral, lal di fal, fal lal di ra, ral da. Followed by the symphony on the fiddle, during which the introduced actor walks around the circle. Here the tailor walks round, accompanied by the squire's son. This form is observed after each subsequent introduction, all the newcomers taking part. The next I do call in, the prodigal son is he. By spending of his gold he's come to poverty. But though he has all spent, again he'll wield the plough, and sing right merrily, as any of us now. Next comes a skipper bold, he'll do his part right weel. A clever blade, I'm told, as ever posed a keel. He is a bonny lad, as you must understand. It's he can dance on deck, and you'll see him dance on land. To join us in this play, here comes a jolly dog, who's sober all the day, if he can get no grog. But though he likes his grog, as all his friends do say, he always likes it best when other people pay. Last I come in myself, the leader of this crew, and if you'd know my name, my name it is True Blue. Here the Bessie gives an account of himself. My mother was burnt for a witch, my father was hanged on a tree, and it's because I'm a fool. There's nobody meddle with me. The dance now commences. It is an ingenious performance, and the swords of the actors are placed in a variety of graceful positions so as to form stars, hearts, squares, circles, and etc. The dance is so elaborate that it requires frequent rehearsals, quick eye, and a strict adherence to time and tune, before it concludes, grace and elegance have given place to disorder, and at last all the actors are seen fighting. The parish clergyman rushes in to prevent bloodshed and receives a death blow, while on the ground the actors walk round the body and sing as follows to a slow psalm-like tune. Alas, our parson's dead, and on the ground is laid. Some of us will suffer for it. Young men, I'm sore afraid. I'm sure twas none of me. I'm clear of that crime. "'Twas him that follows me, that drew his sword so fine. "'I'm sure it was not me, I'm clear of the fact. "'Twas him that follows me, that did this dreadful act. "'I'm sure twas not of me, who sate be villains all, "'for both my eyes were closed when this good priest did fall.' "'The Bessie sings, "'Cheer up, cheer up, my bonny lads, and be of courage brave. "'We'll take him to his church, and bury him in the grave.' The captain speaks in a sort of recitative. Oh, for a doctor, a ten-pound doctor, oh. Enter doctor. Here I am. Captain, doctor, what's your fee? 
doctor ten pounds is my fee but nine pounds nineteen shillings eleven pence three farthings i will take from thee the bessie there's generosity the doctor sings i am a doctor a doctor rare who travels much at home my famous pills they cure all ills past present and to come my famous pills who'd be without they cure the plague the sickness and gout anything but a lovesick maid if you're one my dear you're beyond my aid here the doctor occasionally salutes one of the fair spectators he then takes out his snuff-box which is always of very capacious dimensions a sort of miniature warming-pan and empties the contents flour or meal on the clergyman's face singing at the time take a little of my niff-naff put it on your tiff-taff parson rise up and preach again the doctor says you are not slain the clergyman here sneezes several times and gradually recovers and all shake him by the hand the ceremony terminates by the captain singing our play is at an end and now we'll taste your cheer we wish you a merry christmas and a happy new year the bessie and your pockets full of brass and your cellars full of beer a general dance concludes the play end of the sword dancer's song and interlude recording by stephen harvey section 61 of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain. The Masker's Song In the Yorkshire Dales the young men are in the habit of going about at Christmas time in grotesque masks, and of performing in the farmhouses a sort of rude drama accompanied by singing and music. The maskers have wooden swords, and the performance is an evening one. The following version of their introductory song was taken down literally from the recitation of a young besom maker now residing at Linton in Craven who for some years past has himself been one of these rustic actors. From the allusion to the pace, or paschal egg, it is evident that the play was originally an Easter pageant, which, in consequence of the decline of the gorgeous rites formerly connected with that season, has been transferred to Christmas, the only festival which, in the rural districts of Protestant England, is observed after the olden fashion. The maskers generally consist of five characters, one of whom officiates in the threefold capacity of clown, fiddler, and master of the ceremonies. The custom of masking at Christmas is common to many parts of Europe, and is observed with a special zest in the Swiss cantons, where the maskers are all children, and the performances closely resemble those of England. In Switzerland, however, more care is bestowed upon the costume, and the songs are better sung. Enter Clown, who sings in a sort of chant, a recitative, I open this door, I enter in, I hope your favour for to win. Whether we shall stand or fall, we do endeavour to please you all. A room, a room, a gallant room, a room to let us ride. We are not of the raggled sort, but of the royal tribe. Stir up the fire, and make a light, to see the bloody act to-night. Here another of the party introduces his companions by singing to a violin accompaniment as follows. Is two or three jolly boys all in one mind? We've come a pace egging. I hope you'll prove kind. I hope you'll prove kind with your money and beer. We shall come no more near you until the next year. Fal de ral, lal de lal. The first that steps up is Lord Nelson, you'll see, with a bunch of blue ribbons tied down to his knee, with a star on his breast, like silver doth shine. I hope you'll remember this pace egging time. Fal de ral, lal de lal. Oh, the next that steps up is a jolly Jack Tar. He sailed with Lord Nelson during the last war. He's right on the sea, old England to view. He's come a pace egging with so jolly a crew. Fal de ral, lal de lal. Oh, the next that steps up is old Tosspot, you'll see. He's a valiant old man in every degree. He's a valiant old man, and he wears a pigtail, and all his delight is drinking mulled ale. Fal de ral, lal de lal. Oh, the next that steps up is old Miser, you'll see. She heaps up her white and her yellow money. She wears her old rags till she starves and she begs, and she's come here to ask for a dish of pace eggs. Fal de ral, lal de lal. The characters being thus duly introduced, the following lines are sung in chorus by all the party. 
Gentlemen and ladies that sit by the fire, put your hand in your pocket, tis all we desire. Put your hand in your pocket and pull out your purse, and give us a trifle. You'll not be much worse. Here follows a dance, and this is generally succeeded by a dialogue of an ad libitum character, which varies in different districts, being sometimes similar to the one performed by the sword dancers. End of The Masker's Song Recording by Stephen Harvey Section 62 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloucestershire was Sailor's Song. It is still customary in many parts of England to hand around the wassail or health bowl on New Year's Eve. The custom is supposed to be of Saxon origin and to be derived from one of the observances of the Feast of Yule. The tune of this song is given in popular music. It is a universal favourite in Gloucestershire, particularly in the neighbourhood of Stare on the wold where the winds blow cold, as the old rhyme says. Wassail, wassail, all over the town, Our toasty is white and our ale is brown, Our bowl is made of a maplin tree, We be good fellows all, I drink to thee. Here's to our horse and to his right ear. God send our master an happy new year, a happy new year as e'er he did see. With my wassailing bowl I drink to thee. Here's to our mare and to her right eye. God send our mistress a good Christmas pie, a good Christmas pie as e'er I did see. With my wassailing bowl I drink to thee. Here's to our cow and to her long tail. God send our master us never may fail. A cup of good beer, I pray you draw near, and our jolly wassail, it's then you shall hear. Be here any mates, I suppose here be some. Sure they'll not let young men stand on cold stone. Sing hey, O oh maids, control back the pin, and fairest maid in the house, let us all in. Come, butler, come, bring a bowl of the best. I hope your soul in heaven will rest. And if you do bring us a bowl of the small, then down for butler and bowl and all. End of Gloucestershire Was Sailor's Song Recording by Alan Mapstone A peasant from Gloucestershire in England Section 63 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Kibbe. The Mummer Song, or The Poor Old Horse. As sung by the Mummers in the neighborhood of Richmond, Yorkshire, at the merry time of Christmas. The rustic actor who sings the following song is dressed as an old horse, and at the end of every verse the jaws are snapped in chorus. It is a very old composition and is now printed for the first time. The old horse is probably of Scandinavian origin, a reminiscence of Odin's Slepnor. You gentlemen and sportsmen and men of courage bold, all you that's got a good horse, take care of him when he is old. Then put him in your stable and keep him there so warm. Give him good corn and hay, pray let him take no harm. Poor old horse, poor old horse. Once I had my clothing of linsey woolsey fine, my tail a mane of length, and my body it did shine. But now I'm growing old, and my nature does decay. My master frowns upon me, these words I heard him say. Poor old horse, poor old horse. These pretty little shoulders that once were plump and round, they are decayed and rotten, I'm afraid they are not sound. Likewise these little nimble legs that have run many miles, over hedges, over ditches, over valleys, gates, and stiles. Poor old horse, poor old horse. I used to be kept on the best corn and hay that in fields could be grown or in any meadows gay. But now, alas, it's not so. There's no such food at all. I'm forced to nip the short grass that grows beneath your wall. Poor old horse, poor old horse. I used to be kept up all in a stable warm to keep my tender body from any cold or harm. 
But now I'm turned out in the open fields to go to face all kinds of weather, the wind, cold, frost, and snow. Poor old horse. Poor old horse. My hide unto the huntsman, so freely I would give. My body to the hounds, for I'd rather die than live. So shoot him, whip him, strip him, to the huntsman let him go, for he's neither fit to ride upon, nor in any team to draw. Poor old horse. You must die. End of The Mummer's Song Section 64 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Fragment of the Hagmena Song As sung at Richmond, Yorkshire, on the eve of the new year, by the corporation Pinder. The custom of singing Hagmena songs is observed in different parts of both England and Scotland. The origin of the term is a matter of dispute. Some derive it from O Guy de Neuf, i.e., to the mistletoe this new year, and a French Hagmena song still in use seems to give some authority to such a derivation. Others, dissatisfied with a heathen source, find the term to be a corruption of Greek text which cannot be reproduced, i.e., the holy month. The Hegmena songs are sometimes sung on Christmas Eve and a few of the preceding nights, and sometimes, as at Richmond, on the eve of the new year. For further information, the reader is referred to Brand's Popular Antiquities, Volume 1, pages 247 to 8, Sir H. Ellis's edit, 1842. Tonight it is the New Year's night, tomorrow is the day, and we are come for our right and for our ray, as we used to do in old King Henry's day. Sing, fellows, sing, Hagman, hi. If you go to the bacon flick, cut me a good bit. Cut, cut, and lo, beware of your ma. Cut, cut, and round, beware of your thumb, that me and my merry men may have some. Sing, fellows, sing, Hagman, hi. If you go to the black ark, bring me X mark. Ten mark, ten pound, throw it down upon the ground that me and my merry men may have some. Sing, fellows, sing, Hagman, hi. End of Fragment of the Hagmena Song Section 65 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Greenside Wakes Song The wakes, feasts, or tides of the north of England were originally religious festivals in honor of the saints to whom the parish churches were dedicated. But nowadays, even in Catholic Lancashire, all traces of their pristine character have departed, and the hymns and prayers by which their observance was once hallowed have given place to dancing and merrymaking. At Greenside, near Manchester, during the wakes, two persons dressed in a grotesque manner, the one a male, the other a female, appear in the village on horseback, with spinning wheels before them and the following is the dialogue or song which they sing on these occasions tis greenside wakes we've come to the town to show you some sport of great renown and if my old wife will let me begin i'll show you how fast and how well i can spin tread the wheel tread the wheel then don down o 
thou brags of thyself but i don't think it true for i will uphold thy faults are not a few for when thou hast done and spun very hard of this i'm well sure thy work is ill marred tread the wheel tread the wheel den don del o thou art a saucy old jade and pray hold thy tongue or i shall be thumping thee ere it be long and if that i do i shall make thee to rue for i can have many a one as good as you tread the wheel tread the wheel dan don del o what is it to me who you can have i shall not be long ere i'm laid in my grave and when i am dead you may find if you can one that'll spin as hard as i've done tread the wheel tread the wheel dan don del o come come my dear wife here endeth my song i hope it has pleased this numerous throng but if it has missed you need not to fear we'll do our endeavor to please them next year tread the wheel tread the wheel dan don del o end of poem the green side wakes song section sixty six of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the swearing in song or rhyme as formerly sung or said at highgate in the county of middlesex the proverb he has been sworn at highgate is more widely circulated than understood in its ordinary signification it is applied to a knowing fellow who is well acquainted with the good things and always helps himself to the best and it has its origin in an old usage still kept up at highgate in middlesex gross in his classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue london seventeen eighty five says a ridiculous custom formerly prevailed at the public houses of highgate to administer a ludicrous oath to all the men of the middling rank who stopped there the party was sworn on a pair of horns fastened on a stick the substance of the oath was never to kiss the maid when he could kiss the mistress never to drink small beer when he could get strong with many other injunctions of the like kind to all of which was added a saving clause unless you like it best the person administering the oath was always to be called father by the juror and in return was to style him son under the penalty of the bottle from this extract it is evident that in seventeen eighty six the custom was ancient and had somewhat fallen into destitute hone's yearbook contained a very complete account of the ceremony with full particulars of the mode in which the swearing-in was then performed in the fox under the hill hone does not throw any light on the origin of the practice nor does he seem to have been aware of its comparative antiquity he treated the ceremony as a piece of modern foolery got up by some landlord for the good of the house and adopted from the same interested motive by others of the tribe a subsequent correspondent of mr hone however points out the antiquity of the custom and shows that it could be traced back long before the year seventeen eighty two when it was introduced into a pantomime called harlequin teague or the giant causeway which was performed at the haymarket on saturday august seventeenth seventeen eighty two 
one of the scenes was highgate where in the parlor of a public house the ceremony was performed mr hone's correspondent sends a copy of the old initiation song which varies considerably from our version supplied to us in eighteen fifty one by a very old man an ostler at highgate the reciter said that the copy of verses was not often used now as there was no landlord who could sing and gentlemen preferred the speech he said moreover that the verses were not always alike some said one way and some another some made them long and some cut them short gross was in error when he supposed that the ceremony was confined to the inferior classes for even in his day such was not the case in subsequent times the oath has been frequently taken by people of rank and also by several persons of the highest literary and political celebrity an inspection of any one of the register books will show that the jurors have belonged to all sorts of classes and that amongst them the harvians have always made a conspicuous figure when the stage-coaches ceased to pass through the village in consequence of the opening of railways the custom declined and was kept up only at three houses which were called the old original house and the original and the real old original two of the above houses have latterly ceased to hold courts and the custom is now confined to the fox under the hill where the rite is celebrated with every attention in ancient forms and costume and for a fee which in deference to modern notions of economy is only one shilling byron in the first canto of child herald alludes to the custom of highgate some o'er thy tamis row the ribboned fair others along the safer turnpike fly some richmond hill ascend some wend to where and many to the steep of highgate high ask ye boeotian shades the reason why tis to the worship of the solemn horn grasped in the holy hand of mystery in whose dread name both men and maids are sworn and consecrate the oath with draught and dance till morn canto one stanza seventy enter landlord dressed in a black gown and bands and wearing an antique fashioned wig followed by the clerk of the court also in appropriate costume and carrying the registry book and the horns landlord do you wish to be sworn at highgate candidate i do father clerk amen the landlord then sings or says as follows silence oh yes you are my son full to your old father turn sir this is an oath you may take as you run so lay your hand thus on the horn sir here the candidate places his right hand on the horn you shall spend not with cheaters or cousiners your life nor waste it on profligate beauty and when you are wedded be kind to your wife and true to all petticoat duty the candidate says i will and kisses the horn in obedience to the command of the clerk who exclaims in a loud and solemn tone kiss the horn sir and while you thus solemnly swear to be kind and shield and protect from disaster this part of your oath you must bear it in mind that you and not she is the master clerk kiss the horn sir you shall pledge no man first when a woman is near for neither tis proper nor right sir nor unless you prefer it drink small for strong beer nor eat brown bread when you can get white sir clerk kiss the horn sir 
you shall never drink brandy when wine you can get say when good port or sherry is handy unless that your taste on spirit is set in which case you may sir drink brandy clerk kiss the horn sir to kiss with the maid when the mistress is kind remember that you must be loath sir but if the maid's fairest your oath doesn't bind or you may if you like it kiss both sir clerk kiss the horn sir should you ever return take this oath here again like a man of good sense leal and true sir and be sure to bring with you some more merry men that they on the horn may swear to sir landlord now sir if you please sign your name in that book and if you can't write make your mark and the clerk of the court will attest it here one of the above requests is complied with landlord you will please pay half a crown for court fees and what you please to the clerk this necessary ceremony being gone through the important business terminates by the landlord saying god bless the king or queen and the lord of the manor to which the clerk responds amen amen note the court fees are always returned in wines spirits or porter of which the landlord and clerk are invited to partake end of the swearing in song or rhyme section sixty seven of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c fairlop fair song the following song is sung at fairlop fair one of the gayest of the numerous saturnella kept by the good citizens of london the venerable oak has disappeared but the song is nevertheless sung and the curious custom of riding through the fair seated in boats still continues to be observed come come my boys with a hearty glee to fairlop fair bear chorus with me at hainault forest is known very well this famous oak has long bore the bell let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july at tain hall forest queen anne she did ride and beheld the beautiful oak by her side and after viewing it from bottom to top she said that her court should be at fair lop let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july it is eight fathom round spreads an acre of ground they plastered it round to keep the tree sound so we'll booze it away dull care will defy and be happy on the first friday in july let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july about a century ago as i have heard say this fair it was kept by one daniel day a hearty good fellow as ever could be his coffin was made of a limb of the tree let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july 
with blackstrap and parry he made his friends merry all sorrowed for to drown with brandy and sherry so we'll booze it away don't care we'll defy and be happy on the first friday in july let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july at tane hall forest there stands a tree and it has performed a wonderful bounty it is surrounded by woods and plains the merry little warblers chant their strains let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july so we'll dance round the tree and merry we will be every year we'll agree the fair for to see and we'll booze it away dull care will defy and be happy on the first friday in july let music sound as the boat goes round if we tumble on the ground we'll be merry i'll be bound we will booze it away dull care we will defy and be happy on the first friday in july end of fairlop fair song section sixty eight of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c as tom was a walking an ancient cornish song this song said to be translated from the cornish was taken down says mr sandys from the recital of a modern corypheus or leader of a parish choir who assigned to it a very remote but indefinite antiquity as tom was walking one fine summer's morn when the daisies and gold cups the fields did adorn he met cousin mal with a tub on her head says tom cousin mal you might speak if you would but mal stamped along and appeared to be shy and tom sinked out zounds i'll now of the why so back he tore a tear in a terrible fuss and axed cousin mal what the reason of thus tom trailer cried out mal i'll nothing do wi e go to fanny tremba she dun know how i'm shy tom here da t'other da down the hill thee did a stop and dabbed a great dote fig in fan tremba's lap as for fanny tremba i ne'er talked with her twice and give her a dote fig they are so very nice so i'll tell thee i went to the fear to other day and the dote figs i boffed why i saved them away says mal tom trailor if that be the cause may the lord bless for ever that sweet pretty face if thee'st give me thy dote figs thee'st boffed in the fear i'll swear to thee now thee shouldst marry me here end of as tom was a walking section sixty nine of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the miller and his sons a miller 
especially if he happened to be the owner of a sook mill has always been deemed fair game for the village satirist one of the numerous songs written in ridicule of the calling of the rogues in grain the following is one of the best and most popular its quaint humor will recommend it to our readers for the tune see popular music there was a crafty miller and he had lusty sons one two and three he called them all and asked their will if that to them he left his mill he called first to his eldest son saying my life is almost run if i to you this mill do make what toll do you intend to take father said he my name is jack out of a bushel i'll take a peck from every bushel that i grind that i may a good living find thou art a fool the old man said thou hast not well learned thy trade this mill to thee i ne'er will give for by such toll no man can live he called for his middlemost son saying my life is almost run if i to you this mill do make what toll do you intend to take father says he my name is ralph out of a bushel i'll take a half from every bushel that i grind that i may a good living find thou art a fool the old man said thou hast not well learned thy trade this mill to thee i ne'er will give for by such a toll no man can live he called for his youngest son saying my life is almost run if i to you this mill do make what toll do you intend to take father said he i'm your only boy for taking toll is all my joy before i will a good living lack i'll take it all and forswear the sack thou art my boy the old man said for thou hast right well learned thy trade this mill to thee i give he cried and then he turned up his toes and died end of the miller and his sons section seventy of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda bray nielsen vancouver b c jack and tom an old border ditty traditional the following song was taken down from recitation in eighteen forty seven of its history nothing is known but we are strongly inclined to believe that it may be assigned to the early part of the seventeenth century and that it relates to the visit of prince charles and buckingham under the assumed name of jack and tom to spain in sixteen twenty three some curious references to the adventures of the prince and his companion on their masquerading tour will be found in halliwell's letters of the kings of england volume two i'm a north country man in redstale born where our land lies lee and grows nick corn and such two lads to my house never come as them two lads called jack and tom now jack and tom they're going to the sea i wish them both in good company they're going to seek their fortunes awant the wide sea far far away frae their own country they mounted their horses and rode over the moor till they came to a house where they rapped at the door and out came jockey the hostler man de ye brew on ale de ye sell on beer or have ye on lodgings for strangers here 
ne we brail ne ale nor we sail ne beer nor we have ne lodgings for strangers here so he bolted the door and bade them by gone for there was ne lodgings there for poor jack and tom they mounted their horses and rode over the plain dark was the night and down fell the rain till a twinkling light they happened to spy and a castle and a house they were close by they rode up to the house and they rapped at the door and out came jockey the hostler do ye brew ony ale do ye sell ony beer or have ye ony lodgings for strangers here yes we have brewed ale this fifty long year and we have got lodgings for strangers here so the roast to the fire and the pot hung on twas all to accommodate poor jack and tom when supper was over and all was sided down the glasses of wine did go merrily round here is to thee jack and here is to thee and all the bonny lasses in our country here is to thee tom and here is to thee and look they might leak for thee and me twas early next morning before the break of day they mounted their horses and so they rode away poor jack he died upon a far foreign shore and tom he was never never heard of more end of jack and tom section seventy one of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c jones ale was new ours is the common version of this popular song it varies considerably from the one given by d'ofri in the pills to purge melancholy from the names of nolly and joan and the allusion to ale we are inclined to consider the song as a lampoon levelled at cromwell and his wife whom the royalist party nicknamed joan the protector's acquaintances depicted as low and vulgar tradesmen are here humorously represented paying him a congratulatory visit on his change of fortune and regaling themselves with the brewer's ale the song is mentioned in thackeray's catalogue under the title of jones ale new which may be regarded as circumstantial evidence in favour of our hypothesis the air is published in popular music accompanying three stanzas of a version copied from the deuce collection the first verse in mr chapel's book runs as follows there was a jovial tinker who was a good ale drinker he never was a shrinker believe me this is true and he came from the weld of kent when all his money was gone and spent which made him look like a jack a lent and jones ale is new my boys and jones ale is new there were six jovial tradesmen and they all sat down to drinking for they were a jovial crew they sat themselves down to be merry and they called for a bottle of sherry you're welcome as the hills says nolly while jones ale is new brave boys while jones ale is new the first that came in was a soldier with his firelock over his shoulder sure no one could be bolder and a long broad sword he drew he swore he would fight for england ground before the nation should be run down he boldly drank their house all round while jones ale was new 
The next that came in was a hatter, sure no one could be blacker, and he began to chatter among the jovial crew. He threw his hat upon the ground and swore every man should spend his pound and boldly drank their hearse all round while joan's ale was new the next that came in was a dyer and he sat himself down by the fire for it was his heart's desire to drink with the jovial crew he told the landlord to his face the chimney corner should be his place and there he'd sit and dye his face while joan's ale was new the next that came in was a tinker and he was no small beer drinker and he was no strong ale shrinker among the jovial crew for his brass nails were made of metal and he swore he'd go and mend a kettle good heart how his hammer and nails did rattle when joan's ale was new the next that came in was a tailor with his bodkin shears and thimble he swore he would be nimble among the jovial crew they sat and they called for ale so stout till the poor tailor was almost broke and was forced to go and pawn his coat while joan's ale was new the next that came in was a ragman with his rag bag over his shoulder sure no one could be bolder among the jovial crew they sat and called for pots and glasses till they were all drunk as asses and burnt the old ragman's bag to ashes while joan's ale was new end of joan's ale was new section seventy two of ancient poems ballads and songs of peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c george riddler's oven this ancient gloucestershire song has been sung at the annual dinners of the gloucestershire society from the earliest period of the existence of that institution and in seventeen seventy six there was an harmonic society at sirenster which always opened its meetings with george riddler's oven in full chorus the substance of the following key to this very curious song is furnished by mr h gingell who extracts it from the annual report of the gloucester society for eighteen thirty five the annual meeting of this society is held at bristol in the month of august when the members dine and a branch meeting which was formerly held at the crown and anchor in the strand is now annually held at the thatched house tavern st james george riddler's oven is sung at both meetings and the late duke of beaufort used to lead off the glee in capital style the words have a secret meaning well known to the members of the gloucester society which was founded in sixteen fifty seven three years before the restoration of charles the second the society consisted of royalists who combined together for the purpose of restoring the stuarts the cavalier party was supported by all the old roman catholic families of the kingdom and some of the dissenters who were disgusted with cromwell occasionally lent them a kind of passive aid first verse by george riddler is meant king charles i the oven was the cavalier party the swans that built the oven and that came out of the bleakney quar were the immediate followers of the marquis of worcester 
who held out long and steadfastly for the royal cause at the raglan castle which was not surrendered till sixteen forty six and was in fact the last stronghold retained for the king his head did grow above his hair is an allusion to the crown the head of the state which the king wore above his hair second verse this means that the king before he died boasted that notwithstanding his present adversity the ancient constitution of the kingdom was so good and its vitality so great that it would surpass and outlive every other form of government third verse dick the treble jack the mean and george the base mean king lords and commons the injunction to let every man sing in his own place is a warning to each of the three estates of the realm to preserve its proper position and not to encroach on each other's prerogative fourth verse mine hostess maid is an allusion to the queen who was a roman catholic and her maid the church the singer we must suppose was one of the leaders of the party and his dog a companion or faithful official of the society and the song was sung on occasions when the members met together socially and thus as the roman catholics were royalists the allusion to the mutual attachment between the maid and my dog and i is plain and consistent fifth verse the dog had a trick of visiting maids when they were sick the meaning is that when any of the members were in distress or desponding or likely to give up the royal cause in despair the officials or active members visited counseled and assisted them sixth verse the dog was good to catch a hen a duck or a goose that is to enlist as members of the society any who were well affected to the royal cause seventh verse the good ale tap is an illusion under cover of the similarity in sound between the words ale and isle to the church of which it was dangerous at the time to be an avowed follower and so the members were cautioned that indiscretion might lead to their discovery and overthrow eighth verse the allusion here is to those unfaithful supporters of the royal cause who welcomed the members of the society when it appeared to be prospering but parted from them in adversity ninth verse an expression of the singer's wish that if he should die he may be buried with his faithful companion as representing the principles of the society under the good aisles of the church the following text has been collated with a version published in notes and queries from the fragments of a manuscript found in the speech house of dean the tune is the same as that of the wassailer's song and is printed in popular music other ditties appear to have been founded on this ancient piece the fourth seventh and ninth verses are in the old ditty called my dog and i and the eighth verse appears in another old song the air and words bear some resemblance to tolden hame the stoons that built george riddler's oven and thy came from the bleakney quar and george he were a jolly old man and his yid it growed above his yar one thing of george riddler i must commend and that were vor a notable thing he made his brags of vor he died wi any dree brooders his zons should sing there's dick the treble and john the mean 
let every mon zing in his own place and george he were the elder brother and therefore he would zing the bass mine hostess moid and her noom twor nell a pretty wrench and i loved her well i loved her well good reason why because she loved my dog and i my dog is good to catch a hen a dug or goose is wood for men and where good company i spy o oh, thether goes my dog and i my wother told i when i were young if i did wallow the strong beer put that drink would prove my aver dwell and make me wear a threadbare coat my dog had gotten zick a trick to visit maids when they be sick when they be sick and like to die oh thither goes my dog and i when i have dree six pences under my thumb oh then i be welcome wherever i come but when i have none oh then i pass by tis poverty parts good company if i should die as it may hap my grave shall be under the good yield cap in wooded yarms there will us lie cheek by jowl my dog and i end of george riddler's oven Section 73 of Ancient Poems, Ballads, and Songs of the Peasantry of England. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Carrion Crow This still popular song is quoted by Gross in his Oleo, where it is made the subject of a burlesque commentary the covert political allusions having evidently escaped the penetration of the antiquary the reader familiar with the annals of the commonwealth and the restoration will readily detect the leading points of the allegory the carrion crow in the oak is charles the second who is represented as that bird of vocarious appetite because he deprived the puritan clergy of their livings perhaps also because he ordered the bodies of the regicides to be exhumed as ainsworth says in one of his ballads the carrion crow is a sexton bold he raketh the dead from out of the mould the religion of the old sow whoever she may be is clearly pointed out by her little pigs praying for her soul the tailor is not easily identified it is possibly intended for some puritan divine of the name of taylor who wrote and preached against both prelacy and papacy but with an especial hatred of the latter in the last verse he consoles himself by the reflection that notwithstanding the deprivations his party will have enough remaining from the voluntary contributions of their adherents the cloak which the tailor is engaged in cutting out is the genevan gown or cloak the spoon in which he desires his wife to bring treacle is apparently an allusion to the spatula upon which the wafer is placed in the administration of the eucharist and the introduction of chitterlings and black puddings into the last verse seems to refer to a passage in rabelais where the same dainties are brought in to personify those who in the matter of fasting are opposed to romish practices the song is found in collections of the time of charles the second 
the carrion crow he sat upon an oak and he spied an old tailor a cutting out a cloak hey go the carrion crow the carrion crow he began for to rave and he called the tailor a lousy knave hi o the carrion crow wife go fetch me my arrow and my bow i will have a shot at that carrion crow hi o the carrion crow the tailor he shot and he missed his mark but he shot the old sow through the heart hi o the carrion crow wife go fetch me some treacle in a spoon for the old sow's in a terrible swoon hi o the carrion crow the old sow died and the bells they did toll and the little pigs prayed for the old sow's soul hi o the carrion crow never mind said the tailor i don't care a flea there'll be still black puddings souse and chitterlings for me hi o the carrion crow end of the carrion crow section seventy four of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the leathern bottle somersetshire version in chapel's popular music is a much longer version of the leathern bottle the following copy is the one sung at the present time by the country people in the county of somerset it has been communicated to our pages by mr sandys god above who rules all things monks and abbots and beggars and kings the ships that in the sea do swim the earth and all that is therein not forgetting the old cow's hide and everything else in the world beside and i wish his soul in heaven may dwell who first invented this leathern bottle oh what do you say to the glasses fine oh they shall have no praise of mine suppose a gentleman sends his man to fill them with liquor as fast as he can the man he falls in coming away and sheds the liquor so fine and gay but had it been in the leathern bottle and the stopper been in twould all have been well oh what do you say to the tankard fine oh it shall have no praise of mine suppose a man and his wife fall out and such things happen sometimes no doubt they pull and they haul in the midst of the fray they shed the liquor so fine and gay but had it been in the leathern bottle and the stopper been in twould all have been well now when this bottle it is worn out out of its sides you may cut a clout this you may hang upon a pin twill serve to put odd trifles in ink and soap and candle ends for young beginners have need of such friends and i wish his soul in heaven may dwell who first invented the leathern bottle End of the leathern bottle section seventy five of ancient poems ballads and songs of the peasantry of england this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the farmer's old wife a sussex 
whistling song this is a countryman's whistling song and the only one of the kind which we remember to have heard it is very ancient and a great favorite the farmer's wife has an adventure somewhat resembling the heroes in the burlesque version of don giovanni the tune is lily burlero and the song is sung as follows the first line of each verse is given as a solo then the tune is continued by a chorus of whistlers who whistle that portion of the air which in lily burlero would be sung to the words lily burlero bullen allah the songster then proceeds with the tune and sings the whole of the verse through after which the strain is resumed and concluded by the whistlers the effect when accompanied by the strong whistles of a group of lusty countrymen is very striking and cannot be adequately conveyed by description this song constitutes the traditionary verses upon which burns founded his carl of killyburn brays there was an old farmer in sussex did dwell chorus of whistlers there was an old farmer in sussex did dwell and he had a bad wife as many knew well chorus of whistlers then satan came to the old man at the plough one of your family i must have now it is not your eldest son that i crave but it is your old wife and she i will have oh welcome good satan with all my heart i hope you and she will never more part now satan has got the old wife on his back and he lugged her along like a peddler's pack he trudged away till they came to his hall gate says he here take an old sussex chap's mate oh then she did kick the young imps about says one to the other let's try turn her out she spied thirteen imps all dancing in chains she upped with her patterns and beat out their brains she knocked the old satan against the wall let's try turn her out or she'll murder us all now he's bundled her up on his back amain and to her old husband he took her again i have been a tormentor the whole of my life but i ne'er was tormentor till i met with your wife end of the farmer's old wife